Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, welcome to Watertech University. Appreciate you coming to our facility as well as those that are online this morning. Uh, thank you for attending our boot camp. Uh, we think you're gonna find it very informational and beneficial to you in the long run. How many have been to a Watertech boot camp here at, at our facility? Three or four, actually. Okay, good, excellent. We like repeat offenders, if you will. So thanks for coming again. We actually have a gentleman here from Reno, Nevada this morning. Um, so he actually flew in for this, uh, this training, which is excellent. Um, that means we're doing our job. So thank you very much. Um, a little bit of housekeeping things first off. Um, first of all, my name is Jerry Calarosi. I'm the sales manager for Watertech. I've been here about three months now, believe it or not, Tom. Um, prior to that, I've uh, got a chemical distribution background, not necessarily a water treatment background. Uh, worked for Hydrite Chemical, which some of you might know uh, in the area. I worked on their industrial side. I was a sales manager that covered uh, Illinois, Northern Illinois, um, Iowa, and Minnesota. And prior to that, I worked for a chemical manufacturer and distributor, and I covered basically the Western United States for about 15 years for a company called PVS Chemicals. And they manufacture sulfuric acid, ferric chloride, and a couple of other products. Um, as far as housekeeping, uh, we are a COVID safe facility today. Obviously we're still undergoing these uh, restraints. So masks and social distancing, as you can see, we've kind of laid you guys out in a proper fashion. Um, but if you can adhere to it, that's great. Um, but we want you to feel comfortable at the same time. Uh, restrooms are right around the corner, if you haven't noticed already. So feel free to use those at your leisure. Uh, we have beverages over here in the corner, coffee. And then also in the little refrigerator if you want water, uh, soda, and I think there's beer in there as well uh, for later if you want to partake. And then we will be serving lunch, I believe after Tom's presentation uh, for everybody here who's in attendance. Um, as far as participation today, um, this is kind of a lengthy class, right? We're going to be here probably till 3 o'clock this afternoon, maybe 3.30. Um, we ask that you guys participate the best you can. And also online, we want you to participate as well. Um, so a lot of questions, a lot of conversation um, <clears throat> will help this go a lot smoother and I think we'll get a lot more out of it. Some questions that you guys might have here in the class are probably questions that people online are probably having as well. So the more questions the better and our technical staff will most likely be able to answer all your questions. Um, as far as online, um, if you do want to chat, you might have to sign on to Google um, throughout within that process um, and you might actually have to create a channel as well so click on those as you go through that process and then go back to the presentation and that'll allow you to chat with our online group if there are any questions from the online um, participants I'll be kind of filtering those and I will bring them to the to the present presenters at that time um, again it's a long day if you need anything, let me know. Um, if you feel free to stretch, stand up, walk around if you have to. Um, we'll go from there. Okay, today uh, we're gonna be going over a number of topics. Uh, we'll go over a brief water overview, and then we'll go into pretreatment and filtration options, talk a little bit about cooling towers, uh, steam boilers. Uh, we'll get into some troubleshooting for you guys as well. Um, boiler startups, tower layups, and then we'll talk a little about, bit about innovations and stuff that we're kind of excited about on the chemical side as well. Um, our presenters today, we have four of them. And actually we have uh, about 30 years of water tech experience that's going to be here today presenting for you. So a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience. Um, Tom Keppen, is, uh, he's been with us for 12 years. He's a professional engineer. He covers the Southeast Wisconsin Territory as a territory manager. Uh, Jeff Bordendorfer um, is here locally in Milwaukee. He's a territory manager. He's been with us about eight years. Um, Kyle Pakowitz, who's our director of water safety, um, he's been with us for about five and a half, six years, and he kind of manages water safety throughout the whole um, geography that WaterTech kind of services. So that's Wisconsin, obviously, Illinois, Iowa, and, and uh, Minnesota. And then last but not least, Cheyenne Begg, He's our territory manager out of Chicago, and he's been with us for about three years. Um, at this time, do you guys want to just do a brief introduction of yourselves? I know you were talking to Jeff, our director of sales earlier, but if you want to go around the room, just introduce your name 
and where you're from and why you came to Water Tech University today. Christopher Peterson, uh, excuse me, from Reno, Nevada. Uh, here to learn. I'm taking over. Our company has one guy doing water treatment, and he doesn't have a ton of experience, and okay. I don't either. So good. Brandon Holler, uh, West Dallas Memorial, maintenance tech, learning. Spring. Stop learning, right? Spring. Hopefully, take my high pressure and low pressure boilers. You know all that. And why not? Perfect. Thank you. Jason Gleason from the Madison location. And just basically here to learn boilers. Same thing. Uh, we've got one guy taking care of it, and uh, they need more experience. Good. Well, thank you. Welcome. I'm Steve Spade. I'm with Fluid Handling, and I'm pretty new with them. I've been with about six months, and uh, just a, it's fascinating to be here, actually. I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Uh, my name is William Schweda, or Bill Schweda. I, I represent a company called Water Integrated Treatment Systems out of Kenosha, Wisconsin. We are an industrial pretreatment facility. Okay, thanks, Bill. My name is Christian Pangalon. People call me Panga. Uh, I work for a Kohler company up in Kohler, Wisconsin, and I'm the mechanical project engineer up there. And I'm working with cooling towers and some steam boilers around the. Uh, so I have a cooling tower project in Huntsville, Alabama, and I'm interested to know a little bit more about chem chemical treatments. Perfect. Thank you. Appreciate it. Dan Kubig, Bill Healthcare. Um, I basically yeah, work on our boilers and air treats and stuff. So, but I've been here before. It's just kind of refreshing. Good. Thanks for coming back. Taylor Ryan, uh, Taylor Lewis, Green Walk Shop, um, HVAC Mechanics. Uh, we have a uh, team and cooling towers. I come from Oldsburg, North Central Town. So, uh, been there about a year and been learning. Perfect. Uh, Mark Joyner, Standard Process. Um, I am just here to refresh. I do the boiler checks every morning, pretty much every time that there's a boiler issue, I get called in. I do the wastewater treatment too, on the side of things. Um, just here for a refresher. Okay. My name is Rahul. I work for a company called Wildstuff. It's a burner manufacturing company. So I end up walking into a boiler room pretty much all the time. So it's good to learn about the boiler water. Yeah, welcome back. Appreciate you coming back. Thank you. Uh, no, he already introduced it, but go ahead, start with Jeff, real quick. Oh, uh, I'm Jeff Bogdorfer. Uh, like Gary said, I'm in the Milwaukee area. That's a couple of you guys uh, know me as a student every month. Um, been with Water Tech eight years, and uh, hopefully I know what I'm talking about today. <laughs> <laughs> Let's count on it. Jeff? <laughs> uh, Jeff Freitag, Director of Sales and Design. I'll have some of you guys in the room here in Arizona. I'm coming up on my 20th year here. Excellent. Uh, and Tom Keppen, yeah, as Gary said, been water tech for 12 years, believe it or not. It's crazy, but yeah, time flies when you're having fun. Um, <laughs> southeast Wisconsin Territory, Northern Illinois, or North, I mean, pretty much North Chicago, River the border. Um, water tech, water treatment background, along with uh, some wastewater background and other various backgrounds, too, from the UHF stuff, so a diverse background. I'm Sean Kinnard. I work as a service technician for water tech. So I help uh, Tom, Kyle, and Jeff out in the layer pumps in the uh, southeastern Wisconsin area. Perfect. Again, thank you for attending, and thank you online for attending as well. Okay, uh, obviously I stated that I was new to water tech. I'm only three months new. Um, prior to that, I was in chemical distribution, which is a totally different animal. Um, so water treatment is new to me. Um, and one of the first things I learned pretty quickly was that water, in general, is regional, if not very local, if you will. Uh, water coming out of Lake Michigan, they tell me, is somewhat uh, a lot better than water that might be coming out of somewhere like Waterloo, Iowa. So it's important to know that, and it's important for us to know that in our processes and treatments. Um, also, water out of a well is not necessarily gonna be the same as a water out of a city, city municipality. Um, hopefully boot camp today will explain this in detail to you and give you some more benefits um, along with that. Um, this gives you an example, if you will, some basic water characteristics. Um, this this kind of shows the difference between water surface and groundwater. And this is uh, basically out of Waterloo. So you can see the city of Waterloo has a total hardness of 284 with a conductivity of around 600. 
whereas a well that might be within the vicinity um, might have a, a total hardness of 1,000 and a conductivity of almost 2,000. So there's a big difference in swing in those applications. And this is the reason that we need to test and apply the right um, chemistries and services for you guys. Why all the fuss? Okay, um, the reason we treat water is fairly obvious to me. Um, there's potential equipment failures. There's unscheduled downtimes that can happen if we're not treating the water accurately. And these photos kind of depict what we're talking about. Um, boilers, obviously you can see iron and corrosion. Uh, water cooling, uh, you can see scale, growth, and even algae. And um, this, this, I think, is one of our prospects that we've uh, attempted to get. And I think it's out of the city of Chicago, so you'll be talking to Cheyenne later, and you can ask them about that wild picture right there. Okay, um, why do we take water treatment seriously? Um, some of you probably have an idea as to why we do, some of you might not, but um, I was kind of amazed at the potential catastrophes that can happen um, if you don't maintain the right water treatment. So there are some uh, important uh, reasons why we're here today and why water tech's in business. And we'll play this video real quick uh, to kind of depict what possibly can happen to you. Maybe not to you, but to a company. boiler unit on the railroad tracks there. Right now we're learning more details about exactly what happened. Why don't we head out live to our Ryan Race. He arrived on scene just minutes after all of this went down. Ryan, what have you learned at this point? You guys check this out. You really have to see this for yourself. That giant red tank right there, that's a 60,000 pound uh, a boiler unit. It was actually at one time inside the plant there to the right. Now it's laying on the railroad shacks after a giant explosion. Happened around 8 o'clock this morning and it actually shot through the building. You can see a big gaping hole there on the side. Just moments ago I spoke to investigators and now that other boilers have cooled off, they're going in to start looking to see if the building is safe. At this point, all employees have been sent home. Miraculously, nobody got hurt. But some very scary moments this morning, even for people driving by. We talked to one lady who was sitting in the turning lane when a fireball shot in the air. I heard a loud noise, like an explosion. I didn't know if it was an accident coming up behind me or what. And I just saw all the steam and this you know, big piece of equipment here rolling what looked like it was going to come across the road. Fortunately, it stopped right there. Yeah, very fortunate there. Late this morning, we learned of flying debris damaged at least one car driving by. We're going to go talk to that frightened woman in just a few moments. But back here live, there's a lot of work ahead to first figure out the cause and also to make sure that this building is safe to go back inside. We're live in Lakeland this noon. Ryan Ray, ABC Action News. Okay, um, pretty intense, right? Um, for me being new, I thought that was pretty intense. You know, wow, that's a pretty big catastrophe. I was actually in an account, I don't know, about a month ago, a small, small micro brewery, and they had a new, brand new boiler in place. So I was asking him why, you know, what'd you do? What, what happened to the old um, boiler? And he said, yeah, it blew right through the back of the building. I was like, what? Yeah, it, it just blew right through the back. They mismanaged it and um, they had some serious issues. So very, very important that you guys know why and what you're doing and very important for us to kind of know your systems and what kind of chemistries we need to maintain these boilers and cooling towers, so on and so forth. Um, I just wrote down a couple notes. Regular testing and the right equipment goes a long way, right? Um, also, in regards to you guys that are here and the people that are attending online, your support of what we do at WaterTech is very important and goes a long way as well. And that's why you're here today, to kind of understand what we do when we're in your facility and to assist us on a regular basis. The more testing, the more on hand, the hands on site, um, the more benefit it's gonna to bring to your company and to eliminate any of these potential catastrophes. Um, real quick on just water quality, um, we don't just go in and um, sample your water and come up with some chemistries. We actually abide by um, certain industry standards 
and we utilize the ASME as well as the ABMA, the American Boiler Manufacturers Association, and uh, Cooling Technology Institute. Everything WaterTech does utilizes these resources and industry standards. Um, with that, I appreciate your time. Um, I'm going to be in my office, and I'm going to hand this over to Jeff Bordendorfer, who's going to talk a little bit about pretreatment and filtration options. Thank you very much, Jerry. Welcome, everyone. Uh, and again, I'll say it uh, now since I'm actually on the camera and people remotely can see me. I'm Jeff Bodendorfer, been with WaterTech for eight years now in the Milwaukee uh, area. <clears throat> so before I jump into pretreatment and filtrations, uh, we'll talk about safety for a second since Jerry's talking about uh, the obvious hazards that exist with our job. So question for people in the audience is, what makes a boiler go boom like that and go through a wall? Does anyone actually know what is going to cause that happening? Okay, so we have running out of water. We had pressure. Could it be the gas isn't firing right on the system? Those are some of the answers. So you were correct about running out of water. So what's going to happen is, which is why you should te test your low water cutoffs every day in your boilers to make sure they work, is if a boiler runs low on water and it doesn't know it, hot and hot and hot and hot. And what typically ends up happening is then someone walks in the boiler room and finds their boiler glowing orange and they think the, the best thing you can do is get water back in that boiler, right? That would make, seem like logical sense. But when you do that, water expands at a rate of 10,000 times when it goes from water to steam. And so when you take that water and you put it on a glowing hot uh, metal surface like your boiler, that's when it really goes boom, right? So Always remember, if you walk in your boiler room and it's glowing, shut it down and leave, right? And make sure you would probably evacuate your facility. So um, I always, uh, I tell the story, I, I, I fired one customer in my life and I hope I never do it again. And the reason why was because every time I stood in their boiler room, that's all I could think was going to happen. Every time I was there. And so I was not comfortable being there because they didn't take it seriously. Um, and so it just didn't work out that we could be partners anymore. Um, so what is one of the most important things to actually having good water treatment, right? So we're, we sell chemicals. I like to sell chemicals. I like to sell you more chemicals. Um, but I'd lie if I said chemicals can do everything in a system, right? We don't have a silver bullet. We don't have a everlasting gobstopper of water treatment chemistries. Um, Pre-treatment and potentially filtration are very important parts of that whole water treatment um, portion or package that you want to look at. So we're going to talk about that in the next couple slides. So why pre-treat, right? So Jerry showed you that slide of if you're getting city water potentially versus you're getting your own well water and just the discrepancy that exists between those, right? And if we look back, I'm sure we could look and see that the iron content was a lot higher coming out of the wall. Silica might be a lot higher coming out um, and some other factors that maybe will impact your process. So a big reason is we want that consistency of the water quality um, because they can vary. You'll find uh, when I go down to Maguanago, um, which is where I'm from, uh, they rotate wells. So one day we might have water quality that is different than the next day because they're rotating between their deep and shallow wells based upon whatever metrics the city is trying to hit, right? So not having anything in the plant would send our program uh, for kind of a doozy when they decide to switch those wells. And they don't inform you that they switch wells, they just do what they want to do, right? So having free treatment in your facility is gonna help to try to eliminate that when it gets into your steam boiler or your cooling tower system. And like I said, chemicals can only do so much. Uh, chemical that could do everything, I probably would be retired by now. So um, I keep praying for that day to happen, I just don't think it will. Um, we need pretreatment for almost all applications. Unless you're running Lake Michigan water uh, in your cooling tower, that's really good quality because it's on the surface. Um, you might not need to have any type of pretreatment to do that. And then again, we're trying to prevent scaling, deposition, and uh, we're trying to improve our efficiencies, not decrease those efficiencies, right? That's the main goal behind a water treatment program. So your most common uh, treatment methods, right? Uh, some type of filtration, you know, whether it's uh, cartridge uh, filters, bag filters, um, could be automatic backwashing filters depending on the application, right? Uh, how many of you guys have uh, softeners in your facility? 
I'm sure that almost everyone, right, is going to have a water softener for some related process. Um, and then uh, you might have reverse osmosis as well. And I'm sure there's quite a few of you in here who also um, have seen those in their facility as well. Okay, a little bit about bag and cartridge filters. The advantages and disadvantages, right, of using a bag or a cartridge style filter like you see here. Um, typically see those on closed loops more than uh, um, open recirculating cooling towers. Um, not really on the boiler side of things you typically see any type of bag or cartridge filters. Um, so what are the advantages, right? So it's pretty cheap to get going on them. Filter housing is not that expensive. Uh, and the, the filters themselves, the first time you aren't that expensive, right? And they're, they're simple. So you put them in when the pressure gauge reads high enough, you pull them out and you put in a new set. Um, disadvantage is you forever are going through filters. So in the long run, right, obviously there's that, that cost of using filters, you know, for years and years and years. And then again, it requires someone to actually always do the changing. Um, so it is labor intensive and in that um, one of you is going to be doing that. Uh, you might find on cooling towers, um, bigger filtration systems, right? So whether it's a sand type filter or a pep type filter, or again, an automatic backwashing type filter, um, you typically won't see the, the cartridge or the bag filters. Cooling towers are really good at sucking dirt and debris in out of the air. You know, they're not designed to do that, but they're awesome air scrubbers. Um, and so you would be changing those out a lot more frequently if you went with a bag or a cartridge type filter. Um, then if you went with a, a larger vessel that can handle a lot more flow through it before it needs to be backwashed or cleaned. So what are some advantages of those media filters that I was talking about? Um, they can do pretty fine filtration. So 15, you know, you can get down to 15 microns in a cooling tower. That's really, really fine. I mean, typically if you're anywhere in the 50 to 100 range on your micron size, that normally is adequate for cooling towers. Um, most of them are automatic, right? So they're always running with water going through them until it comes time for you to backwash them. So there's not necessarily a lot of labor involved. Um, and again, large surface area. So you can, you can flow a lot of water through that, uh, that system there before it ends up getting um, dirty and needed to be regenerated. Downside is they're pretty expensive um, from the get-go. So it's probably gonna be a, a pretty significant capital cost. Uh, especially if you're wanting to try to get like a full flow system, right? So if your cooling tower is running at 1,000 GPM, that's a, that's a pretty big um, filtration system you're going to need to be able to get full, full flow through that. Um, the other downside is you use a lot of water to backwash those. Um, so if you're looking at ways to save water, these aren't necessarily the greatest um, because they take a lot of water. When you backwash, you're coming from the bottom and lifting it up and flushing things out. So um, they do go through quite a bit of water. Um, and then they are awesome at uh, being bacterial breeding grounds. So um, dirt and debris gets trapped in there, obviously. Bacteria like to settle out on dirt and debris. Um, you know, the, the temperature is right in there, the conditions are right. Um, it may not be seeing biocide flow through on a consistent basis. Um, and so they can potentially become great um, bacterial breeding grounds. So not my first choice if you came to me and asked me what kind of filtration would you want on your cooling tower. I wouldn't choose uh, this, and I wouldn't choose bag or cartridge filters either. My choice would be something uh, like a Tech Clean um, automatic backwashing filter, right? So you install it, they automatically run, they're gonna use pressure sensors when they've hit their pressure, they're gonna go ahead and automatically backwash themselves. They use significantly less water to backwash them. Um, they're relatively easy to install. And then once they're in, you pretty much aren't doing anything with them. So um, TechClean is one brand. Um, there's other brands that exist out of there. Um, we'll watch a short video on just kind of how it works um, so you guys get an idea of what's going on. TechLean filters, will save Tech Lean filters will save you time and money every day on the labor and materials that would otherwise be spent on cleaning and replacing filters, screens, bags, cartridges, and spray nozzles. Here's how it works. Dirty water enters the inlet of the filter and passes through the coarse screen. This screen protects the fine screen from being damaged by any large particulates. Then the water moves down the center of the filter body. Water passes through the fine screen and clean water exits through the outlet of the filter, leaving dirt particulates trapped on the inside of the screen. The trapped dirt particulates accumulated on the inside of the fine screen 
causes a dirt cake effect. This buildup of particulates on the screen mesh causes a pressure drop at the outlet of the filter that is monitored by a DP sensor. When a 5 to 7 pound differential is reached, the electronic controller energizes the flush valve for a backwash cycle. The combined linear movement of the dirt collector and axial rotation caused by the hydraulic motor allows the dirt collector to scan the entire surface area of the screen. Okay, so pretty slick, right? It's just going to do what it needs to do. Uh, it'll backwash on its own, whether it's once a day or ten times a day, um, and it's going to keep you guys uh, not spending time on it. So um, it, well, regardless of the type of filter you're using, there's always going to be at some point where it's dirty, right? How do we tell that? We use pressure differentials, right? So you typically have a gauge before and after on the inlet and outlet of a system. Um, and you're using that as your marker of when you go, need to go ahead and change out those filters or do a backwash on it. Or again, if it's an automatic system, it's going to do that for you. Um, ideal pressure loss is typically between 10 and 12 pounds over what your nominal is, right? So there's obviously always some pressure loss flowing through that um, system, even when it's clean. And so typically, uh, again, once we get to above 10 to 12 above whatever that is, we typically say the filters are dirty and need to look at being changed. So example would be, you know, three is your nominal pressure drop uh, upon putting in a new set of filters. And then you, by the time you get uh, 10 extra pounds, you're up at that 13. That's probably a good time that you want to look at changing those. The micron size of your filters is going to determine how quickly that happens. So again, if you have a 500 micron filter, you know, we always say you're catching boulders in your system versus if you have a one micron filter and you're catching every, you know, all the small little tiny particulate that you can barely even see with your eye um, is going to determine. So in a really dirty system, I wouldn't start out with a one micron filter because you're going to be changing them all the time. Um, I probably want to start with a 500 micron filter either, but that's where you work with your water treatment partner on what is the right um, size for you and then what maybe what's that progression plan of looking to step down. So um, I always like to try to work it down. So as we start to get a longer run life, maybe out of a 50 micron filter, maybe it's time to jump down to a 25 micron filter. And then once we say, okay, you know, we've hit our, we're getting a month out of these filters, right? And I want to see that we continue to progress. Then maybe you jump down to a 10 and then maybe you get down to a one, a one micron filter at some point, or maybe your system never uh, is right for that either. So. So again, just a video of this system's nice in that not only do they have the pressure gauges, but they had that little flow indicator, right? So um, those are inexpensive and, and easy to throw into a line, and they're also a good representation of, you know, is my flow starting to slow down um, in this system or not? So um, I do like those as well. So key takeaways, right? Make sure you don't exceed your maximum pressure drop. You don't want your filter, uh, especially if you have like a a bag filter, you know, it can rip. Um, if, if that pressure gets so high, um, it's going to give way because that water is going to make its way through, right? So again, it's, it's important to stay on top of that. Um, same with if you have a media filter, you want to make sure that, again, your pressure differentials are making sense. So if it's, if it's set up to backwash on a 10-pound pressure drop, but you see it's at a 20-pound pressure drop, right? Make sure that those uh, pressure switches are actually working the way that they should. They do go bad. Um, Media filters, again, they may need to be disinfected on an annual or semi-annual basis to remove any type of microbiological fouling. Again, depends on your system, what's going to um, need to be required. You should ideally use fresh water for backwashing those instead of whatever the process water is or tower water. Um, couple, you know, your main reason being you don't really want to put your treated water, you, know, you put energy into it to heat it or cool it, you put chemistry in it to treat it. Um, you know, there's money tied into that water. Ideally, you don't want to be backwashing your system with that and putting it down the drain. So um, that's another consideration of why um, media filters maybe are a little bit of a pain is you'd have to maybe look at having an additional source of water coming into it. And then again, in a cooling tower system, those automatic screen or disc filters, in my opinion, are the way to go. And we could talk offline about do you need full flow filters or can you do side stream, whatever. There's different feelings on that um, as what's right. Obviously, if you go full flow, it's just going to make that more expensive for you. So 
All right, softeners. What do water softeners do without reading a screen? Someone give me an answer. Just by the name of it, what does a water softener do? Softens water. Man, you were gonna. You want a hat? You should get you something. Look at that. I throw softballs. Uh, so trying to get you guys something. Which one would you prefer? This one. All right. Now you know what you can win if you answer the question. So, yeah, you're very welcome. Okay, so the main thing softeners are going to do, right? What are they actually removing, right? What are we pulling out when we're softening water? Um, typically, it's going to be calcium, magnesium, and iron, right? So, um, really, we're focusing on that calcium, magnesium. Um, iron also gets pulled out due to the um, attraction between the positive iron, I, positive iron ion, and the negatively charged resin. Um, so they're, it's going to get pulled, uh, but that actually can cause problems with fouling in your softener. So um, what information do we need to know when sizing softeners? Does anyone know that? What, would, what do you think would be important if you say, hey, I need a water softener for my boiler system, um, and I don't know where to start with sizing, right? So would it, do we think it would be important to know potentially how much water you might go through in a day, right? So what could be the max amount of flow you'd ever see in your plant? Is it 100 gallons? Is it 100,000 gallons, right? That's going to obviously have an impact. Um, what maybe is your peak flow? So maybe for eight hours of your day, your plant is running at 100 GPM, and that's the demand of your system, right? And then for the, for the other eight hours, the next shift, your plant's only running at 20 GPM because it's a much lighter shift. Um, that's important. If we size a softener too big to handle your, your, your worst possible flow, um, you might cause issues on the low side um, because then it's so big that you can't uh, possibly soften that water as well. Or you undersize it and you can't possibly soften that water as well because there's not enough time that the water has going through that resin to actually do the job. So that's important, peak flow and low flow. Uh, and then again, total, total volume a day, right, that you might go through of water. Uh, and then commercial units, they regenerate just like the unit in your house. So if you have a water softener at home, right, they're all, they all work the same way. They might look slightly different, right? You might have one in your house that maybe looks like this, top mounted valve, or in your plant. This is you know, probably the most common application that you see is, is top mounted valves. You might have uh, what we call um, a nested valve operation. Um, those are for typically really big water softener systems. Um, and so you, you might have a different design, but again, they're all doing the same operation. So how do we soften water, right? So I did, I mentioned the resin that's inside those softeners. So your softeners are going to come loaded with a anionic resin, right? So a negatively charged resin. Uh, and the reason why it's negatively charged is because calcium, magnesium, that iron, uh, which we don't necessarily want to pull, but it, it's going to get pulled. Those are positively charged. All right, and so the natural attraction is as water comes through, uh, all your different calcium magnesium ions uh, are going to interact with your resin beads, which are the, the little circles uh, here. Um, the resin is going to be loaded with sodium ions. Sodium ions have a plus one charge. Um, calcium magnesium iron, they might have a plus two, a plus three charge. And so they're going to have, they're stronger. And so they can kick the sodium ions off of that resin and bond to it. And that's how we're pulling it out. So we're putting sodium in the water in exchange for pulling out the calcium, magnesium, uh, and iron in the system. And then your water is going to go out and be treated. Um, and those sodium ions are going to go out along with that. Uh, at some point, it's going to become exhausted. And so you're going to have to look at going through regeneration, right? At some point, all these resin beads are going to have absorbed as much calcium and magnesium as what they can possibly hold, and you have to do something to regenerate that resin so you can go through that process again, right? And so um, that's where we look at, that's why you have a salt tank, right? And you add salt into a system because you're exchanging those sodium ions, you would backwash it uh, and then do a, a brine refill, and you would have sodium ions then kick off all of these calcium magnesium ions and put those to drain, um, and then refill back up with those sodium ions. So that process that goes on all day long. How do you know your softener is working? Using salt. Okay, using salt, that's a good one. 
Could it, could it potentially be using salt but not actually softening properly? You think that's possible? Or is, nope, as long as it's using salt, I know for sure that it's good and I never have to worry about it again. Okay, no, right? So it could be using salt. Uh, it could be using too much salt, maybe, and that's wasteful. It could be using not enough salt. And so it's, yeah, it's going through salt. You know, I had two bags every single day. Well, maybe you really need four bags a day worth of salt in your system for it to actually properly regenerate your water softeners and get you whatever water quality you're looking for, right? So in a boiler, we're probably we're looking for zero PPM of hardness. We don't want any hardness coming through that water softener um, because at the temperatures and pressures that you run a boiler at, it's gonna come out and cause scale, right? And so we don't want any. Um, especially the higher pressure boiler that you run. Uh, in a cooling tower system, you might be okay with 10 parts or 20 parts per million of hardness coming off your water softeners because we don't actually need it to be zero in a cooling tower. The temps aren't high enough that we're, we can handle 50 ppm or 100 ppm in your system and not have any issues with scaling. Um, and so that's where, uh, again, just because it's using salt doesn't necessarily mean, doesn't necessarily mean it's doing what you want it to do. So key takeaways, soft water is critical, right, to pretreatment and management of heat exchange systems. Hardness is uh, one of your enemies, it can cause scale. Monitor the salt usage and make sure there is salt in your brine tank, right, so that's always uh, uh, an important thing to check. Clean your brine tank, so salt is dirty, um, even if it looks clean over time, it's, it's not. So when they say salt is 99.97% pure, that sounds really pure, but uh, over time, that might be enough impurity to cause you issues. And so if you've never cleaned your brine tank, underneath that grid in your tank, you probably have a layer of dirt like this. Or if you've used bad salt, which we've seen in facilities where they have gotten really, really bad salt coming in, um, the amount of dirt that's in that brine tank in a short period of time is pretty astounding. And I don't know if we have, we used to have some glass jars with different quality salts in them, and you can just see the amount of dirt um, depending on what kind of salt you use. So the, not all salt is the same. And then one of the things that you should look at doing um, you know, annually is, is always a good idea, is a brine elution study on your softener. So that's how you validate that it's actually working the way it should, right? So we run a brine elution study, we run it through a backwash uh, and a brine draw cycle. You make sure that it's actually pulling the right amount of salt for the right amount of time, and then that it's actually rinsing all that excess salt off um, and that's how you're going to know you're using the right amount of salt, you're not using too little, you're not using too much, or you're not using too much in too little of a time period. Um, and so that's always a good thing to look at doing, and that's something that your water treatment partner should be able to help you with. Uh, dealkalizers and demineralizers. So does anyone have either of these in your guys' facility? Okay, and not at least here, maybe online, someone does. Um, not as common, just depends, right? I think dealkalizers used to be a lot more common, um, but I think RO systems have kind of taken over as being the standard um, of, of what you'll see in a facility. So again, the name kind of implies what it does. So it pulls alkalinity out if it's a dealkalizer, uh, and a demineralizer is to pull out both anions and cations, right? So kind of any ion in the, in the uh, water, and again, your process would have to dictate you need water that pure to probably put in a system like this. ROs, these are reverse osmosis, right? Um, this is again more common nowadays with what you guys are probably more familiar with. So uh, they're inside these vessels here, there's membranes. We push the water through the membrane. It's semi-permeable. Water can pass through it. Solids can't, right? And so they, you know, they're, they're good in removing 97, 98, 99% of everything from the water. So you get pretty pure water coming out of these, um, which again, can be good for your system. Um, maybe not always the right uh, application though for everything. So why don't we put an RO on a cooling tower, Jeff, right? People have asked that question. Well, the more pure water is, the more corrosive and aggressive it is. Water wants things in it, it wants to be balanced. So it, the second we pull things out of it, it's gonna start looking for things to be put back in it. Um, and so in a cooling tower, um, we don't want that level of, of uh, aggression or corrosion potential in the system. We would be adding a lot more stuff back in it to try to make it not so corrosive. Um, plus, typically in a cooling tower, you're going through uh, significantly more water. So you'd have to have a, a very, very large RO 
to handle the type of flows that you might see in your cooling tower if you're going through 30,000 gallons or 50,000 gallons of water a day in your system. Um, compared to a steam system where you're getting a lot of condensate return back, um, and so you're, you know, if, if you're getting 80 or 90% condensate return back, you don't have to have an RO that can actually handle 100% of your uh, fresh uh, makeup water demand in that day. So again, what are the benefits of using it? And notice how we say here, just a boiler feed water. Um, I would say there's no benefit in using it in your cooling tower. Um, people have tried to blend it before, so I guess, again, oddball situations maybe. Um, you're going to increase your cycles of concentration, right? So if, if in your boiler you're able to run 10 cycles of concentration normally, with an RO you might be able to get 30, 40, 50 cycles as a result of going to an RO. So you'll use less water overall in your system. And then again, better water quality in that uh, it's pulling out total dissolved solids, so it's going to a water softener is not going to change your conductivity. So if your conductivity coming in from the city is 1,000 and it goes through your water softener, it's going to be 1,000 because sodium ions, which we replace calcium and magnesium ions with, have about the same conductivity to them. All right, and So you're not going to see any benefit there. A softener is going to pull hardness out. That's the benefit. In an RO, you're going to pull out to the, the dissolved solids as well as alkalinity. So your incoming water is 1,000. It goes through a softener, which then from there it goes to your RO, and it might go from 1,000 down to 50 or 20 or 10, um, depending on uh, your overall system. So you will be able to reduce the amount of uh, solids in your water, which means you should be able to use that water more or cycle it up before we have to put it down to the drain, right, through blowdown in a system, whether it's a cooling tower or it's a boiler. But again, in a cooling tower, uh, I would not look at RO necessarily. Okay, and here's just a little video on, um, again, kind of how those membranes work, right, what's going on inside of there. Reverse osmosis works by forcing water through a special plastic membrane sheet to remove compounds such as salts, organic compounds, microorganisms, viruses and pharmaceuticals. Rolls of membrane sheets are wound into cylinder-shaped elements. There are several elements inside each long pressure vessel. As water enters the vessel, it flows over the membrane surface as it moves from one end of the vessel to the other. The membrane layer is extremely thin. It allows water to pass through or permeate, while preventing other compounds from passing through. Membranes remove molecules based on their size, shape and charge. Generally, contaminants larger than water molecules will not pass through, including most chemical contaminants and all microorganisms such as viruses and bacteria. Two streams of water are produced. Pure, clean water or permeate flows across the membrane sheets and passes through the membrane layers to the inside core tube. Water that does not permeate becomes more highly concentrated with salts and other substances. This water is called concentrate. The pure permeate water flows out the core tube and one end of the pressure vessel, and the concentrate water flows out another outlet. The concentrate water can then flow into other pressure vessels for the same process to happen again, so even more pure permeate water can be recovered. About 82% of all the source of water becomes purified water. Okay. All right, so how do we take care of our RO, right? So uh, again, that video kind of shows, it, it pretty much rejects everything that's larger than a, a water molecule. And so if you're putting really crappy water to your RO, you're probably going to blind off those membranes quicker than you want. Membranes aren't necessarily cheap to replace. Downtime, if you don't have uh, you know, two trains of, of RO to where you can take one down and clean it in place or replace the membranes. Um, and so we got to look at pre-treating the water that's going into your RO, which is pre-treating the water going into your boiler, right? So um, typically you won't see um, just coming straight out of the ground and going right to an RO, you're probably going to go to a water softener first, or you might look at doing chemical treatment. So um, we can feed an anti-scalant um, to your RO system, and that's going to, again, allow um, 
those membranes to not be blinded off maybe by hardness that's coming in with it. Um, why would we use a chemical treatment, Jeff, versus using softeners before, right? Well, maybe the water, maybe the water coming out, uh, you'd have to have some really, really large water softeners. Maybe your, your flow is high enough that it just isn't, it, it's cheaper to do anti-skin than it is to pay for the salt that would go into that system. And so we have customers that are pulling out of their own well um, and they're feeding anti scalant um, instead of doing softeners because of that exact reason, right? The salt cost every year would far outweigh the cost of adding chemical to it. So but that's something that, again, you work with your water treatment partner on determining what's the best approach for you. Key takeaways. Makeup water quality is critical. So the water that's going to the RO, it's critical that it's good enough or treated properly that it's not going to blind off your RO right away or it doesn't have a lot of chlorine in it that's going to eat your membranes and destroy them. Um, and so it's not just as simple as, well, if I put in an RO, I know I'm good for sure, right? There is, there is more uh, complexion to it than that. Uh, you need to monitor your concentrate and permeate flows and your pressures. Know if, again, each membrane uh, is working properly in your system. It's going to reduce alkaline and connectivity, so that's going to greatly increase your cycles of concentration of what you can run uh, in a boiler system. The permeate water must be treated to prevent corrosion and biological growth. So uh, again, since we're pulling everything out of that water, it now has become incredibly corrosive. And so there are extra steps taken um, to make sure that we limit that corrosion potential biological side of it too. So if there was chlorine in the water, and then it ran through a carbon filter which pulls chlorine out and then it goes into your RO. Now you no longer have anything in that water that's going to prevent uh, biological growth from occurring. And then again, you got to look at soft water versus anti scalant for chloride and water reduction practices, um, especially if you're being put under pressure for chlorides. And more and more cities are getting on people about chlorides, especially if you're in the Madison area. So impact of cycles on water usage. So again, this is just trying to show you that, okay, so over here on the left, if we have, if we're running 1.5 cycles of concentration, you know, we're using 12,000 gallons of water a day approximately. If we were able to run nine cycles of concentration, so we're, we're using that water more, we're concentrating the amount of stuff or minerals in the water. And so the connectivity of that's going to continue to increase and go up and go up and go up. You know, you're only using 5,000 gallons of water. So you can cut that, you know, by more than half by increasing your cycles. Um, you also will re reduce the amount of blowdown um, that you see. Evaporation stays steady. Why do you think that is? Why does blowdown change but not evaporation when we're looking at cycles and water usage? Anyone have an idea? In a cooling tower, if your cooling tower is designed to run, again, that system that runs at 1,000 GPM, right? It's running at 1,000 GPM. So your evaporation rate over your tower is going to be consistent because it's running. Or your boilers, right? If they're running at and producing 50,000 pounds of steam an hour, that's consistent, right? So the evaporation rate of making steam or water evaporating out of your cooling tower stays the same. The amount of blowdown we're going to have to put down the drain is what changes as a result of when we increase that, all right? So when we talk about increasing cycles, it's not to reduce the amount of evaporation. That's a fixed number. You can't change that, right? There's math that states that that's what it is. Um, but what we can change is the amount of water we're putting down the drain. Okay, now I'm going to just uh, give a handout here. It's just, again, what is your system used for? Um, and so... We will, uh, if they didn't move them on me. Okay, I take that back. They moved the sheets somewhere. I don't know where they went. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do that later, maybe over lunch. Just going to have you write down what kind of systems you have, what are they actually used for, make you think about it, right, if you've never actually thought about it. Um, with that, that ends my section. Uh, and we're going to have Kyle up next presenting on cooling towers. So um, any questions about anything pretreatment related before I hand it over to Kyle? How long does the uh, RO filter usually last for? 
Depends, um, right? So uh, depends. I would say the rough number that typically is thrown around is probably five to seven years. Um, again, if, if it sees chlorine, uh, you know, maybe it only lasts six months or a year. Um, if, if it's always really well taken care of, I mean, I've seen membranes that have lasted 10 years before. So, um, it, it, you know, case by case basis, um, that should be something that, again, either you could work with your water treatment partner on, on uh, looking at doing some validating, right? So typically when your membrane starts to not work as well, you're going to see your connectivity start to creep up in your RO. Um, and you could do some testing. Again, if you have four membranes, maybe only membranes one and two are starting to have a problem, right? And so you could look at, you can typically test uh, each individual membrane on an RO for connectivity and you can find, again, maybe only the fourth one is starting to go bad on you and the first three are still working okay. So there is some troubleshooting that, that could go into that as well. So, okay, with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Kyle. Chris, is my mic working over there? Good, awesome. Great, so Jeff kind of ended with cycles of concentration there, and we're gonna touch on that here. Um, it might be a new concept for um, operators, but it's something that water treatment people use all the time to kind of dictate programs. So like Jerry said earlier, we don't just throw numbers um, at the wall and see if it sticks. A lot of what we do comes from um, guidelines, and then what we look at, like cycles of concentration, and then what the manufacturer recommends for cooling towers, and that's what I'm gonna uh, point specifically, is cooling tower specifically. So there's two types um, that we talk about, induced draft and forced draft. Typically, you guys will run into these. That'll be your induced draft cooling tower. So that has the fan on top. A lot of moving parts on those, obviously replacing belts, um, but that's just what we see from a heat rejection standpoint um, in a lot of the facilities that you guys manage. What's the goal? Obviously it's up there. We could go once through cooling, would probably be um, more effective heat transfer wise, but the ability to take water in and go right to the drain just isn't feasible. So what we do is we throw a cooling tower on the roof. We allow for um, recycling of water through cycles of concentration. Um, and then manage the blowdown or bleed from there. So does that make sense? It's really a means for heat rejection, being able to reuse the water and recycle it. But really, for a lot of you, it's the lifeblood of the plant, whether you're a hospital and you need HVAC cooling, or if you're in the process side where um, you need to cool dyes in, um, in whether it be uh, like a, a company like Quad Graphics or Pace Industries, who needs to, to uh, cool their dyes for um, Like that's the lifeblood of the plant. That goes down if you have any blockage or if your temperatures aren't right, you're not gonna make good product. So it says here 70% of plants, um, water is used for cooling. Again, through the cooling towers, 20% for process, 10% for other uses, most likely bathrooms. Um, but really for, for like a hospital, you're talking about, you know, up to 100,000 gallons a day in water usage just to cool the facility. So that's not uncommon. Again, that 70% number is, is uh, pretty accurate. And that, think about that, what that number would be if we did once through cooling and we didn't have a cooling tower. I mean, you're talking about 70% water use, uh, reduction. So really, today, cooling towers provide the most efficient means for rejecting heat. So what are the uses? Obviously we talked about comfort cooling for HVAC. Um, again, big office buildings, hospitals. Process cooling, that's what we talked about earlier. Um, whether you're making something that needs to be cooled, that's where the process comes from. Usually you have heat exchangers, um, like I said earlier with molds or chill rolls if you're um, a printing company. Fluid cooling um, uses different types um, beyond water, when you talk about different media like glycol, different gases, um, they put product on there. Um, just something other than water. 
Most people here use water or glycol type systems. Um, you can use other things with gases. Steam cooling and then wastewater cooling. You don't see a ton of this happening. So how does a chiller work? Anybody have any idea? Yeah, Dan, go ahead. Okay. From a water standpoint, do you kind of know how that, how that works? Obviously, you have the tower side, you have the chilled loop side, you've got, so it's three giant loops. Yeah, so this is just a real basic drawing. Um, they're handling uh, cooling coil. That's just, that can be used for anything. So that would be like, like obviously your hand, air handlers for HVAC, or that's your process that you're trying to cool. That's your chilled loop. So that's what we really want to chill. So you can see on the next one, I'll show you this. I like the way this dumps down for guys like me. Um, it's three loops. So you have the loop that goes to the process, you have the cooling loop, and then you also have a refrigerant loop, which you'll see right here. So what we do is, again, the tower is for rejecting heat. You're gonna create heat from this loop that goes to, whether it be your air handler units or dyes for die cast, um, that somehow you need to reject that heat. So what we do is we heat and cool the refrigerant we then now can reject the heat from the cooling tower. So really, it's, it's all about heat transfer. And we'll go back. So we're going to talk specifically closed loops here. I know Jeff hit on like filtration for closed loops. We're going to talk about kind of uses for these um, and what are some of the common issues with them. But a closed loop, by definition, um, we talk about hot loops, chilled loops, or process loops. Um, they can contain water or glycol, depending on what you're using them for or what temperature you need. Um, really, this is the most important part here. We know it's a closed loop because it loses less than 10% of its volume. And typically, it needs to be chemically treated. So we feed uh, corrosion inhibitors to loops. Um, there's a bunch of different metals typically in loops, so you need to make sure that your pH and your inhibitor levels are in range. Um, otherwise, you can have significant corrosion problems. Um, glycol typically comes, at least if you buy from us, with inhibitors in it already. Um, it's just a lot of times water is not conductive to um, the metals and can definitely cause issues long term um, if you don't treat them correctly. And we'll go through kind of what are the main problems with closed loops. So chilled water loops. If your filters look like this, you're doing something wrong, okay? Water doesn't come with iron, that much iron in it, so it's pulling it from somewhere. That's what that color comes from. So what is that? That's corrosion. Typically, in chilled water loops, it's corrosion. So what do we do? We feed a scale and corrosion inhibitor to offset that. Keep your pH in range uh, between 8 and 10. That's what uh, iron prefers. You don't see scale um, in closed loops. Typically, if you were to see that, it would be very high temperature loops. Over 200 degrees where the process is used, it'll almost cook that hardness out. Um, we typically don't soften water for loops unless they're required um, for a certain process to be a certain water quality. Um, and again, if your temperatures are super high, you can definitely cook the, the calcium and magnesium hardness out. Um, particulate, so we're gonna get into that a lot. Particulate can expedite corrosion, it can expedite bacteria growth. So we talked about filtration earlier. Filtration for closed loops, cooling towers, um, hot and chilled loops, that is, I can't, um, tell you how important removing particulate is. It's a nightmare for pumps. Um, just definitely makes treating the systems very difficult. And then uh, microbiological growth. Typically we see this in chilled water loops. Obviously hot water loops temperatures a little higher, not really conductive for uh, microbacterial growth. So what's important? We're going to talk about chemical systems and why we treat things and where we treat them. 
Really, for these, we want to maintain a corrosion inhibitor. That's really it. Um, if your corrosion inhibitor is in range, you're going to be doing just fine. Um, and then filtration, making sure you have the right micron rating. You want to be removing things. So we don't want to look like this, but we also don't want clear filters because that means we're not removing anything. So it's sizing the right equipment. We're going to get into filtration in a little bit. Um, but that, that, in my opinion, from a closed loop standpoint, if your corrosion inhibitor is in range and you have good filtration, you're never going to see a problem. Once you get a problem in a closed loop, though, it's very hard to get rid of. We feed some biocides occasionally, depending on um, the type of loop. Um, sometimes when you have a nitrite-based inhibitor, you can see um, your bacteria growth um, increase over time just due to nitrite being a source for bacteria, a food source. So what we do is we feed uh, supplemental biocide at times just to keep that down. We're really moving away from nitrite-based corrosion inhibitors, though, for chilled loops specifically. So basic water chemistry. So this is your 101 for cooling towers. What do you need to properly treat just about any system for water treatment is an electronic controller. Controls the feed of the biocides, the chemical treatment, and then will monitor your makeup and blowdown controls. We like to meter everything. Um, depending on where you are too, having a meter on the makeup and the blowdown, you can deduct the two um, and get paid back by whatever city you're in. I mean, we'll talk later, you're evaporating 60% of the water on your cooling towers and that you're paying for. So having the, the meter monitoring is great for um, getting what we call evaporation credits back from the city. You're going to need a blowdown or a bleed valve uh, that controls the, the feed to the drain. Super important, keeping your conductivity in range. Um, we like to load our controllers with a bunch of sensors. The more data we have, the better. Uh, so we can control conductivity, our PTSA, which is the inhibitor residual, pH and ORP sensors. It's really not overly expensive to do this anymore like it used to be. And we don't have the ability to have five uh, techs running tests all day, every day. So this is the best way to figure out what's happening in your system. And then we have obviously chemical pumps for the inhibitor, biocide, um, and some optional things. You'll see on the other side when we'll take you over there, we have options for tanks, different level sensors, flow meters, corrosion coupon racks. So there's a basic overview. Um, the chemical injection system is here. We just tap off the recirculation line. That way we are always monitoring. Unlike boilers, cooling towers, we can always monitor what's happening in the system. We then inject into a common header, which then feeds however many cells or the basin. And then over here, you've got makeup meter. Obviously, we run that back. And then the bleed meter and bleed valve. All that, everything here is controlled by this control panel. Three pumps we typically inject in the same spot. Try to keep it as close as possible to the injection point, obviously, because cooling towers, we'll talk later about the biocides, but those are pretty aggressive. So you can see some issues with injection quills and tubing. Um, but yeah, basic cooling system overview. Any questions about that? I mean, you guys are pretty familiar with, with that. Three, three chemicals is really best practice. And we'll talk about that later, but a corrosion inhibitor, scale corrosion inhibitor, and then alternating biocides. We'll talk about oxidizing and non-oxidizing biocides in a little bit. There's a lot of text on this slide. Um, it's really just kind of discussing what we talked about. The process of evaporation, which we're going to get into cycles of concentration in a little bit um, for heat rejection, is really the basis for the entire system. So sources of cooling tower makeup. I'm sure everybody here is on different water. So this is pretty interesting. 
Um, well water, a lot of municipalities west of Lake Michigan are on well water. Very high hardness, very high alkalinity, um, and a lot of problems that can come with that are obviously scaling. Some come with iron, depending on where they're taken from, and then potentially microbiological growth if they're not treated wells. Munis municipal source water um, can be scale forming. Typically they don't, I mean, they never soften it, so it's gonna have some hardness in it. You may need to manipulate it before putting it into the cooling tower. Um, whether you use wastewater from your process, a lot of you don't have that. We don't recommend that. Um, any reused water like RO concentrate or processed condensate, so cow water used in the dairy industry. You can take that RO concentrate and use that. Um, typically, we recommend bleeding that in with soft water. You can, you can have some significant following. So each poses their different challenges. Pretreatment typically is required for people for cooling systems off of Lake Michigan water. So that's why we soften water or we bleed in hardness. But um, like for those on Lake Michigan water, if you're lucky enough, we don't have to manipulate it at all. Filtration, again, I can't stress how important this is, especially from a bacteria standpoint. Now we've learned that a lot of the microbiological fouling that occurs in, in cooling towers comes from a fouled system already, whether it be high sediment or um, algae growing on certain sides, or if you've got a, a improper blowdown, high hardness, like those are breeding grounds for bacteria. So pros and cons, Lake Michigan versus Waukesha water here. Waukesha water is okay, but we have to pre-treat it. Lake Michigan water, we cycle three and a half times and we dump it right down the drain. So it's super simple to use for cooling systems. Um, we typically recommend a lot, like Evapco, who we partner with, has a guideline for what our water parameters should be. We want to make sure we have at least like 50 ppm of calcium hardness. That requires a little bit of work on our end to bleed in, to soften, and then bleed in hard water. So um, different water, obviously, we talked about has different challenges. Different types of filtration. Um, we've got sand filters, multimedia filters, and then turbo disc filters. All three have a good, uh, have a place. Um, in the end, we see a lot of these, a lot of sand filters. That, I mean, do you guys see that too? Like in your facilities, are you using filtration on your cooling systems? We talked about like earlier with the uh, TechLean filter. Those can get expensive, but um, Having an inline filter is always super nice. Too. You always have um, water flowing past them. So there's really two goals from a cooling tower treatment standpoint. Number one, from a uh, water safety standpoint, which is what I uh, focus my efforts on, is public health and safety. For years, cooling towers have been the hotbed for outbreaks, whether they're responsible or not, we find that the government really pushes hard on cooling tower regulations. So state of New York specifically, um, very advanced in their um, Legionella and bacteria specific guidelines for um, manufacturers and for healthcare, that they highlight cooling towers in a registry. So if you put a cooling tower up, you got to register that thing and you have to prove that you're um, doing the annual t cooling tower cleanings and you're also testing for Legionella bacteria. So it's super strict. Um, they are like giant swimming pools. If they're not treated right, they can be nasty. So partnering with the right water treatment company will make sure that the public health and safety aspect is checked off the list. And then also minimizing your water usage. So putting together the right program for you. This right here, again, we're gonna get into cycles of concentration, but your bleed rate is really the cost of water. And as you can see, as you increase your cycles, you significantly 
decrease your bleed rate. So cycles of concentration. This is a water treatment industry term. So it can be used for both boilers and coolers. Um, it really is the buildup of the dissolved solids in the system. We call it cycling up. So if you've ever heard your water treatment professional say cycling up, we're trying to cycle up the tower and the boiler as much as we can, which is basically just the, the idea of reusing the water, to put it in simple terms. So what we need to do is determine the maximum number of cycles before you cause like fouling through deposits or excessive corrosion, depending on your water, your incoming water. So we'll put together for new accounts, um, like before we come in, we'll tell you what level you can operate at, what's safe, and how many cycles you can get out of your makeup water. So here's what it means. I could just call it stuff in the water. So in this case, you've got, we'll just call it three. Okay. Your makeup water has three particles in it. As you reject heat and evaporate some of that water, the only thing that leaves is pure water. So everything else is left behind. So you have obviously three in your makeup, three particles. When you add makeup water to fill the sump back up after you lose water to evaporation, now you have three more. So now I have six. Again, it's got nowhere to go because it can't go in the, uh, in the steam or whatever is being evaporated. So we do it again. The whole point again, rejection of heat. We lose, we have to make up with, replace with city water. Now we're up to nine. So now we've cycled up three times. So that's three cycles of concentration. Does that make sense? So the way to control this is through bleed or blowdown. So we hit our four cycles on our set point, and I'll show you the, after this on a controller what it would look like. We hit our set point. What do we do? We have to bleed because this will cycle up, whether that be hardness or alkalinity, it can cause major issues in our tower. So we bleed, we make up, and now we're back at our three times cycle. We can put some dollar signs to that now, um, but we'll just go through these. This is, this is just basic calculation. So really if our bleed set point is 1200, our makeup is 400, we're running three cycles. Pretty simple math. So here's numbers attached to that. So at three cycles, our annual makeup is 22 million gallons. Our annual bleed is 7 million gallons. Again, it's usually like 30%, 30 to 40% our bleed to makeup. This is the total annual cost for water to treat this system, not chemical, but water. What do we do if we increase the tower to five cycles? So we're adding two cycles. Our bleed set point is now 2,000. We can put numbers to that. So 36 and 10. Obviously, we dropped our bleed from 7 to 4 and make up from 23 to 19. I mean, you're talking about significant savings. So just by adding two cycles, and again, we're limited, so we can't just everywhere we go add two cycles because we're limited on something, whether it be your hardness coming in, the conductivity, or like alkalinity from wherever your makeup source is. So take a look at this. From makeup alone, and again, water's pretty cheap in Wisconsin, so we're lucky. For people who don't live in Wisconsin, it, this may be twice as, as um, 
as big of savings. You go from 43,000 to 36, which is seven grand, and then the bleed cost is nine grand. What that does though, the less makeup water we feed, the less chemical we need. So we just estimated at about $10,000 per year, you could drop your chemical contract to, now it's 27 grand per year. With the right set point, you can pay for your water treatment contract just with the savings. So does that make sense? So there's a couple ways to increase your cycles other than just adjusting the set point. Automation, so it's pretty standard now. We rarely walk into an account where they don't have controllers that have a brain on it that can send out data. But automating your chemical feed and tower bleed, I would recommend it. You're gonna end up getting savings somehow from, from adding the controller and getting eyes on it. By softening your makeup water, you can cycle up a little bit more. So depending on your incoming water, you can get a cycle or two more by softening your makeup water. Some people already do that. Um, again, Lake Michigan water, you can definitely add a cycle or two if you soften it, but you're adding another expense. Um, feeding acid. So for water up north, maybe just west of Sheboygan, we got very high alkalinity water, 300 ppm, 400 ppm of incoming. We need to feed an acid to drop that down. We can increase our cycles by doing that. A high alkalinity and high pH can cause corrosion problems. So what we do is we feed an acid to keep the pH down and that drops, in turn drops our alkalinity. Look for a better source of makeup water. Uh, good luck doing that. And then install side stream filtration for solids removal. That may increase the cycle. Um, typically that's gonna give you give you benefit in other areas. You may see a benefit for, for increasing your cycles, but typically um, not as much as automating or softening. So we talked about earlier, we don't just pick numbers out of the blue. We use indices. So this, in this case, is a scaling indice. What we want to do is find a happy medium between neutral water and where you need a scale and corrosion inhibitor. So we're looking for readings in between here. So what we do is we input data into a database. We take information from your makeup and it'll come back and give us an LSI or an RSI number. So what we do is we pick one where we can get away with the most cycles and still be safe. And then you can have this moderate scale forming index where then now we, we treat with a scale inhibitor and it kind of keeps us in this sweet spot. So we don't out of nowhere just create these numbers. We use indices and then we treat and we adjust accordingly. So moderately scale forming or moderately corrosive we can work with anything you start getting um, you start getting too high or too low on the indices then you got problems that's where you start scaling up your towers or eating away your metal surfaces so this talks about pH and temperature correlation um, pretty complex idea but in the end if your pH isn't right your LSI and RSI really will swing. I mean, that's really the basis for this whole thing. All right, some cooling water problem areas. Scale, corrosion, and fouling. Like we talked about earlier, scale, that's your calcium, magnesium. That's that stuff that gets left behind when you cook water or boil water on the, on the uh, stove. That we can get rid of. We can take that off. We've got, we've got uh, low pH cleaners um, that can be mechanically cleaned. It's not great for heat transfer, obviously, um, but that's something we can get rid of. The biggest 
pain in our rear, and the reason why we have jobs is to treat corrosion. And that's the loss of metal, and that you can't put back. And obviously, you guys know chillers are not cheap, cooling tower coils are not cheap, the fill is not cheap. So making sure that the corrosion, uh, we keep corrosion to a minimum, but also are picking the right program for you and feeding the right chemistry, that, that is the key to water treatment. So as you can see here, I mean, you've got corrosion at, at, on the end cap of the chiller. I mean, that's metal you can't put back. You can blast them, but you can't put metal back. And then obviously scale, it just looks like some residual around the edge. It looks like some corrosion that's happening on the copper tubes. Um, and then microbiological fouling, that might be what this picture is trying to get at. Um, microbiological fouling can cause corrosion at a much faster rate than like a typical chemical system or a typical system that maybe is on soft water that doesn't have the right treatment. And obviously, um, the like potential for Legionella bacteria, and from a health and safety standpoint, it's just an absolute nightmare. So keeping fouling to a minimum, keeping corrosion to a minimum, will significantly help your system. So some problem areas. This is a giant air scrubber, cooling tower is. So what does it take in? It takes particles, it takes in a bunch of air particulate. We can have cottonwood, um, organics that can follow it. So keeping the fill clean and keeping the sump clean really keep the entire system clean. We're usually circulating enough water through the pumps here, through the chiller, where we don't see a ton of microbiological fouling. A lot of it stems from here because it is a giant air scrubber. So making sure that, again, we treat our biocide, or we use our biocides correctly, and we always keep the surfaces clean and do our annual inspections. We, we clean the distribution deck, our flows are good. Like that is the key to a really um, properly working program. A lot of times you see corrosion or biofouling inside the chillers. Biofouling happens when water is stagnant. Corrosion happens if you have um, improper corrosion inhibitor levels, obviously, but also anytime water sits stagnant. Um, and then this is just a big sump, which can honestly be just about anything. So a typical program, like I talked about earlier, a scaling corrosion inhibitor blend. And we treat with two biocides, an oxidizing biocide and a non-oxidizing biocide. Sometimes these can be added. You don't see it very often um, unless there's like a certain process where things get back into the water. Um, but we don't usually run into that very often. Sometimes a biodispersant will really help um, these biocides work better. Any questions about what a typical treatment looks like? Obviously the blend will change depending on your makeup water, um, whatever you're using. So this gets into the weeds just a little bit. I won't get into it too much. So uh, scale and corrosion inhibitors have, a, it's a blend of polymers, sequestrants, and dispersants. Um, it's used to tie up, what we call tie up, like calcium magnesium. You can feed it with or without acid, typically only if you have high alkalinity problems. No one likes to touch 50% sulfuric acid, so we don't see it very often anymore. Um, again, soft water makeup, it's gonna change the blend of polymers because we now no longer need to tie up the um, calcium magnesium hardness. And that's where your control, corrosion control is extremely important. Um, we test for these. This is in a good program. You'll see these on your reports. PTSA, polymer, um, organophosphonate, or molybdenum. That's just the tracer. Sometimes we can use like phosphate, or sometimes we can use molybdenum as an actual corrosion inhibitor. Orthophosphate is still a great corrosion, in, scale and corrosion inhibitor. 
Um, but that's what those are on your reports. If you ever see your water treatment professional, send that over to you. And usually we feed the inhibitor based on makeup. As you add fresh water, you add fresh inhibitor. That way you, you keep the system um, in range at all times. Microbiological control, a little bit different. Um, it's like scale where it inhibits your heat transfer. Um, it's also just not fun to work with. So if any of you clean cooling towers and you see the algae and you see um, the slime, very unsafe. That's why we feed the two uh, biocides. But um, microbiological induced corrosion is what I talked about earlier. It can definitely speed up the process um, for corrosion. And obviously, um, the hot button here, Legionella, everybody talks about it. There are other concerns about uh, different bacteria concerns, but we talk about Legionella specifically. Legionella will grow with this type of host in a system that looks like this with limited flows. Um, your health and safety risk goes through the roof. Oxidizing biocides. So we feed our biocides based on system volume, not like makeup. So we know the system volume, we know the feed rate of the biocide, which is registered for the, by the EPA. We can only feed a certain maximum. Um, so different biocides have different requirements. You'll see um, chlorine, bromine as your oxidizing biocide. We decide based on the type of system, how high the pH gets, which biocide will work best for your program. What we need for good biocide um, effectiveness is this sufficient contact time. So a lot of times what we do is we put a bleed lock out, we run the pumps, we hold it for 60 minutes so it doesn't bleed and go right down the drain, you're able to, to uh, circulate. If it doesn't touch the surface, it won't kill anything. So that's the importance of a good feed rate, so the concentration, and then the contact time. Dual biocide programs work best, but also it's outlined in every major standard, OSHA, CTI. If you don't have two biocides, I recommend asking your water treatment professional why that is. Sometimes it is permitting. We're limited on where you're discharging. You can only use one specific biocide, but um, they can become, bacteria can become resistant to one, and it's just best practice to have an oxidizing biocide and a non-oxidizing biocide. So these are what you'll see for typical types. Chlorine or bromine, um, chlorine dioxide, not quite as common, but a very good biocide. Um, it's expensive. Sometimes you have to generate it on site. It's not like chlorine where it can come stabilized in a, chlorine or bromine stabilized in a drum or a tote. Um, and rarely do you see hydrogen peroxide or paracetic acid. Non-oxidizing biocides, these are nasty. Isothiazolin, glutaraldehyde, DBNPA. These are super expensive. So we don't feed them quite as often as the oxidizing biocide. We alternate on a weekly basis, typically two or three times a week for the non-oxidizing biocide. But they are very effective in small doses with proper contact time, as we discussed. All right, so some key takeaways. Understanding your makeup water is super important for your water management program. Um, if you need pretreatment equipment, for those of you off of Lake Michigan water, make sure it's operating properly and efficiently. Install meters. I can't emphasize this enough. This is so important, understanding where your water is going. You also may be entitled to evaporation credits for cooling tower systems, so it's worth paying 500 bucks for a meter. And then understanding your cycles of concentration. What is our conductivity set point? Are we reaching our set point? And if not, why is that happening? Um, and then automate your systems. It's really not expensive as it used to be. So having a controller that can send data, monitor the parameters, um, it's about being preventative instead of um, after the fact. So 
I can't emphasize this and the metering enough. From a water treatment standpoint, this saves um, a lot of time for all of us. That was a lot of information. Um, does anybody have any cooling tower specific questions? Okay, we're gonna take a 10 minute break here. Um, obviously bathroom, there's water in the
I like to walk around. So, Chris, you have a, a job to do. Are you ready to rock and roll? Are we good? Yeah? All right. So, please, ask any questions you guys got. It's for your benefit, and I will bribe you if you ask a question, and I will pay you off in front of everybody here. All right? So, I'm Tom Keppen. You heard about that earlier today. Uh, territory manager, water tech, 12 years. You heard all that boilerplate stuff. Um, seen a lot of things, so please, don't be afraid to throw it at me if I don't know the question. That'd be great. If I don't know the answer to your question, that'd be great, because... Um, I'm, not t I'm not an expert. Um, I'd love to find, try and find out the answer for you if I don't know. So please don't be afraid to shoot your questions at me. Just interrupt me, all right? This is for your benefit, not for mine, okay? I'm here to help you guys out, and hopefully you guys can take something home with you, all right? So we're going to talk a little bit about some steam boilers today regarding the functions, some general big picture design stuff. We're not going to get into some nitty-gritty stuff that might be especially specific or really really unique to your situation because if not we'd probably be here all day just talking about this section okay so and then we're going to talk about chemical treatment for uh, uh for steam boilers um so this is probably a basic boiler system 101 all right you're going to have raw to come raw water coming in from someplace city municipality well as the guys talked earlier this morning there's a variety of water uh, water sources that we got to treat. So you're going to run it through a pretreatment system, likely as a minimum a twin softener system. If you don't have a twin softener boiler or a twin softener system on your boiler, bingo. Warning 101. Okay, you should at least have a twin system, a twin a twin softener system. Um, we're going to run a water water through a water meter, deer. Talked about some of these aspects of what this is, or a feed water tank. You're going to have chemical injection. On the storage side of the deaerator, pump's going to feed the boiler system. It's calling for water. Boiler kicks in and goes on a high fire, a different firing rate to generate the steam. And then we have a steam line treatment. We'll, t we'll cover about why you have that. That's injected typically into the steam header system. And then at one point, we're going to. Kyle was talking earlier about reusing water on a cooling tower. Well, guess what? A boiler is almost just like a cooling tower. It's a heat transfer. It's a heat transfer vessel. All right, a little more dangerous. You can launch these and send them and kill people and stuff. Well, that's not encouraged. But at one point, a cooling tower's got to blow down because we're reusing that water over and over again. And so we'll have a control system that blows down a boiler. And then we were talking about equipment earlier, right? Remember, he got a present for asking questions. Uh, so we got, a, we got a controller that helps us with all this, all right? Um, I think I heard Jeff talking earlier, too, when I was in presentations about having a water meter to monitor monitor and measure something that's what we could do with these control meters or controllers the feed chemistry based on what's going on in your, in your on your boiler system and we're going to we're going to start covering some of this a little bit more in detail here but what right now we're going to start with what is a boiler all right <clears throat> well there's two different types of boilers we don't generate steam but what happens is we have what's called a fire tube boiler or we have what's called water tube boiler the way i like to think of the differences is what's going on inside the tube. You got water inside the tube, guess what? You got a water tube boiler. If you got the flame going through the, through the tube, guess what? You got a fire tube boiler. I don't know, it's just a basic way of le learning it. When I learned this stuff over 12, 13 years ago, well, I guess 15 years ago now, um, I was like, what's the difference? Well, I think about what's inside the tube. That's how you know what kind of boiler you got. They come in all different shapes, sizes, uh, a-frames, D-frames, superheaters, there's all kinds of different ways of, of handling a boiler. Single pass, triple pass, um, boiler, they got cooled back sides, they don't have cooled back sides, there's all kinds of different boilers. You probably heard of, some of you might even have Mira or steam generators, Clayton boilers, right? Similar concept, right? It's, heat transfer, it's a heat transfer device to generate steam. Add some energy to it, such as natural gas or oil, and uh, we're cooling, we're generating steam through that system. Same exact concept. So the worst enemies of a boiler, the best way to destroy a boiler is through scale and corrosion and pitting. These are really similar in the sense that one leads to another, but also scale. So we're going to cover some of this too about how do we prevent that from happening, right? Whether you're a manager or an operator or a general manager in charge of production, you know, these boilers, if you have a steam boiler, it's likely going to, it's, it's, it's a huge asset. It's a huge investment. So without that, without maintaining this, this equipment, production can be done, be down. Um, 
It can affect production rates. It can affect cleaning of, cleaning of a facility. The, the, uh, the steam's being used for something, all right? So these, these are huge assets that you got to make sure that, not, that a lot of people invest a lot of money in it. So we're going to talk about, about how these things are your worst enemies. So if we go back to that quick, we talk about deaerators, okay? So what's a deaerator? What's deaeration? It's almost like anti-scale or anti-this or de-this. What are we doing? A deaeration process is we're removing oxygen, mainly oxygen, air, from the water itself. And then, uh, we'll cover that later, a little bit later on. But so the, what we're doing is removing the oxygen from the water, from the water supply. How is this accomplished? It's accomplished through the feed water and boiler temperatures um, in the system. Um, even a little bit of oxygen in the boiler or feed water system can cause problems that if you don't remove it can, ca can cause problems in your, in your boiler system. So what we want to do is we want to remove it from it, the temperature of this water. We'll show a graph later on, but it'll probably make a little bit more clear about why we're raising the temperature of that water to remove that air and oxygen. It can typically be absorbed in a, few, in a few locations if you're not removing the oxygen. An economizer. So an economizer in a, in a boiler system is what they try to do is they try to preheat the water that's coming off, of your, off the feed water side. They run it through the stack. So you have a heat exchange system, um, a number of coils that are in, your, in the flu stack or the, the gases that are coming off the boiler. Those economizers are typically much thinner, thinner scale or thinner, thinner walled um, uh, metal, copper, not a high grade quality steel or metal surface in comparison to the, to the boiler tube itself. Boiler tube is much more robust, robust gauge, black metal, steel, as opposed to the economizer tubes. So you'll see typically economizers fail because there's such a large drastic temperature increase or change, but also if there's a lot of oxygen there, it can lead pitting to the economizer, which then can lead to pitting. Um, steam drums, because you're generating that steam in there, so you're generating a gas, right? Water to a steam, gas vapor. Well, you're also gonna generate other gases when you generate the steam. You're adding so much energy and it's under pressure that you are generating other gases besides steam. And we'll cover that also here. Um, so what happens is that that drum in the face, the the open air, the head that's in a boiler, whether a water, or when there's when you're talking about um, when super, and there'll be oxygen in there or other gases that can lead lead to issues in there. And then also condensate systems, where um, the return water coming back from the condensed water will uh, um, can lead to problems because of that cold, the hot water going from hot to cold, and then obviously the steam condensing from steam to water vapor can cause problems. So it's with a, 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 a it's a really these are these RAS, these are vents that are venting off of the system. Um, I think the best thing to do is just let this speak for itself. The spray type is also referred to as the spray scrubber type because a separate scrubbing section is used to provide additional steam water contact after spraying. In this type, nozzles typically spray feed water in from the top of a steam environment. The feed water is first preheated with steam to prepare the dissolved gases to be driven out. Then, the feed water passes into a deaerating or scrubbing section which uses steam to strip the dissolved gases from the feed water. The feed water is pumped from the bottom of the deaerator and sent to the boiler and the gases are vented from the top. Got an idea? If you have a deaerator, it's, it's, a, it's a critical part of, the, of your system. Having it working properly can lead to well, we'll cover that. It can lead to some increased costs. So, questions? Anything so far? It's going good. So obviously the purpose is to remove oxygen and other dissolved gases because there are other dissolved gases. And there's your answers right. Oops, right down there. There's oxygen, carbon dioxide, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide. There may be other gases in there, possibly from contamination in your process if it if it, if it got returned. But 
because you're subjecting the waters to so much temperature and pressure, it's going to reject those gases. Um, the other reason is, is if you go back to this previous one, there is a storage side. I don't want to go through the video again, but so there is a storage side also. And down here, as you can see, there's steam in. So what happens is we're warming up this water right now. And so the other reason we're doing it is, it, it's, is preventing a thermal shock on the boilers. Because remember, these boilers are operating at the flame in contact with that tube is operating at a temperature that's hot enough to melt the tubes. So again, heat transfer, but also what we don't want to have happen is we don't want to thermal shock that boiler um, and cause unnecessary expansion contraction inside that boiler and possibly messing with tube, tube interfaces or the tubes themselves or having other issues internal to the boiler that just deteriorates the life expectancy of that piece of equipment. Um, I think this, this is kind of typical what you would see then, yeah. So remember I said about temperatures? And again, oxygen is what we're really going to be like uh, emphasizing here. But this is true for many gases that you'll find in the boiler system. But oxygen is the one that's most detrimental to your system. So what happens is, as water is colder, any water, it has the ability to hold more oxygen um, in it. So, as it, so what I, the analogy I like to use is, when you think about ice, well, ice fishing, I don't know, Reno, do you guys do a lot of ice fishing out there? No? 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 I think it's snow, but so yeah, snow around, around here in, in ice fishing, so around here in winter, you know, the, the waters, they freeze and they get, they, they get cold. I mean, they're down here around 30, 40. So the oxygen content is much higher compared to if you're here in the summer where the water temperature is 70 to 80, you know, 8 to 10 ppm versus in the middle of winter for the ice fishermen and the outdoors people. 12 to 13 ppm of oxygen. That's a lot of oxygen. I mean, for us, it's not enough, but for the fish and other aquatic life, it's quite a bit of oxygen in it. So if we take that water and we warm it up, look what happens when you get up to here. Just take it, imagine if on a hot summer day when it's 100 degrees out, look at the difference. Here it's 7 ppm of, of, uh, oxygen, or of oxygen still in the water. But now you heat that water up where you normally see a deaerator work, which is anywhere between probably about 190 to 230, even possibly 240, there's barely, there's very little oxygen in there. So what happens is the water doesn't have the ability to hold the, hold those gases in it, and it releases it. <clears throat> so then on a deaerator versus a feed water tank, um, the major difference is, because what happens is in a deaerator, remember when you were talking about how it likes to go through that, that, that tray or that spray? They do that a little bit differently depending on the type of deaerator you have. Well, that opens up the droplets and provides a lot of surface area for that for that air to get released or gases to get released. In a feed water tank like this, there's nowhere there's there's no really encouragement. There's nothing to encourage that surface area to get greater and larger to encourage that that off gassing of the of the air or oxygen that's in the system. Whereas a deaerator, there's some type of already established trays, spray patterns, spray nozzles, or something that increases that surface area to drive off that oxygen. So that's the biggest thing is oxygen levels. Temperatures will play a little bit different role in it too, I would say I would maybe add to that, because typically the temperature of a feed water tank is going to be around 190, maybe 210 if you want to. A deaerator, you can actually run it because it's under pressure. The feed water might be more 220, 230 on a properly operated one. So the temperature would be a little bit different also. But from a cost standpoint, oxygen is probably one of the bigger things right there from a chemical, ox chemical cost standpoint. I think I kind of covered the benefits. By driving off that oxygen, it can save on chemical costs and energy uses. Um, energy use. The biggest thing from a chemical standpoint is going to be the chemical use. You're not using that bio, the sulfite oxygen scavenger as much. So by doing that, <coughs> you can save on costs on a deaerator a feed water tank. Chemical deaeration. So what happens is we we do the best you can mechanically and let Mother Nature take over. Even though we encourage, you know, with physics and Mother Nature to take over with the temperature and the water that we're, we're working with. But what happens is there's still a little bit left. We can't get rid of it. So there's about seven, under seven parts per billion. Okay, parts per billion. That graph I showed you was in parts per million. Okay, that big one. This is seven parts per 
And so it's 0.00 or 0.007 ppm, okay, that we're talking about. So how do we get that out? These trace, this trace oxygen is in by typically some type of oxygen scavenger. Sulfites, bisulfites, you might have heard, you might have. There's other ways, there's other organic materials like ah, that we can use to, to drive off those gases or to consume that oxygen. So it's just a chemical, um, a chemical reaction to get that remaining oxygen out of the system. And that's where water tech comes in because that's where, where we would help you guys with that stuff. So, um, so the other parts of the basic boiler program, we talked about oxygen scavengers and, and the corrosion control, but then also we're going to talk about internal deposition of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the boiler for deposit control, condensate return with the corrosion uh, inhibitors. And then we're also going to, you might also have a typical, you might have alkalinity builders depending on the type of, of your of water that we're talking about or even the return of your, of your steam condensate. Here Jeff talked about earlier RO and how corrosive it is and it removes alkalinity and you might need to do chemical treatment afterwards or boost that. This is where you typically see these alkalinity builders that you need for it. <clears throat> so a, a typical, um, when we're talking about the typical feed points, we kind of covered it on the, on the typical layout. We're gonna get more into about the chemistries themselves right here where typically what you see is you'll see it, you know, Are, are normally added here. These are the locations because what you want to do is you want to protect this this feed water tank or deaerator from oxygen pitting too. Because right, it, what's its goal? To get the air and oxygen out of that water. Well, adding the scavenger to this on the storage side of it <coughs> is going to help protect that storage side of the of the feed water system. All right, and same with the internal and alkalinity. All, the metallurgy in these systems are typically all black iron or stainless, so. Black iron likes a higher pH with the temperature also. So we're gonna wanna raise that, we're gonna wanna raise that alkalinity or pH of that water. So that typically, again, you wanna protect this also because typically the piping from your steam, from your deaerator to your boiler system is, uh, um, is black iron. Um, so that, again, likes a higher pH versus um, um, a lower pH, which if you remove all that alkalinity is what you're gonna end up having. So. You're going to add your alkalinity boosters to the storage side of this deaerator. Um, so then we got to transfer it over over to the boiler, and this is going to be the internal boiler water treatment. Some of you might be on a phosphate program or a polymer program. That internal boiler water treatment to protect the insides of the boiler from a, a scaling standpoint, and we'll cover that a little bit later on here too. Um, and then the condensate, most efficient location to add your steam condensate. This is probably one of the trickiest things to ever add into a boiler system is the steam condensate because what happens is, is when someone built your powerhouse, they didn't care about us or how you were going to get your chemical treatment into it. Um, so what happens is you come out of the, the stack or you come out of the steam side of the boiler and like within like six inches you're, you're teeing it off. Or you, someone put in another boiler here and they, they come in from different locations, or this boiler goes to the south side, this boiler goes to the north side. No one ever thought about really what's the most efficient location to put this in. So sometimes this is the most challenging place to find, find a place to inject your steam condensate. Because really what you want to do is you want to find one place and in, inject it so that it, it just shares itself throughout the entire facility and protects your condensate system. So ideally, if this was, if this was it and it teed, yeah, this is where you'd want to put it. But imagine if someone had another boiler system here and it came this way and it went this way, it's typical, or if there's a third or a fourth boiler, or this boiler is 500 horsepower, the other one's 700 horsepower, this is just a trim boiler, but you know what I mean, as you guys have been in powerhouses before, you can appreciate that, that this can sometimes be the most complicated one to add. So if you can't add it here, what's the next best is normally, who's gonna ask that question? No, no, no. Who's gonna ask me the question? What if you can't add it here? Oh, I'm sorry, what was that? Huh? What if you can't? Oh, what if you can't? Great question. I can buy you off. What would you like? Uh, like Say again? A mug, I guess. A mug? Okay, there you go. I hope we got a lot of these around. Thanks. There you go. So, yeah, great question. Oh. So, what happens if you can't add it here? Next best would be right here. 
to the feed water because whatever boiler that's going to, hopefully, um, will be uh, hopefully it's on a header system. It could go to the whatever boiler it is. Because in theory, from here to here is one closed loop. It's not ideal, but it's probably the next best spot to go. All right. Or you'd have to end, add multiple injection locations in the header for each individual boiler, which is when we've done that too. So, but it does represent the most challenging thing to add for um, a chemical injection location. Who's going to ask the next question? All right. Oxygen scavengers. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> covered this a little bit, but a little bit more detail cover with, with sulfide because what we want to do is if you can kind of see in this picture if not I know it's in the slide there's a lot of pitting it looks really rough almost like 20 grit sandpaper in there so what that comes from is the oxygen pitting <coughs> of the the boiler tubes themselves this is probably on a, on a, um, a water tube boiler because it's on the inside of, of, uh, of the pipe not on the outside so but there are different options for you for oxygen scavengers and when, I, when it comes to oxygen scavengers, this is obviously typically the, the biggest workforce that anybody has in their plant. These other options do work. They are other options. And actually, some of these will actually help clean up um, systems too. But the sulfide is probably typically what we all typically see in our system. I think the biggest thing with oxygen scavengers sometimes ends up being too, what are just the requirements of the plant and the facility too. Again, it's fed to the storage section of the DA, and it's fed below the water line. That's probably the key, is it's fed below the water line also. Because if you can imagine a DA, right, we got those gases in a DA, it's not full of water, but you got all those gases in there. If you, it happens, it's common, we'll show it to you. They'll, you know, someone said, well, there's a, you know, a, a mechanical contractor said, well, there's a port, I'll just inject it there, it's on top. Well, your DA is running here, your water level is here, you're injecting it here. Well, that water, that chemical droplet now goes right through all those gases and then it goes into your water. Well, what we'd say all those gases are? There you go. Bingo, winner, winner, chicken dinner. What do you want? You want a mug? All right, someone better tell uh, Lisa we're running low on mugs. It's a popular, popular item right now. Okay. So, yeah, below the, below the water line. And then the other thing is the Montana constant residual in your boiler. Okay. A lot of you guys are probably thinking we're all running 20, 30 parts of oxygen scavenger or sulfite in the boiler system or 40 or 50, depending on what's going on. There's many reasons it's gonna be a long, a, a, a big range, but <clears throat> you wanna maintain that content residual because if you're maintaining even 10 or 15 parts of oxygen or uh, uh, sulfite residual in your boiler, at least it's there for the spikes. You're maintaining that just so that you have in your boiler as you consuming it. So hopefully if it does, but it just comes right back up. We want that, so you want to maintain, the only reason the benefit of maintaining a residual constant is that if it's constant, it's, it's more easily um, monitored and maintained. O2 scavenger performance monitoring. So this is kind of a nice graph to show you how important it is what your temperature on your DA, because remember that big graph I had as it got hotter? So here's what happens when it gets hotter. Oop. Here's you got your temperature of your, of your feed water coming off the DA. So see what happens when you maintain a hotter temperature of the feed water? Because if you're maintaining a higher temperature of the feed water, you're driving off the oxygen. Right? So then what happens is the O2, um, the, sulfite, the sulfite demand goes down. And then as the sulfite goes up, because of the temperature, the, the temperature dips, the sulfite dips. Temperature comes up, sulfite comes up. You're driving off that air or you're driving off that oxygen that's in the water. Higher temperatures here, your sulfites are higher. Low, temp low temperatures, lower sulfite readings. Directly, it all correlates together. So it's back to the original slide, it saves on costs. So now you're not spending as much money on sulfite. All right. Internal treatments. So this was that second one where we said we added it to the deaerator right below was oxygen scavenger on that one picture. So the reason we add this is that you're going to see many different, uh, not the reason I have it, what, you're, what you see here is a many different blends of different types of, of uh, chemicals. Polymers are probably polymers, dis dispersants, sequestrants, chelating agents, and phosphates. These are all types of uh, dispersants that are used in it. Um, typically, most programs are getting away from the, the phosphate programs, and they're more of the polymers and the newer technology. Not many 
programs are left in, on phosphate for many reasons, not just environmental, but also um, the, 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 just the chemical and the way the, the phosphates react in the system with, with hardness, up, hardness upsets. But the, big, the biggest reason for having these internal inhibitors is the controlled deposits of hardness and scales of iron, copper, silica. These chemicals, or these um, constituents that typically precipitate out on that heat transfer on the tube. So, um, the reason that, so the other way to think about it is um, the way that they work is if you had a bunch of boxes in here, it'd be easier to stack those boxes, right? No matter what shape or maybe which type, but whatever size they are, just to stack those, right? Just like a bunch of block, blocks, right? So that's like scale working on a boiler. So imagine that the reason you have these is imagine if you had a bunch of bowling balls or beach balls. Try to stack those. Which one's going to be easier to stack? The, uh, the, the boxes. So the idea is that the internal treatments don't allow you to generate th those boxes, but it allows you to generate those little, those volley balls, pool balls, whatever it is, because you can't stack the balls. So that's the idea with the internal treatment, is that if you do develop scale, hopefully it doesn't, it's not as easily ge generated and created like a bunch of boxes are. It's almost like trying to stack a bunch of balls or beach balls or pool balls or whatever it is, all right? So that's, that's what they try to do. And then obviously feed points vary on the treatment program and what you have, the water quality and various tests um, are done to do that. Um, some people test the, the, the feed water, then what's going on, do you cycle the concentration? Or sometimes actually now more than ever, they just measure the concentration to make sure there's a residual in the boiler to help combat any, any scaling from occurring, just like a sulfite would. Um, this is really important. Do not rely on, rely on this to handle and prevent scale from occurring, all right? The biggest thing this is, it's, it's, it complements your whole boiler program. The biggest thing is that it's your pretreatment system. Really, this is intended if the pretreatment system is upset for some reason or something is coming back from the condensate system to help prevent those boxes from being created, all right? and the scale from being created. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that <clears throat> your pretreatment system is working properly. Nine times out of, 99 times out of 100, your entire boiler chemical program is going to be successful based on your pretreatment program being successful. A lot, of the, a lot of these chemistries, all these chemistries are really designed based on soft water. I think, well, I know both the guys touched on it. Well, no, I know Jeff touched on it this morning about the hardness in a boiler, okay? Um, so. Successful pretreatment system, a successful chemical boiler chemical treatment program. Okay, it helps. Trust me, it helps. I've seen boiler water that has been milky, milky white. You open up the boiler, I thought for sure it was going to be scaled up, and it just it was just a light powder like chalk on it. It just came right off. So, but I wouldn't suggest you run a boiler system like that 99 times out of 100. So I wouldn't recommend it. Period. Um, so we got we covered. Oxygen pitting, we, we covered uh, internal corrosion control and, and scaling, but now what also remember regenerating that steam so it's going on in the system. So <clears throat> what we're going to do is we're going to talk about that chemical and treatment for the uh, condensate or steam line treatment. Some of you guys might call it an amine. What happens is the boiler, again, remember we're, you can't get rid of all the gases that a, uh, that's going on in a boiler. So with all the energy and pressure that's going on in a boiler, there's carbonate-based alkalinity. And what happens is this alkalinity breaks down and it generates carbon dioxide, CO2. <clears throat> That's great. So it's not just pure steam. We also have other gases going out into the steam system, correct? So what happens is well, this CO2 condenses. When this CO2 condenses in the presence of water or water vapor, I shouldn't say water, water and water vapor, it generates what's called carbonic acid. So that carbonic acid is an acid, lowers the pH of that that's coming back um, in the condensate system. So what happens is you can end up with your condensate system being attacked. You can kind of see a little bit of change in the, the thickness of, these, of the walls here. So what happens is the walls end up of the condensate system get attacked because of the acid, exposes the acid, or the acid exposes the, um, the uh, metal surfaces more, and then what happens, typically in a system somehow it's going to cool so you might draw in some oxygen. So then it's going to rust. And then what happens is you can have oxygen pitting and oxygen attacking 
the system also. So you get a double whammy, acid and you get oxygen pitting on a condensate, condensate system. So what do we do to fix that? So we will add an, an amine to combat that low pH. Volatile amines, not like gasoline, but it just it has to do with the, the vapor pressure of it, that it'll go off into the system. So because it, it's injected as a liquid, volatilizes, becomes a gas, and then it reacts with that carbonic acid to neutralize it or to raise the pH. Oops. So we'll add the amine off the header, because again, we're generating CO2 off the header, <clears throat> and then this goes out into your system. Steam condenses, the amine reacts with the, the carbonic acid that's being re, um, created, and then the, the, acid, the condensate that's coming back has a higher pH. So then we don't, then we don't um, end up generating the acids, eat the condensate system pipe. Um, the amines are typically, you'll see all kinds of, they'll do different blends. The reason they have, diff well, they have different types of blends with two, three, or four um, different types of products in it. Um, someone's going to ask me the question, right? Why? 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 There you go. All right. I'm running out of cups, so I got hats. Did you get a hat? Someone won a hat earlier today. You did? I'm running, I'm down the hats right now. Atta boy, that's what I'm talking about. There you go. I have a hat. Sorry, there you go. So why are there multiple ones? That's a great question. So why do they have two or four different ones? Why isn't there just one? Well, what happens is um, the, the different types of amines react at different temperatures and pressures. And what happens is depending on the size of your facility, some, some will react, if you will, imagine like just be in a football field. Some act between the, the, the first goal line and, and the red zone, the first red zone. Some of them react between the red zone and the 50 yard line. Some react between the 50 yard line and the next red zone. Some react, you know what I mean? But as you're going down the length of the football field. So what happens is different types of amine react at different temperatures and pressures in the system. So you may have certain amines that will react in a, in a system this big, but this amine that's reacting here doesn't react here. It's consumed and used right here or the one that's being used down here isn't working here as much as much as it'll work at the end of the system. We'll have plants that are half mile, three quarters of a mile long. So um, you gotta have the amines work at different parts of the plant depending on the temperature and the pressure of what's going on in the, in the steam system. So, um, and then obviously if you're preventing acid then the oxygen pitting of the system um, is reduced because you may end up sometimes having oxygen introduced into a condensate system because of, whoops, this right here. The big answer is yes. But what can happen is sometimes what people will do is if, if, it's, re if it's really difficult, uh, a satellite injection location further out in the plant also. Typically, yes, it's done off the controller or on really basic systems, sometimes it's done right off the, the, the feed water pump, depending on how complicated the system is. But typically, I'd say eight, nine times out of ten, it's done off the controller. And it's as simple as this one right here that we have right, that's right over here. And there's a little bit more bigger, there's a bigger one on the other side that if when we look at it, we can, um, that, that'll do the same thing. So it takes in more inputs, outputs, mm -hmm. bigger boiler systems. Um, great question, see? All right. Um, Oh, I'm so, uh, so, uh, so then the other part was the, the oxygen. What happens is, is when the system, so the system's under pressure, it's, it's all heated up here, correct? Everybody agrees with that idea? Well, when it, when, it, when it condenses, what happens is the system starts to cool, right? Because you're no longer heating it. Because a lot of times, or, I mean, even the, the condensate might be insulated, but it's going to start to cool. You're going to lose heat. But you're also going to, what happens is, you're also going to draw a vacuum. Because of the, 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 the because of the change in temperature, just like you know, like when you can jars or whatever, right? Or maybe I'm dating myself. Sorry. Yeah. Where are you from? My mom cans jars all yeah. Time. So when she cans them, right? She puts it. She and they pop, right? They suck right in. All right. Sorry. Thank God. <laughs> I thought I was gonna get really older for a second. So uh, so what happens is it, when it cools, it draws a vacuum. So what happens is these these there's multiple condensate receivers out in the facility that'll happen is, is they'll start to cool, condense, and they'll draw a vacuum. Well, these are vented because if either A, they, 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 they 
draw a vacuum and suck themselves in depending on what's going on or they have to be vented just be, because otherwise it, the first potential could build some pressure right if you have a failed steam trap so air gets inter introduced through these vents on here well that this gets where you get some oxygen and air sucked into the system which then comes back into the condensate system so that's why you that's so I mean on a on a hot con on a hot condensate return system not as likely but there's obviously we all got different facilities about condensate returns. So, um, <clears throat> uh, so the oxygen gets introduced through these these condensate return locations. Yes, you might have pressurized ones. Yes, you know um, some. I think there's there's vacuum systems out there and stuff of that sort. But even on a vacuum system, it's relied on a suction pressure, right? A negative pressure versus a positive pressure. Um, so oxygen control. Of it, it enters through the condensate system receivers process. Um, it can be treated through um, uh, different types of chemicals. Filming amines are, is another one which they'll cover later on. DHA. These are these other chemicals that can be introduced into the into the into the condensate system to help prevent oxygen pitting, depending on your, the system that you have. Um, there's also blended amines, which it, it's a newer technology, but they're going to cover that. Blending means and filming means they'll be covering that later on with some innovative stuff that they'll be talking this afternoon with. And then monitoring it. <clears throat> so, yes, there is a way you can monitor to know if you do really do have a problem. One is through watching the iron levels on your, on your um, system, conductivity, but also probably a lot of you have condensate, or I mean copper, sorry, kind of condensate. You have copper coils or something out in the plant that is usual, utilizing it maybe potentially or some type of coil you know if it's if it's a uh, if it's heating a vat there might be copper coil on it or something that it's returning it and then you can also monitor pH levels and oxygen levels um, in the condensate <coughs> and uh, um, the VLS concentrations in the system too so there are ways of monitoring you know a condensate system not just throwing your hands up to say I don't know you know I, I know my pH is fine but there's other things you can monitor also Water use in a boiler and the boiler water system. So we kind of covered chemistry, why we're using it, hopefully some benefits, so why, you know, get an idea why we got to have it. But <clears throat> um, the other thing is just a properly well running boiler system. Yeah, we're using water, okay. But um, I think, I don't know if Kyle covered cycles of concentration this morning. He did? Okay. So again, remember, there's a lot of similarities between boilers and cooling towers. And one is cycles of concentration and heat exchange. Okay, so <clears throat> Kyle covered recirculating in the system, and then also the cycling up of, of, of the idea then of, of cycles of concentration. So I won't spend too much time on that. But <clears throat> I think the thing to determine what's going on here, we're, we're, we don't want to form deposits or excessive con uh, corrosion by running too high as cycles of concentration. All right, hopefully between. The facility and your water treatment provider, they'll help you determine what works for your system. All right. So cycles, we'll go through this a little bit quicker since I know the guys have covered this. But just to reiterate that we start off with one cycle of concentration. All right. This is measured through the, your conductivity test. Some, might, some of you might do TDS, but typically it's uh, conductivity. So you generate steam, and this is just water vapor and a few other gases. But the inorganic, the, the inorganic materials left behind, the constituents, sodium, potassium, sulfite, other chemistries that you're adding to the boiler, that all stays behind because that's designed to stay in a boiler system. You just want water vapor going out. <clears throat> so you find it out that we're going to make up some more. So you end up with two cycles of concentration. The steam goes out. You've got to add more water to the steam, right? Whether it's condensate return or makeup, it's got to come back. So that's three cycles of concentration. What happens is you, you keep adding more and more water to it. it. The boiler itself comes to a, not a breaking point, but the water itself, the boiler itself comes to a point where it says you probably should get rid of some of this water that's in this boiler. So what you do is you end up ble bleeding it down to the, to, the, to the drain. So then what happens is you get rid of concentrated water to add up more, more makeup water to it. So... Typically, a boiler system may end up, you know, running 10, 15. Some of you might have RO, maybe 80, 90 cycles of concentration. What I want to show here to you guys is that 
from the water standpoint, water reuse, water conservation stand, what, what happens is if you take a typical boiler system, um, you know, a steaming rate of 50,000 pounds per hour, if you look at typically, this is on about like, this is on Lake Michigan water, you might run around, around 10 cycles of concentration if you're running around 3,500 connectivity in your boiler and your makeup is about 360 or so. So around 10, 11 cycles of concentration, right? You gotta blow down a 16 a day, feed water 160,000 gallons a day, you know, to meet the steam rate. This might be typically what you might see, all right, from the water side. So Kyle said too, we wanna reuse it, right? Conserve water. So a lot of assumptions in here, but what I would encourage you to take away from it is the order of magnitude we're talking about here, okay? So we're talking about maybe an annual blowdown cost of $15,000 a day, six million gallons of water, annual makeup uh, cost of $45,000 a day, okay? Just, you're probably thinking there's a lot of questions like what about this, what about that? Take away from this the mainly the, the order of magnitude. So if we, if we come back and we change, we change just by changing the set point of your controller and improving the condensate, not, not changing the set point, but improving your condensate return system, because here it was 58% return, here it's 79% return. Just by changing that, what we can do is you can increase the concentration to 20 cycles. You just doubled it, right? You're at about 10, now you're about 20. Half of what they would just were, right? Your annual makeup costs were about 45,000, now they're 21,000. Your annual blowdown before, I think it was like about 12,000 or $13,000, and now it's about $7,000. Well, you're, so that's a good question. You're not physically like going out there doing something to change it. What you're trying to do is you're improving that condensate return program, whether it's like through steam trap evaluations, making sure your steam traps are running properly, um, capturing condensate that's coming back. Because um, I mean, I've, I've been in plenty of production facilities and worked in them where like, the condensate receiver is just dumping the water on the ground. Because now I don't mean to yell at maintenance or, or facilities, but the guys got other things to do. They're production driven because that's what the general manager wants, right? So they might just open up that valve and let the condensate drain on the ground. By if you have time, I mean I understand it. We all get it. I mean I get it. If if you got the time to you know service a condensate return system like you should, you'd be returning that water that you just paid to soften, right? And it's, it's get used over and over and over again. Jeff talked about softeners and dealkalizers and pretreatment costs. And now we got chemical costs. That, I mean, in the industry, the condensate's liquid gold. You heated it, a natural gas, and how, how much, you know, five, ten, ten bucks, thousand cubic feet, you know what I mean, with, with natural gas costs. Water costs, water pretreatment. So if you can just return better condensate quality in the sense of returning more of it, you'd be better off. Because then it improves the feed water, it lowers the feed water, you're not using as much feed water because you're, you're, you're already reusing that water that's already been in the system from the steam. Don't go home and just go, you know, start changing your cycles. You know, this, is, this isn't based on saying changing the cycles or the, uh, the controller set point. This is improving the, the, the boiler system itself, the condensate return system. You could even get a little bit better. If you, when you start increasing the, sometimes when you start increasing the, the connectivity, like what is, is right here to the 180 compared to what it was before, sometimes when you do that, sometimes you can even change that set point because you got better quality boiler water going in there. You don't have to worry about boiler water carryover sometimes. So you can even get better, more savings. Again, I'd encourage you to take away the order of magnitude here. I guess I kind of busted my bubble here with talking about the savings that you're looking at. 50% savings. Chemical savings, fuel savings, $100,000 a year, I think you just about paid for your boiler program. So <clears throat> we always talk about steam boilers. We're gonna touch a little bit here on um, hot water closed loop boilers. Kyle touched on them this morning about you know what makes up a closed loop a little bit. And he also touched about you know some closed loop stuff regarding uh, on, on chiller sides of things uh, with, with the towers. So we're gonna kinda touch on hot water boilers here for a little bit. Um, and if you guys were paying attention to Kyle's part this morning, he asked this question about what's an, what makes up a, um, a closed loop system. 
And this should probably, this slide is almost, it's identical to what Kyle was just talking about. If I remember, he, he made the comment about 10% a year of lost volume is on a closed loop, can contain water glycol, um, and it is typically chemically treated, okay? Um, but typically when we see hot water loops, um, it's either A for a process or it's, it's strictly comfort, comfort heating. Um, the hot, hot loops, the biggest concerns we have with hot loop is mainly, it's, it is corrosion and iron. Um, scale not as likely because we're not dealing with these really high skin temperatures that you're, that you're seeing um, in a boiler system. Um, clarity in particulate um, can be uh, a concern because what happens is the particulate especially, clarity is probably a, a good indication of treatment, but part, uh, the particulate can be a concern because you don't want that going out in your system and, and causing um, not corrosion but erosion of the metal surfaces or impellers or um, clogging up screens, um, attacking seals um, from that standpoint. So, and, and clarity is a, a, typically a good indication, of just a, 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 um, a good look at to say, hey, it, it's nice and clear. Well, I think I at least got some fairly good treatment versus if it looks like something like this, so what's in this picture. Um, microbiological growth, and again, I remember Kyle talking about this. It's not always typically a concern in hot water systems, hot water closed loop systems, okay? I don't want to start confusing it with hot water um, potable systems. So this is, you know, this is diff that's different, different, in, different side. Um, this is only um, ends up being a concern if it's a seasonal system, where it's off for six, seven months out of the year, and we're not, <clears throat> we're not, we're not treating it actively, or it's not actively being used, and it's just sitting idle, and it's already dirty. Then you might have biological growth. But once you fire it up, it's likely to kill, the system, kill any biological growth in it because you're talking about much hotter temperatures. Um, and then what's the, uh, the important part about teching it is it's a corrosion inhibitor infiltration. Jeff, I know Jeff talked about this morning too, a lot about filtration. Uh, and I, filtration is probably the, one of the, the, the littlest, most inexpensive thing you could add to a, a closed loop system to protect it. Because it'll get, they'll take out, take out any particulate, if you, if you develop scale and it comes off, take that out too. If, you have iron, if the iron becomes a particulate, it'll take that out also. Okay, but I agree with Jeff said this morning regarding filtration on closed loop systems. Um, a few takeaways uh, on the boiler program or on boilers is feed water hardness um, is probably the most critical test that you run because I said earlier. I mean, the chemistry is all based on soft water being used, right? And we're not supposed to rely on our internal boiler water treatment program chemicals to, to prevent that. They're there more as a, as a safety net, I would say, all right? So your hardness is probably the most hardness, and I would say pretreatment, because there's other aspects of a pretreatment program that you might have that will remove more than just hardness. Connectivity control is critical, because we talked about that cycling up so that your boilers don't potentially um, have any carryover, you, you, you don't want to have too many minerals in that water where you may lead to scaling and or, or deposition of, of uh, scale on the heat transfer surfaces. And then the other thing about that is the controller is just that it, with the automation, it, it, it helps you accomplish it on a more regular basis and a more steady state basis, which is normally easier for everybody to handle. Uh, oxygen scavengers, checking your deaerator temperatures, pressures, uh, chemical feed pumps, tank levels, um, in the system um, for the deaerator is going to help. Again, having these regular checks on, on your on your deaerator system, uh, maintaining the proper levels of, of the chem. I would expand it just saying internal uh, chem chemistry of the boiler itself. Covered oxygen scavengers. We talk internal boiler water treatments, <coughs> um, condensate return, monitoring and, and checking that. Kind of showed you the example of having a good quality condensate return. You can save the plant facility a lot of money in chemistry, fuel costs, and water because it's a higher quality condensate that you can reuse over and over and over again. You already paid for it once, you can keep reusing it again. Um, and you can do that by monitoring uh, iron levels. Um, and actually, you know, then we were talking about some of the corrosion stuff with regards to pH. So iron and pH is typically how that's the biggest concerns there. And I kind of got ahead of myself on that one, so. Can you talk about feed water hardness? Yeah. Um, so I guess, in our application, I just took the RO water and I took the hardness of that. Okay. And is that what we're talking about here, or are we talking? 
Okay, so so, I'm, I just, so for the people on, online, um, the question was you were you're checking hardness on your RO system, yep. but that's it, kind of is what I'm hearing. Um, yeah, I mean, as far as like seawater hardness, I'm not taking any seawater and checking hardness on that, just the RO. Okay, and then, and then for the guys online, the, the, he's also not checking the feed water hardness. Pretty much just so you're just checking RO discharge hardness. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So I recommend you should check your feed water because okay. what can happen is. It's a great question because what can happen is your condensate system. So you could be introducing hardness through someone open, leave something open. There's everybody's got some story. Someone did something and they plumbed in the wrong line to a line that they thought was something and it wasn't, and you got raw hard hard water coming back. So by checking your feed water, you're assuring that your heart your feed water doesn't have any hardness in it. Um, because if, if that's the only thing you're checking for hardness, think of what's going in your deaerator, your feed water tank. You got your RO, right? Mm -hmm. You also then have condensate return. So that condensate could be what is that condensate goes to junk on you. So now what do you do? You're not you're not monitoring anything else that's downstream, correct? Yeah. So just I would recommend you at least you're monitoring the feed water. It would be a benefit to monitor the hardness of the condensate. That way you could see what something was going on there too. Oh, the hardness analyzers, yeah. yeah. We, we, yep. I know what you're talking about. So then, the, well, you, the, so the mirror feed water um, hardness analyzers, typically they're done on the feed water. Mirrors are real sensitive to hard water, yeah. typically seen with RO. We have some that are on soft water in the area. Um, but the mirrors, yeah, those, so that's monitoring your feed water. Oh, okay. And those can also, well, I'm assuming it's monitoring your feed water. Um, you probably could set it to monitor your condensate, but the condon, you know, depending on, what your condensate system is, you could probably put one on there, but they're expensive, I know that. So they're probably just monitoring your feed water, then you get your alarm. And I know there's different ranges you can set it for. So yeah, because we, 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 we will sell replacement cartridges for those also. So monitoring your feed water through that is, as long as you pay attention to the alarms, you'll be good. Yep. But physically checking them, then you, you, you're sure that you also know that your, your hardness analyzer is working too. Okay. Great question. Anything else? No? Um, troubleshooting corrective action. I think we, why don't we just pause right now until I find out if we want to start this? Because lunch is here, but I don't know if we're set up yet. And we got about 10 or 15 minutes. We could start corrective actions or I'll see what we want to do. Um, I'm, I know someone else is listening to me. Um, oh, it's not set up yet. You want to, all right, you want, so you, you want to start this? Okay, yeah, that's fine. No, that's just fine. Anything else, guys, on boilers? What we, we talked about so far? Great questions. Bribery works with this group. <laughs> Bribery works, all right. So, but no, thanks, guys. You guys have been great. You'll get to hear from me again later this afternoon. So if think of more questions, then we'll, we'll, we'll get you more bribes. So, all right. Okay, so we'll start getting into troubleshooting and corrective actions. Um, we'll take about 15, 20 minutes tops to get through. I'm gonna cover the pretreatment portion of that. So let me just, uh, I'm gonna have a stopwatch going here. So I don't keep you guys late on lunch. How about that? So, all right, so let's dig in. All right, so what are corrective actions, right? Identify parameters. Uh, they should have a, a normal operating range. Identify if they're in range or out of range. Uh, and then again, <clears throat> what potentially could happen as a result if they are out of range. There are chemical uh, as well as mechanical based corrective actions. Uh, and then again, there's gotta be some follow up. So if you run a test, something's out of range and you do nothing about it, you might as well not have run the test, right? So those, these corrective actions are important. This is where we're going to make sure that we actually keep our system um, running the way that it should. So. So as my boss likes to say, so you know what's a sample, where to grab the sample, how to make sure it's a good sample, how to run a proper test, and where to log the reading, now what, right? So you did all that work, and then if you're not gonna do anything about it to correct a problem, or pick up the phone and make a phone call, why did you do all that work necessarily? So always before you do anything, if you get a bad reading or whatever, it's not a bad idea to resample, 
or re-rinse your cup and then rerun or, or redo a test, right? Um, sometimes you can get contamination um, or just a bad color change or whatever may happen that um, might skew your, your testing results. Okay, so most common uh, problems associated with filters, right, is again, high pressure loss. You let the filter run too long. Um, improper application. Uh, so when I say that, again, maybe you selected a filter that's not rated for 180 degrees and you open up your filter housing and you're like, why is my filter disintegrating every time, right? Because it's not the right filter. Or I can't tell you how many times I've seen a new construction, um, uh, you know, a pipe fitter's putting in a filter housing. They're just, they're, they're putting it in where they were told to put it in. Maybe they don't question it. And you take your supply and your return off the same pipe. So you have no pressure differential to actually push through that filter housing. So then you go and you test a loop that you thought had chemical treatment in it and you get a erroneously high number coming to find out that um, it's not plumbed right. So the chemical that was added was never actually added into the system. So, uh, and I know there's at least one person in the audience that we've gone through that with. So, um, and then again, plugging and fouling um, uh, are, are issues that may be happening. Is your, again, your filter not the right type of filter? Is it too fine a filtration for how dirty of a system that you have? Um, all those things. Most common problem with filters, again, so look at these bad boys. So <laughs> that's a customer of mine, and um, that was the worst chilled water loop that I have ever seen in my life. The loop literally looked like that. So um, it was really bad, but we got onto it, and he was on top of filter changes, flushing his system out. I am happy to say that loop now is cl clear water when you grab a sample. So. Um, it took a lot of time, um, we're talking about a year uh, of doing this to get it back to where we wanted, but um, that's what happens if we do have poor water treatment and no filtration. Those were in for, I don't know how long they were in for, prior to me being there. Um, softeners, things that go wrong with water softeners, right? Most common things, no salt. Seems like a no-brainer, but how many times you're the guy who adds salt, you go on vacation, uh, I, I, I come in, the softener's hard, and I immediately open the brine tank, it's like, oh, well, John's not here and that's John's job, right? He's the only guy who adds salt into our softener. So um, that's important to make sure that we don't run out of salt. How quickly does your softener go through salt? Those are the things that you should try to learn. Some systems, again, maybe you don't go through that much salt. Other systems, you're adding 20, 40 bags a day. And so pretty quickly you can empty out that brine tank if you're not staying on top of that. Programming bad, um, see that quite often. You know, uh, you get into a plant um, maybe something was wrong and they thought, oh, well, I'll just change the settings on the softener and that should help out, right? Um, and then it's no longer programmed properly, so it's not going to work properly. Again, sizing it, super important. Um, too big or too small, you're gonna have issues. And then again, seals and internals go bad over time on softeners as well. So um, softeners work really well until they don't and then they normally don't work well at all. So um, I always advocate for you should be on some type of PM program for your softeners that we're not waiting for them to fail and then it's rush city because, hey, I'm having 100 ppm of hardness go to my steam boiler and I'm scaling it up and it's freak out mode. If we are proactive about it, we hopefully eliminate that. So some of the things you can do to check again and just see, okay, what can I maybe correct um, or is wrong? Again, rerun your sample, make sure that again, you just didn't have some wacky reading or um, testing a unit right after it comes online, you might get a false high hardness. Um, typically when a softener first comes online, there's gonna be a little bit of hardness slippage coming through. Same with right at the very end of its run. If you test a softener and it has 100 gallons to go, you're probably gonna get a higher hardness than if you tested it with 1,000 gallons or 5,000 gallons to go. So you know, note where you're testing, where you are at in that cycle. Um, uh, is the unit you're testing online. You don't want to test the unit that's offline. You want to make sure you test the unit that's online, right? So most of you are going to have either a twin alternating system, two tanks, right? This tank is on and it's running until it needs to be regenerated and then this one comes on. You might have a triplex system, so you have three tanks. Um, you can look and tell which softener is on. That's the one that you should be running your test on. Check your brine tank. Uh, again, do you have salt? Did the salt bridge? So I always like to recommend to people you should have some type of rod or something that, again, weekly you're sticking into your brine tank and you're making sure that you didn't have any bridging occurring, that salt can um, bridge and then you don't actually have any salt in the water below it, but you think the tank is full of salt because 
it looks like it's full of salt. And then one thing you can always do is you can put a softener in a manual region. Maybe a fluke, it just had a bad region, uh, and put the other softener online and then validate that that one's working properly. Uh, how do you know the software is working? Uh, continued, right? So run a hardness test, right? So this is one of the tests that we're going to have you run in your facility. If you have softeners, you should be testing and making sure that your softeners are working, um, whether it's just feeding directly into your cooling tower or into your boiler, or if it's feeding into an RO, you should probably be checking the softeners feeding into the RO because you don't want to, again, shorten the lifespan of those RO um, membranes. And boilers, we want, we want to aim for less than half a part per million of total hardness. Um, typically, especially again, depending on pressure, if you're running a five pound boiler versus a 500 pound boiler, it's gonna make a big difference. Um, and then soft water uh, for cooling towers, normally we're okay with up to 20 ppm because if you're cycling your cooling tower up about five times, right, that's about 100 ppm of hardness then in the cooling tower, um, and that's more than fine for um, running a chemistry program in cooling towers. Hardness actually acts as a little bit as a corrosion buffer. so. Um, we want some in a cooling tower to prevent corrosion or help prevent corrosion. All right, so, you know, hey, my softener, I'm getting a short run, right? So it can, it can soften 10,000 gallons and I'm only getting 5,000 gallons out of it and then now it's going hard at 5,000 gallons to go down to zero, right? So something's checked. Did the raw water hardness change? So like I had said before, right? Does does maybe the water your supply you're getting change wells and it changes the incoming quality of that water? Maybe that's part of it. And so sometimes it's softening, you know, water that has 100 ppm incoming and then other times it's 200 ppm. Well, that's going to screw up your softener because it's programmed to probably soften for that 100 ppm. Did it have a poor regeneration? Resin fouling. Do you have loss of resin? Resin is going to break down over time. So at some point you're going to need to replace your resin in a softener system. Um, and so maybe it's just a factor of age. Maybe your drain line flow controller isn't working and you actually blew resin down the drain out of your softener. That can happen. Um, if you're having high hardness, again, is we're all water bypassing the unit. So, hey, I have high hardness in my cooling tower. Oh, I found that there was a bypass valve that got opened somehow. And so we were adding, you know, straight city water in and it was skipping the softener. Again, maybe more resin fouling or increased hardness in the uh, raw water supply. And then pressure drop is typically due to bed fouling or the drain is plugged, um, et cetera. So again, typically when you have softener issues, reach out to your water treatment partner and they can help walk you through, okay, we'll check this, this, and this, and then we can maybe figure out from there. Again, run that brine elution study. That's really important uh, to do. Uh, again, annually is a good idea because it's just going to prove the softener is working the way that it should. And so we won't get into too detailed on it, but a brine elution study is, uh, this is what it's gonna look like, right? Is it's not an uh, exciting thing to do. You sit at, by the drain, you grab a sample every two minutes, you test it for conductivity and for the amount of salt that's in it. And you should see a nice bell curve if things are working the way that it uh, would, right? So A represents regeneration with saturated brine. You want a good saturated brine solution and B represents it if you had a dilute brine. So if you don't have enough salt in your brine tank to make a good concentrated brine, you're not gonna get as effective of a regeneration. And then again, uh, you have what would look like a good one. So you start out and it slowly starts to ramp up and then it really takes off again around minute 20. And then we wanna maintain, ideally you wanna maintain 30% saturation for 30 minutes. So again, at 20 minutes to 50, we're maintaining that 30% saturation. That is ideal to get a good regeneration of that resin. And then here we would start our uh, rinsing cycle. And then again, it should take about 10 minutes to rinse all that salt back off pretty much down to zero. Then we've rinsed any excess salt that wasn't used in the process um, down. Um, this one you can see is again, we had insufficient brine. Um, so we need, to, we need to increase the amount of time that we're drawing brine out of that brine tank, right? And there's all these different scenarios. We won't go through them all, but just know if you run a brine elution study and you get an, and you, you uh, graph it, you should be able to tell what's going on um, based upon um, this brine elution study. For ROs, again, what are the common problems? Hardness, again, coming from, the water softener is not working ahead of your RO, so it's giving you problems with your RO. It's not an RO problem, it's the water softener leading up to it, right? Did the, if you're feeding an anti-scale into your RO instead of softening the water, 
Did the pump lose prime? Did you run out of chemical? Um, you know, something like that. Are the filters leading up to it plugging? Or the seal's bad? Or is the pump that's you know, supposed to be boosting that pressure not working? Um, or chlorine breakthrough, that's a big one. Uh, if you're getting city water, a lot of times they add chlorine into it. If the carbon filters that you have ahead of your RO aren't working and you're getting chlorine coming through, it's going to chew up those membranes. Um, so running a chlorine test on your RO system after, before the RO, but after your carbon filter, there should be a spot you can grab a sample. Um, it's good to make sure that you don't have chlorine that's getting through that carbon. Because at some point the carbon is going to go bad and it has to be replaced too. Uh, and that's a lot cheaper than replacing membranes. Or does your RO need to be cleaned? Typically, smaller ROs, maybe you're not really doing a lot of cleaning, but larger ROs like this, um, they're gonna have um, CIP capabilities built right into it where you can hook up chemistries to do a CIP cleaning, um, and maybe it needs to be cleaned. So if hardness or conductivity are high, obviously check the incoming water, check your gauges, and then again, I had said earlier, each RO membrane, you have the ability to test. So it's hard to see here, but there are these little red sample valves. And so it's a good idea to check every single membrane uh, and make sure that again, it, all of them are having a problem. One of them is having a problem. None, of are, none are having a problem. It's not a bad idea to do that once in a while, or at least when it seems like it's having a problem. And then again, monitoring and maintenance. So you can determine if gradual fouling, scaling, or membrane degradation is occurring by observing performance. So just so you see here this graph, so RO permeate flow in GPM is the blue line. You can see it's going down. RO pressure drop is the red. You can see it's going up. So what this is again showing is, hey, our pressure was going up and we're losing performance through RO. Time to clean this one. Um, this happens to be a large one that we do CIP in, in place. Okay, any questions on your corrective actions for softeners, RO systems? Uh, I know I went through that kind of quick, but again, I wanna keep you guys on schedule to get some food here uh, and for the remote viewers to get a break too, so. Any questions? All right, then we will uh, head. I got, I got oh, go ahead. Who's gonna win uh, the Raider Chiefs game this week? Well, Chiefs, Chiefs, come on. <laughs> Uh, it'll, be a, the, the, it'll, it'll be one, but uh, I, I'm going with the Chiefs. Okay. The question was who's going to win Raiders versus Chiefs for people that are remote. So we got Chiefs in the crowd as the fan favorite. I think they have a good quarterback. I'm taking Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just picked up Derek Carr in my fantasy league. Got it. So it's 11.55. Uh, we'll look to take a 30-minute break and then get back to it. So about 12.25, if my math is correct. We will look to resume, so thank you.
Jeff, we're starting, please. Jeez, Louise. I hate these. Sorry. It's so hard to talk. All right. All right, so far, we, we should hand out five hour energy drinks, I think, after lunch. I think everybody should get a little shot of five hours so you're good to go for the rest of the afternoon. You get a little water tech ones, a little water tech emblems on it. Jeff, there's an idea. Friday. Friday. After lunch, we should get little little five hour energy drinks with water tech emblems on them and hand them out and let everybody have one. Questions would never stop. Yeah, my ears would be bleeding. So, um, are we ready? Okay. So, uh, any questions so far on this morning? Again, remember, I can be persuaded and bought off and paid off. I'm a little more liberal about the gifts and the presents. Um, but there's a lot more. There's a lot more things to cover. This afternoon is going to be. Uh, we're going to start on some more of these corrective actions on a few things. Um, and we're going to do some other boiler stuff. And I got one more speech after this. So I'm going to cover a few things regarding some boiler water um, and steam, some testing, and some corrective actions that we've had. Um, so the only thing I'm going to preface this with is we're going to show you some pictures of um, some data, some actual data from customers. Now you don't you may not know everything there is to know about the ins, ins and outs of it. Okay. But what I want to do is I want to walk you through the troubleshooting process with, that we're looking at this. So maybe as a manager, if you're looking at these reports and you say, what's going on, what's going on, all right, start, just something, stuff, stuff to start thinking about. I'm also going to tell you that also I might throw a little curveball at you and I might tell you, well, these are lead leg boilers, all right? You're not going to get all this from the data we're going to show you, okay? What we want to do is show you the data and start talking out loud about, like, what are we looking at here? What, 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 what are we thinking? Just kind of help maybe run through, like, that ladder logic or the, the idea of what, you know, someone gave you a report or there's some, or you did your test yourself and maybe there's something to think about or maybe we can give you a different idea of looking at something, okay? So obviously when we, when we show you this stuff, we're not going to necessarily show you everything that there is about the system and a big layout and something like that. So just, we'll talk, openly discuss it, okay? And again, if you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask. So the thing with the boiler thing, with, with boiler chemistry and the, and the boiler test that you're going to do, someone in the world had established some type of control range for you, okay? Now, it could be operating history, or it could be ASME, mechanical engineers. Um, what they recommend for boilers based on uh, pressure ranges that your boiler operates at. Some of it could be boilerplate. <clears throat> you know what, we have the same boilers in, if you're local, you know, New Berlin, New Berlin Wisconsin, same ones in Waukesha, it's the same water source. We're just going to operate the same way because it works at that plant. We have just about the same thing, cookie cutter, boilerplate, same facility. Um, but typically what you do see is if you actually run the numbers on what the, what the limiting history or what the limiting factors are in most boiler systems, it's going to be iron and silica. Uh, and probably more times it'll be silica because silica is something we normally don't take out of pretreatment systems um, with, the, with, the facility, with the water. And then I, I guess I just kind of hinted at it, it's experience. Yes, you might be able to run 3,000 connectivity, um, but you know what? You, if you want to run that, you have a lot of boiler water carryover, or the the feed water can't keep up, or the softeners can't keep up, so we got to run 4,000, or we have carryover. We need to run less. We probably should run 2,000. So uh, the experience is probably nine times out of ten what might over what might be your trump card in terms of changing something the way it looks like. So. Um, <clears throat> Or the so ASME, I talked about that, or the other one is ABMA, which is the American Boiler Manufacturers Association. Their guidelines, and again, they're going to go by operating temperature. They're going to provide you what, what it looks like throughout the process from your feed water tank down to your boiler water um, and, and where you are. And a lot of it's going to be based on your, on your pressure because uh, higher pressure boilers are going to require a much, much more refined, a much more pure makeup feed water. So as, you, as, that boil, as that boiler pressure increases, the demand on your pretreatment system, pre system becomes more critical. And you notice what I said? It's the pretreatment system. All right, chemistry does play into it, but the, you, you can only get so, so much pure water, so you gotta start improving or making the changes to your pretreatment system. Again, going back to what I said before in my earlier one this, this morning, pretreatment system is gonna be a key to any bo successful boiler program. Chemicals are gonna help, and we're gonna help you with that, okay? But that pretreatment system, okay? So you might see some types of guidelines or you might have a <clears throat> some matrix like this filled out about what, you, what, what you're testing. Um, 
this is exciting, <laughs> okay? It's a lot of work, right? But I think what's even more exciting is this afternoon when they talk about innovations. And could you imagine doing all this? And then this afternoon they're going to talk about innovations and about three quarters of this goes away. That's the exciting part about this afternoon with the innovations at the end of the presentation. So, but, or at the end of today. But, um, so a lot of us have matrix that probably look like this. Check for sulfites in your boiler water. Check for polymer in your boiler water. Check for the total iron in your condensate system. Iron in your feed water. Hardness. And you notice the hardness is all up here in the raw water and soft water in the, in the pre-treatment. So we, you have a matrix that's typically done between yourself and the, uh, um, your boiler water, your, your chemical treatment. So hopefully you have some type of control chart that you can compare everything to because it's great to run the tests and do the tests. If you wanna, if, you know, but it doesn't mean anything unless you know what, what you're comparing it to. All right. So um, we typically provide a control chart that looks like this. We'll, we'll give you some real basic um, corrective actions. And you'll see that some of these are, are very typical. In, I mean, if connectivity is not in range, then you, you may hold off on doing anything. Or if connectivity is in range, you need to increase the chemical feed pump. All right. <clears throat> uh, boiler log sheets. Hopefully you guys have one of these things ready to rock and roll so that you can have it. This comes off our WTE service, which is an online program we use for data entry. Um, a lot of customers will print it off, and then they'll use this as their log sheet for daily log entry in, um, in, their, in their boiler room and then they transfer it to the online program. Then we'll email the emails the report out. Um, so do you rate your corrective actions? Let's talk a little bit about something like this. Um, these are probably the most common problems that you'll see in it. You know, again, draw from my wonderful presentation this morning where we had that wonderful curve with temperature and pressure. Temperature and pressures aren't correlating because you, you know, uh, the, the, something could be venting more out of a, with cover, something could be venting out of a, a deaerator more, and it's not holding pressure, it's not building pressure, it's not getting temperature. Well, typically when it does all that, it's coming from the steam system itself. If it's not holding temperature and pressure, or, or it's coming up. Um, or chemistries are out of range on the, on the, on the, um, the feed water, the deaerator. Because you are testing it, you know, there, we are testing the storage section. That's, uh, oops, that's in here. Oh, I know this customer. Um, so th there's a storage section on here, and I th this customer, we, I think we we sample right there. So chemistry is not in range because you're testing this. So chemistry is not in range here. They're not going to be. They're not going to be in range downstream. And what's downstream of this? These boilers that are in the background here. There's one in here, and there's one right there. And then the other one is con contamination, because remember we said we have condensate coming back from this thing? Well, where's the condensate, condensate being used? If it's production facility, it's out, it's out on production floor, or it's some aspect of production, some heat exchanger, or, it's, um, or it even can come from contamination on a, on a, on a heating system that's just using for HVAC, because there, like, there could be a heat exchanger that's failed. So that's all coming back to these, this deaerator. So you can see contamination. So if the temperature and pressure, <coughs> um, you really got to come that back to what is it you're reading because if it's garbage in, it's garbage out. So if your pressure gauges and your temperature gauges aren't running right, um, you're, you're going to have unreliable. It's like a speedometer in a car. <laughs> it ain't running right, you're probably going to get busted for speeding, right? So you need to check the accuracy of the gauges and, and just do uh, you know, simple checks on the control system and, and stuff of that, of that sort just so you know that you got the right information and the right data that you're dealing with, all right? But also, there's a couple of things you could check. You know, it may not be the gauges or the pressure, or the, the pressure gauges and the temperature gauges may be accurate, but it could be something else that contributes to it. Because remember, the deaerator, we got to have steam to raise the temperature and generate the pressure. Well, there's two things. Well, the steam isn't getting to it, it's not getting to it right, not getting enough to it. And then the other one is, um, we'll cover this, is this vent. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but the, 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 remember we showed you that there was vents coming out of the deaerator? There's a, there's a really quick way you can look at that to see if you're, if you're venting properly also. So deaerator performance is a monitor. Is, you, know, you, gotta, you can also get a dissolved oxygen analyzer um, because, again, we're monitoring it. You can measure it. You can get uh, these Cometric test, test um, um, AccuVacs are already, they got a vacuum to it, you pop it off and it sucks in the water and then you just do a color metric comparison to see what your oxygen levels are. Um, hold it up to the light, 
like what this operator is doing to see what what it looks like, and you can see if you what the auction levels are that are coming out or going to your to your D, um, to your boiler system. Hopefully, it's nothing. But if it's not working right, you could shut your chemistry off and then check your dissolved oxygen levels for a few days or you know, let it run for a few shifts to get the, the sulfites out. But you can test it to see how well your system is running. Um, or you can, get, you, can get, you can get online analyzers too, and those are pretty expensive too. But um, I think I have one customer that, that uses um, an online analyzer. And they do, then we double check it with um, uh, the ActiveX, the, chem, the Chemnetrix. Um, visual ones. Uh, you should check temp temperature, pressure, sufficient steam flow, and then this is the other one. So this is your vent, here's your vent one. If you don't, you're not seeing at least a 12 to 18 inch flume coming off the, 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 the pressure side, the vent of the deaerator, you, you probably are going to have issues because what happened is something's restricting either the flume or the plume that's coming off of the uh, deaerator. So if that's the case, then you're, you're not allowing the gases to get out of your deaerator. So they're they're stuck in the they're stuck in the uh, deaerator, or you're not generating enough pressure and temperature to get to allow the, the gases to get out. So then now you now you got, now the temperature of the water is not hot enough to drive off the oxygen. So it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? And we'll, I will show you some pictures of that. Or what it could be is you could have a, a poor spray pattern. So remember on that one picture it showed you where that one column was where um, we called it the tray or the spray pattern location. So depending on what it is. You could have nozzles that are clogged in there that aren't allowing the spray to create the surface area to drive off the air or the oxygen. Or your trays could be clogged because there'll be holes in the trays to allow the water to fall through a tray to fall to another tray because you're, again, you're trying to increase the surface area to allow the oxygen and the air to escape out of the water, right, the gases. So you could also have spray patterns. Obviously, these are things you gotta check, you know, when it's down, it's, you gotta have a chance to inspect it. Nozzles get clogged because you remember we got iron coming back that you know, or dirt or debris could come back. It come from, could come from the pretreatment system too. <clears throat> so here we have an out, we have a plume coming out. Now I would say pay attention to this closer plume, not the fact that it comes out here. But here we could have a potential situation where maybe you don't have enough pressure coming out of that plume. Even though it is horizontal, typically you see them vertical, but you know you really don't have a driving force where you would say that the diameter of this pipe is about the same diameter as that, 18 inches or so out from, from, that, from here. Um, the other reason is you, to have it is that that way you know if you have enough steam coming out of there, you're not corroding that pipe also because you have exit velocities that are not allowing condensate or anything to happen. So hopefully it's, it's uh, not allowing moisture to condensate or steam to condensate, condense inside that tube. Here it's vertical, but you can kind of see this, this plume, right? <coughs> comes up but it doesn't do anything. And if you look at it, it's actually losing water on this roof. Yes, it's the middle of winter, but it's just not driving it out. So you're not you're not getting that pressure and that release of the gases out of the plume. You'll see these are typically the the the, the orientations you see them in vertical and horizontal. Normally they're vertical. Uh, boiler co corrective actions, the most common problems you'll see is a boiler that's out of range. And we could probably make a make 10 pages of reasons connectivity is out of range but um there's so many reasons that it, it is and uh, it can be it, which then can cause the chem chemistry is being out of range um other problems that people might see is cloudy colored water it's just discolored for some reason um if it's milky looking it's probably iron or not iron um calcium or magnesium or some type of hardness if it's red it's probably iron um I actually had one boiler that was green and it was copper. Um, but uh, uh, there could be many reasons that this coloration, but typically it almost looks like drinking water. Don't drink it, but it does look, typically a good well running system looks like drinking water. And then the other one is boiler water carryover, where literally the, the water, the steam, that the water that's in the boiler makes its way into the steam header itself and it, it just carries itself over to the steam system. So this is where we're going to show you some tests, some tests that were actually done um, on, on at a customer's location. Um, we're going to blame Jeff for all this because um, it was his it was his uh, it was his customer. So you run you run a test boiler one. So I don't know if how many are familiar with this. So here's the nice thing about this program. Just a little. Um, so if you're a Packer fan, this is awesome. Green and gold rocks. All right. 
you guys don't have a team in Nevada, do you? We do now. Vegas. Oh yeah, Vegas. Oh yeah, that's right. The Oak Raiders. That's right. Yeah. So we don't have we don't have black and silver on here. But we I don't have black and silver on here. So anyway, so then the, the other bust in the chops would be as uh, bear 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 fans, uh, red, orange. Them. Yeah, they're always getting slaughtered. <laughs> and then the or if you're a 49ers fan, you know that the other, that's the other color, red and red and orange. Um, Green and gold is good. That's all that really matters in this part of the world, anyways, right? Packer fans is what is, is the biggest concern. So, green and good is typically gold in our program here. And then the other colors that aren't green and gold, same as the rest of the NFL team, doesn't really matter. Okay, but um, so typically as a manager, you look at it and say, "Well, I got red. I got I got orange. Something's something's a muck. Doesn't make sense." Okay, we got low conductivity in boiler one. We got looks like pretty good pretty good in range, just out of range. Boiler in boiler number three and everything else looks good. The deaerator, your pre-treatment system looks pretty good, right? And your condensate returns coming back, a little orange right here with 9.14, just out of range of 8.8, okay? But um, we're gonna look at this right here too, all right? Polymers in range down here too, all right? Now what I'm not gonna, what I'm gonna tell you about this, this is also a lead leg system, okay? Meaning one boiler um, is the main, and then the other one is a trim boiler, or you might know it's a trim boiler, but it comes on secondary. When the first boiler can't keep up, and it's for whatever the set points are, the, the other boiler will kick in. Okay, uh, just the the SAR are doing that too. So that could also play into it. All right. Um, so here's what I would start doing. So this is what they re, this is what they first came up with. But I would I do this one over right here. Start over. Run your tests again. Maybe you didn't do something right. Maybe something was slightly contaminated. Maybe the guy in the previous shift did screwed something up. Just rerun the test, all right, before you start getting excited about it, okay? So run it, redo it, do your stuff over again, okay? Just to make sure. Better safe than sorry. So what we might want to do is we might want to check for improper losses, right? Because this is kind of low. It doesn't seem to be cycling up. Remember we talked about cycling? It's not supposed to cycle up like it should have. That's one thing you'd probably want to do. And then the other thing I would ask, is this a normal kind of, that we, is this normal operations? I think we are going to agree that it's not normal operations. Oops, sorry. And then I touched about the pH. So, so could this be related to poor boiler readings? Ah, uh, it could, right? That's why we asked you to, to resample it. Um, but like I said before, actually, it's not, it's kind of almost normal because of the lead leg operations we're talking about. Now I'm not saying it's completely acceptable, but because again, like I described, one boiler is running most of the time. Oops, that's boiler number three, right? And boiler number uh, one is um, uh, the leg boiler. So it doesn't get the run time like it should, but the controller doesn't know any better. So the controller is still gonna blow it down to make sure things are going right. So it might've been losing some water and it's just not running as it normally, do, as it normally should. So this, this could be considered possibly a little bit normal operations. However, if it was our side, what I'd say is that we should be switching prior. If you're worried about it, either A, run higher chemistries in boiler one, or B, switch the boilers from lead leg so that one gets some run time and gets more chemistry in it. Because in a lead leg situation, that leg boiler typically isn't getting the chemistry on a regular basis like the lead boiler is. And then the other one would be, um, the other one would be this, since this seems to be in range, and this seems to be in range, and this is just really from a lead leg situation, this is probably just a slight chemical overfeed. So turn the pump down a little bit. All right? Does it kind of make sense? You see when we were talking? Because the, or the other argument would be, what if this wasn't a lead leg? Well, what could happen is this boiler is losing water, so it's not cycling up. But at the same time, the boiler that is running all the time seems to be fine. Right? Well, then you probably have some type of water loss in here that just isn't allowing the boiler to get the chemistry in it. That's why. Because you can see when the boiler is running it normally as it should, the numbers are all in range. So it gives you an idea that you're probably feeding your chemistry at the right rate. Because you got one boiler that's doing pretty good. The other one just isn't getting used or it's blowing down too much. But this is actually lead leg, so this is probably more normal than anything else. All right? So here's a, another, another test um, where um, boiler two, well, well, uh, when you compare the two boilers, connectivities aren't exactly close, but they're, they're you know, close enough. But if you look at the two, the two sulfites, they're both really high. 
even with one just being slightly out of range, but this one's even more out of range, but sulfites are still a little high when you compare them with the, with the two boilers and the connectivities, right? So, you, if, but the low connectivity, we probably want to be looking for water losses again, because remember we said we, the, we let, let it get up so high, then you got to blow it down. That, that's the only way the water's getting out of it, okay? Yes, there's carryover, but that's a different situation. So, um, but it's, so it's going down the drain. So it's going down the drain. Well, why is it going down? Maybe you're improperly blowing down the boiler system. Maybe a timer's messed up or valve stuck open or someone's got a bypass open on the, on the boiler they're not supposed to. You know what I mean? Um, or an operator said, oh, I'm just going to blow it on a boiler because it was really bad and so I just blew it down and left it open, right? And then again, you might want to check also that lead leg operation. Maybe the set points aren't quite, aren't quite, aren't quite right. On the sh on the shutoff. Yeah. Okay. Built up sediment. Yep. Yep. So we ran out of chemical altogether. We had a, it melted. I didn't do it. We we got an account one because they had the electronics the electronic ones too, and they melted their boiler. And we had a new customer. We got the customer then after that, but um, it was but it was because of buildup in their in their shutoff. Yeah, it could be really critical. <laughs> yep. Um. Since, con since connectivity is low, right here, this is, these both are probably because of overfeeding of the chemical. The reason, I mean, so remember we talked about, some of you might say, well, how can you be overfeeding the chemical if the connectivity is low? Well, remember we're cycling up a boiler, so the chemistry stays behind and just the steam goes out. Well, then we gotta add more water, more chemistry back into the boiler. So as we're doing that, what happens is, you're adding chemistry, but steam's going out. Well, the connectivity is still low. This this ratio, the best way, the easiest way to describe it is pretty much a direct correlation. If you double the connectivity, in theory, all these numbers probably should just about double also. So, if you if you double this and put this in range at 2,800, this in theory would be around 100, 100 140, 130. Because again, you're doubling everything. Because you're still adding the same amount of chemistry for the same pound of same pound of water you're putting in for that one pound of water that's going out. So you're still overfeeding that chemistry. So this is likely because of an overfeed of the chemistry. Even with this one, it's just slightly out of range. It's still enormously high. But now you have a way to control that. You can just shut down the, the oxygen scavenger chemical pump. You can turn, not shut it down, but turn it down a little bit until it comes down. Um, or the other thing, it could be water losses too. So we'll show you this part too. In the next one, again, this is that part where I told you to think about something, and I was saying it could be because of this and this, but you don't know everything surrounding the, the customer. So what happens is it could also be because um, when you look at that, this low connectivity in the operations of what the probe is doing. So what happened was, is this the graph? This is the graph I want to show you. So water losses is because of blowdown, right? So what could have been happening also with this same customer is you see the connectivity is coming across and all of a sudden this drops off. The boiler temperature probe section of the probe, after you do some further investigation, could have also been the failure. Connectivity in a boiler is dependent on the temperature of the, of the, of the probe. All right. So again, even us talking about this, as you're walking through the troubleshooting and corrective action of this, you also got to consider why is what's going on or, or what's causing possibly some of these errors. The tests are probably right, but what could be happening is it could, the, the controller itself could be getting bad data in it. So what it's doing is it's blowing down the boiler more because it thinks it's, it's something's wrong. And in this case, you can see that the connectivity started to come up and the, and the, and the, and the temperature came out and dropped out because the, the, the connectivity relies on temperature to provide an accurate reading. The other thing that can happen is when you're having that low, that low reading, because the connectivity is down, the connectivity is dropping, falling out, and you, you're thinking, well, it should be blowing down like it should. Everything else seems to be right. Well, if you look at this, this is the blowdown valve. If you check the blowdown piping to make sure it's, everything's reading accurately, because what will happen is, is if the probe's reading junk, the controller is going to operate based on the junk that's going on. Well, if you look at this one, this valve isn't closed all the way, because this little box right here, indicates 
the direction of the valve. This is a ball valve, even though. So this is telling me that this is the direction of the opening, or no. Yeah, this is the direction of the opening. It's slightly open, but the controller thinks it's off. So it's continuously blowing down, and it's not supposed to. It's intermittent blowdown. So you're checking, checking the valve stem here, and it looks like a little crooked. It looks like something broke here, too. So, But because of this, other, other many, many boilers, they also have bypasses around it, so you might want to check the bypass or check the, for internal leaks or something of that sort. Maybe, you know, there's another valve that's leaking by. So this is that that same system. Again, you don't. You, you, I, you obviously, if you guys would have seen all this, you, you probably might have seen more, maybe more other obvious reasons. But again, this is where you get the data, you see what it is. But the investigation and the corrective action really depends on what else is going on in the system that the data may not show. So here, here the probe comes down. It, it's submerged. So I, I mean, I would think that the you know the probe should be should be doing fine. However. When it drops off, if this is leaking by, this could just be steam pushing through here too. So if the steam is just pushing through there, it's not going to read accurately either, because it wants to measure boiler water, not boiler steam. So it may not. So you may not be measuring the right, the, the right, the right type of water, because again, they measure conductivity of the, the boiler water, not the conductivity of the, of the steam, and that's going to cause the probe to read inaccurately too. Um, this is this is showing you um, just an, an install this on this side and these are just other places where you could have you know the, the bypass leaking by or these valves failing these things that you know these these are bottom blows these these valves may not be in the right position they could be blowing down the bottom of the boiler um, uh, unexpectedly so you're just letting water go down the drain that you're not expecting it Um, another boiler problem. So if you look at the number of the sulfites, so the, the softener looks good, right? Feed water looks really good. Rocking and rolling. Condensate looks really good. pH a little high. Um, and then uh, uh, the boiler. Looks like the connectivity of the boiler is reading a little bit high. And it looks like we don't have any sulfite. PM alkalinity is fine. This is the, the phosphates of the internal boiler water treatment. Looks like that's a little bit low. Um, those are the, probably the biggest concerns you have here, right? We already said that. <clears throat> so where are we adding the sulfite? We had the sulfite to the deaerator, right? And a number one, if you have zero and your and your connectivity is high, you should be having some type of sulfite in the boiler. A zero is a good indication you don't have anything in, in, in going in there, all right? Now, obviously with this one, we know it's going to the feed water tank, but the basic idea is that we don't have chemicals going in there. So that's what this would tell me to look into is, is the sulfite chemical test. I mean, I guess, yes, in theory, it could, if you start running through it, it could be the controller or maybe a relay valve failed or depending on how they're physically adding the chemistry to it. But at, at least as a minimum, you know that the, the boiler itself is not getting any any chemistry or any chemistry going in. And then the other one is the high conductivity. Now this could be the other thing I would say about this is this could be intermittent too. So if you typically a boiler when you have it on a controller does intermittent blowdown. So I mean it'll sample like every two hours or three hours or some maybe even once or twice a day depending on the size of the system. You know so th this that when we when th this was done, it's put possible that the the operator could have recorded a temperature in between those blowdown times too. You know, does that make sense? If I say I'm going to blow down every 12 hours, I, I measure now at noon or 1 o'clock, I'm sorry, and then it doesn't blow down until 1 o'clock in the morning. If I measure at 10 o'clock at night, that's, that's been 10, 11 hours or 9, 11 hours of, of the connectivity to the boiler just building a building, building, but yet the controller doesn't know. You know what I mean? Is that the controller doesn't know, and your data wouldn't know either. So, and the condensate pH is probably related to what we've been talking about when it comes to the condensate pH. Probably an overfeed. We talked about that. Talked about that. But does it? This is great, right? Well, I just said condensate. Probably chemical feed. Look into it, right? This is this is this is that customer. This is that customer. 
that's sulfite. <laughs> so there's probably a reason why the sulfite's not getting into the tank. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and then so this I think I, I don't remember if this is a feed water tank or if this is a, a oops a deaerator. But the other thing is that's your chemistry, right? And what's the other thing I told you this morning about when how where should the sulfite be injected? Into the water. So it, the, I, I believe, if I remember correctly, this isn't my customer, but I remember correctly. I thought someone told me that th this just goes right in here and it runs right through that air column. So not to, you know, there could be a tube in there. Maybe they, they did this. They took the extra effort and they ran a tube all the way down into the water. Down into the water. That's fine. But something's leaking. Yeah, the leak is probably my first suspicion, since it it, it looks like a, a discombobulated haircut. And then they could, or there could, maybe this is, this is just recent, but there, if there was a tube in here, maybe that tube also failed inside there too. But it's not getting sulfite. So you, again, I think this is the thing, never hesitate to question everything. Can you go through a quill? This is a good question. So um, anybody know what a, an injection quill is? No? All right. So the question is, should it go through a quill? I would say probably, especially on a boiler system, because a quill will inject it further into the water you know, either whether it be two inches, six inches, or whatever the size of that injection is. Essentially, uh, I'm sorry, let me describe an injection. I don't think we have one here. It's like a big needle, all right? A big needle that goes into a pipe um, or it goes into a tank. And so what it does is instead of it coming right to the, instead of, instead of a, a coming right to the, the surface of whatever it's in, wherever we're injecting the chemistry, the idea is that it, it just puts it in further so that, it doesn't react with anything immediately. It helps prevent some immediate reactions that might happen if you just like put it here and then let it react. So it puts it in further into the water so it helps with reactions and mixing and stuff. So I would say yeah, it probably should. And those, this injection quill can have different types of lengths for that. So um, uh, um, it's a great question though, but yeah, probably should. So. <clears throat> Um, steam, condensate corrective actions. So most common problems we have with um, uh, steam condensate corrective or steam uh, condensate systems, um, high conductivity because it's kind of an indication of possibly poor, you know, poor condensate. Remember that description we had before about improving the quality of the condensate and maybe collecting more? Uh, high pH or even low pH, um, total hardness. Um, we had talked about that earlier with you and you know, monitoring it. Potentially, iron detection limits because uh, we, again with the steam line treatment and iron, if you're not maintaining your the proper pH of the condensate, it'll attack that that iron because the water doesn't have it, just the chemical doesn't have iron in it. The, the condensate return system's got the iron in it, and then also the other concern is cold condensate because we talked about the venting of of systems, and when the condensate condenses, it gets cold, and that sucks in the water. Um, Another reason for slightly, you know, other reasons for it is um, when we talked about this a little earlier was that you could have a heat exchanger where you're using steam on one side, heating a process or heating it, and then what happens is your seals start failing on your, on your, um, your uh, heat exchanger. So if these fail, depending on, you know, either A, it could be process contamination or B, if it's water to water or steam to water. Um, eventually something's going to give and it will likely contaminate the condensate system. So by monitoring the condensate system, they can tell you that if something else is contributing to the poor, to the poor condensate quality. So here's a, here's a graph over time um, that shows the total hardness over time over on this, on this axis and time on this axis of a um, of a deaerator. So this is almost plays right into what we're talking about with you. Um, I don't mean to pick on you, it just it's a great it was a great question and a great example. And here's the conductivity that over time uh, of of the deaerator. So what we have here is um, the hardness is going up over time, getting up to four, and then it drops off. And then here over time it starts up at 120 and over time it comes right down and then comes back up. Oh Sorry, so it's pointing at a couple of the inflection points. Here's what we found out it was. It was a, it was a heater, a domestic a heat exchanger, a heater out in the system that had copper on or I think, I think it was copper, I don't remember if it was copper or, or steel, 
But chlorine got aggressive on the water side of it, but it eventually led to the failure of it. So the hardness was leaking through, through, the, through the bundle onto the condensate. And also either one thing's gonna push it out, it's either gonna be the water pressure that's gonna push it out, or as that condensate, or that steam is condensing, it's gonna draw vacuum on those tubes and suck some of that water in. So, and then again, it wasn't the, chem the chemicals failure, it was the chlorine side or the water side that caused the failure, because that got corrosive. 110. Cheyenne? Any questions, guys? I noticed that when uh, our process one or process two hot water heat exchangers get a hold of it, mm -hmm. the conductivity of my boiler shoots up. Yep. So then it leads me right to those, and then I take the conductivity reading straight from the and I can tell which one is actually leaking by. Yeah, I, we have a customer that makes some, makes some stuff, and he can tell when an operator doesn't follow the right procedure because what happens is he get the, the plant isn't softened. The only softeners are in the boiler. And he gets hardness that comes back from his condensate system, and his conductivity shoots up to four, three, four hundred, which he normally doesn't see because, you know, again, monitoring to see what's going on, so then he can process it, and then he can process troubleshoot it, or um, you know, start looking into the reasons of what's going on. So, any other questions? You ready, bag? They're all ready to rock and roll. They got five hour in them. <laughs> So I'll Cheyenne, he'll give you a little 411 on him. Best thing about it, he's our Chicago rep. Yeah, don't come up here very often. No, welcome to Wisconsin. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. So I, I don't want much sports, so it's okay. I, 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 so it's okay. Uh, so I work down in Chicago. Um, I'm the local rep. Uh, I also have a background in water safety, so I used to work with a lot of hospitals prior to coming for water tech. I've been with water tech for about three years now. So my, I've been on ASHRAE committees. I'm actually on the new standard committee that they're coming out with, SPC 514. So you might see it in another two years or three years, whenever we feel like we want to get done. So you know how those things go. Mm -hmm. um, so anyways, let's start with the troubleshooting and corrective actions for cooling. Um, any of you guys run cooling towers here? You? Okay. All right, so maybe I'll pick on you a little bit more. <laughs> or less. Maybe I, I want the audience to learn, right? Okay. So um, this is, there's some common practices w that we employ when we are working with cooling towers. There's a lot of people that are collecting numbers like your conductivity, your hardness, your calcium hardness, and a couple of other things. But what does that all mean, right? So some genius out there came up with an index, which basically said, okay, if you are within this range, your water's balanced, okay? And these calculators are available online. You can Google RSI calculator or LSI calculator, and you can find one online. You basically put in all your parameters, and it'll give you balance, corrosive, or scaling. And that way you know if your system's working fine or not, right? So even if you don't remember anything I say today, you can say, okay, I have the numbers, what do I do? Go online, plug in my numbers, and find out if my water's balanced or not. Then you definitely know there's a problem or you need to make some adjustments. Um, these parameters are also widely accepted by CTI and ASHRAE. So they are industry standard. Most of the people look at them, and that's what they use. And use for fouling versus biocide rates. So if you... The, a lot of times, if you look, go out and look at your cooling tower and you say, okay, my tower's turning green, what is going on? So that's a visual problem. I need to change my biocide rates, right? And again, same organizations, they kind of have standards saying you need to feed X amount of time um, during the day or whatever, and it also is dependent on how, what kind of a water treatment program you're running. So you, how big of a tower are you guys running at your facility? <laughs> it's okay, no big deal. Are you guys testing for any sort of bacteria or? Yeah, we have chem suits. Oh, okay. But this, this tower I'm doing, I'm actually replacing it and I'm designing a new one. Okay. So that's why I'm here is I wanted to get a better background on how to design it properly and how the chemical is treating. Okay, properly. absolutely. So one of the biggest validation that I always tell people is your bacterial testing, right? So if you are testing for bacteria, that's the only way to know 
if you're actually clean or not. So doing that on the regular, like at WaterTech, we, we have a standard of doing it once a month, right? Whether it be running your dip slides or doing your Legionella testing, whatever it might be, that's your 100% validation that you're running your system accurately. And we'll get to it in a little bit as well. So um, when you do have, at least for us, uh, what we do is we'll give you a tower control chart which basically has all your ranges of hardness, free chlorine, cooling tower conductivity, and PTR, PTSA tracer. And basically what you, you want to do is run your tower within this parameter. If you are running the, your tower in, in these parameters, you're going to be in the balanced state, which is the RSI or the LSI, depending on which one you use, you are going to be in the balanced state, right? And based on these parameters, we will also have some corrective actions. So if you have high hardness coming in, does anyone want to guess what, what the issue might be? Okay. Yep, there you go. Ding, ding, ding. Okay. Um, if you have less or uh, if you have a uh, little free chlorine and the levels are out of range, see if the pump is primed, see if there's any other issues. And we're going to get into, we're going to dig deeper into a lot of these issues, but this is kind of like more of a generic issues of these are the things that could possibly go wrong or be wrong if you are out of range. Lower or higher, we can also determine. So when typically for most of our customers, we'll give you a online portal kind of like this. So you kind of take the guesswork out of um, doing any of the testing. So you fill out all these parameters and it will tell you whether you are in range or not. Okay, so if it turns green, you're good. If it's yellow, you're eh, okay. And if it's red, that means there's something wrong. You got to fi fix something, right? So it's as, as you populate these uh, columns, it'll give you an estimation. And I don't know if it has the RSI. Uh, it does not. But typically, when uh, it might be at the bottom. But typically, when you put in uh, on our system, what happens is once you populate all these numbers it'll automatically give you an RSI or an LSI reading, which will tell you, okay, balanced, not balanced, whatever the case might be. Because it does happen sometimes, you could be out of range and still be balanced, and that's not abnormal. It could happen. So, so corrective action. Most common problems that occur um, are conductivity out of range, which means you're either not blowing down your tower, likely, inhibitors out of range, which means you're not feeding enough inhibitor or it's, you know, uh, there's no chemical in the tanks or a bunch of other reasons. Uh, microbiological activity, so um, you're underfeeding or maybe there's other problems that you might need to look into the system. Sediment and algae growth, notice in the tower, which is again, what is a cooling tower, right? It's a giant air scrubber. So it is completely normal to see dirt and debris in the tower, but it is just how you manage it, right? Um, I know Jeff Bodendorfer talked about size stream filtration and which ones you could be using, which ones are better. So I'm not gonna get into that, but those are some of the things that you could possibly look at. And automation issues, which is again, very common. Um, when you have a bunch of sensors, sensors could get faulty, sensors could give you bad data. So it's just how you diagnose those problems. <clears throat> so on your regular service, Day, you're taking numbers and you see that your bacterial dip slide is higher. Now, what you do is you start looking and saying, okay, I went through this water tech training and I found I know that I need to start looking at it systematically and do a root cause analysis, right? So you check the conductivity level. Conductivity level is fine. Check sediment, build it up in the tower. So you actually have to go up to the roof and look in the basin and see if there's a lot of dirt in the tower. Um, and you check your biocide pumps are prime, which means if you're actually pumping chemical into your system, check for chemical tanks, see if there's actually chemical in the tank and that is being transferred into the system. If there's no chemistry, you're not feeding anything. Turn up the feed rate, test for proper biocide residual, and retest bacterial levels in one week. So it's very important, and we'll get to it with the chlorine degradation in time, but what happens is some chemicals lose their strength over time. So you might have to feed 2x as much in order to get the same effect. So just some of the things to keep in mind when working with different systems. So result, we did go up, we checked the tower and the tower had a lot of dirt like this at the bottom which could not be cleaned with chemicals. So you have to drain down the system, power wash it or however you guys wanna do it, 
clean it out and chlorine was also being underfed, right? So you clean out the tower and you start feeding in your chlorine at the prescribed level. You test for biocide residual after the event to make sure that it is in fact what it should be at the prescribed level by CTI or ASHRAE. And then you retest bacteria levels after one week because that is the ultimate validation of a successful water treatment program. So here's another problem that happened to one of our customers. So this is um, the PTSA reading should be, depending on this chemistry, I think we, the set point should be around 150 parts per billion, but it was reading at 80. After numerous um, uh, calibrations, it would stay at 80, right? So it was a bad sensor, we changed it out, and we went back up to 140. That's where the system should be feeding. And now what happens is three hours later, we get a flat line. So can you guess what the problem could be? Any thoughts? If you don't have anything to give. No? Okay. No, so we calibrated, right? So as soon as we got the system, because that's the first thing you do, as soon as you put in a new uh, sensor, you calibrate it and make sure that it's reading correctly because you always check handhelds, right? So this is what happened. So we had the operator go down there and make sure the pump was feeding and everything was correct, right? So we checked the wiring, the wiring was fine, the chemi there was chemical in the system, we checked it with our handheld and there was actually readings in the system. There was actually water flowing through the system because that's another issue that could happen, right? And faulty sensor out of the box. So it was a bad sensor and we were able to validate that based on multiple sensor readings. Okay, this is what it looks like new. This was I think the one we took out and that's how it looked. So you see the difference? <laughs> so we changed the sensor, you know, nothing that had to be fixed right away, but what we ended up doing was we started feeding. We can feed, let's say, for something like this. What you can do is say, okay, I can manually feed my system for an hour and see if my reading is still flatline, right? You can check the relay. If the relay turned on, and, and we don't have level sensor on this graph, but you can actually see if the level of the chemical is going down. If the level of the chemical is go going down, you can say, okay, chemistry is going out of the tank. Now, I don't know if it's going in the system or just falling out, but it's happening. So at that point, you bring in the operator and you say, okay, can you check what's going on? Make sure you look at the wiring, chemicals in the system, flow is going through, the chemical is actually making into the system it's a faulty sensor, so you get that replaced again. Okay, see this is some similar problem. You have your Envirodose level going at 150 and, and they start to drop off, right? So again, could be a similar problem. And it's very important because once you, you start to see, let's say your set point is set at, okay, if the level falls below 140 or let's say 130, send me an alarm and you can get an alarm on your phone or your email to kind of see what's going on. It was a bad diaphragm and it was leaking out of the weep. So typically how these systems are designed is there's a weep right here and if there is a chemical leak, it starts dripping over here. So there's typically on our tanks, there's an area where if, again, not a lot of leak, but if it's a small leak, it can be contained right in that spot. So it's in my career, it hasn't happened yet, but provided I've only been in industrial water treatment for seven, eight years, but um, to other people it has had happened. So you gotta change the pump and put a new pump that can actually get the chemistries in. So this is a healthy graph of ORP versus 5213, which is your chlorine. Uh, does anyone know what ORP is or it stands for? No? Guesses? Come on, guys. O oxygen reduction potential. So in this graph, you have two readings. So you have gallons, which is your sensor. It tells you how many gallons are in the tank. And this is your, uh, the red one is your ORP. So you'll see as the chemistry goes down, when there's a feeding event, when you feed chemistry, your level in the tank is going to go down, but your ORP is going to rise. That means chemical came into the system and the ORP is going to pick it up. 
And that's going to happen every time there's a feeding event, right? So you're going to see a spike in ORP every time this graph goes down. So you know that they're working in conjunction, everything's fine, nothing to worry about. So we were running low on our chemicals. So you see this is the 20 gallon mark. Or we were actually below that. We came in, we feed the system, and we had a feeding event. The ORP spiked a little bit after. We had another feeding event, just a little dip right here, and then the ORP flatlined, right? You call the operator or whoever and you say, okay, um, go down to the system, take a look at the pump, see if there's chemicals in the tank, see what's going on. It was another bad diaphragm. So we replaced the diaphragm, got the pump run running again, and we'll get the ORP back up. So, and flip scenario, right? You have your ORP spikes in the blue, and your red is your uh, 5213, which is chlorine that we're feeding. You have your spikes coming in every time you feed, and something goes wrong right here. What do you think happened? We are going to go through some of these exercises after this, but just, just out of curiosity, I like to keep people engaged, right? I don't want to say another bad diaphragm. No, this is, this is <laughs> nothing to do with... I don't want to say that. So see, that, that would be too easy, three <laughs> yeah. times. So typically what happens is um, over time, chlorine <clears throat> loses its strength, right? So even if you're... Your feed is constant, right? Let's say you're feeding once a day, twice a day, whatever your feed might be set at, right? Feeding the same, when you got a new delivery, that's when you, that's when you saw this happen. You got this new delivery right here, and this chemical was 100% strength. It hadn't lost any of its strength, right? And you were seeing over here that your chemical was almost done. You are going to see a higher ORP spike with a new, I shouldn't say new, um, when you start off with a fresh dose of chemical, a new shipment that came in and you just open it up and plug it into the system, you're going to see a higher ORP spike in your system because of that reason, because it's still full strength. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. There's a graph that talks about how it degrades over time. So over here, the situation was that there was a pump, this pump. Uh, the diaphragm had to be changed, we changed it, and while doing that, um, a piece of metal screw fell into the tank, right? Now you're not going to put your hand in a drum full of chlorine, right? Everyone knows that, right? Not normally. Okay, okay, no, okay, don't fish it out. I didn't say that though. Um, so you're not going to fish it out. The gentleman or whoever it was just left the chlorine and the screw in there. And what happens is it starts oxidizing. It starts reacting with the chlorine, right? So we actually went through three drums of chlorine because every time it would lose strength and lose strength very quickly. Because of the metal screw. So we emptied out the tank. We rinsed it out. And still we had the same problem. The problem only went away once we replaced the tank all together. So just that little piece of screw, so I think this is after they rinsed it and you can see this black layer right here, which is the iron. Oh, screw. Yeah, it was a screw. So those little pieces can be important. So we changed the tank, and everything was back to normal after going through three, three tanks of chlorine. So now you know. Don't throw your screws in the tank. <laughs> and don't fish them out either. So this is what happens. This is on, this is on a textbook level, what happen, how your chlorine degrades over time. So when you have fresh delivery, that's why you were seeing a higher spike when you were feeding chlorine. And as you go over time, you're going to see less and less strength. And how we overcome that is if you have all the sensors that you know, typically should be in a cooling tower system, you can set an ORP limit to say, okay, you're gonna only spike to let's say 400 or 450 or whatever the case might be. And it could vary because ORP readings, system to system might be cons in inconsistent. So, and this is for storage life with, with regards to temperature. So the lower the temperature, the longer the shelf life, the hotter the temperature, 
the shorter it is. So again, this is a no-brainer, lower no chemical in the tank. Obviously, you've got to call WaterTech to come in and replace your chemicals um, and fill it back up so you can start feeding again. So it's important that there's many, many different controllers out there. Uh, the, these are the ones that are in generally the ones that we use mostly and the one that is on the shelf. So you always want to make sure when you take a look at the controller once a day, once a week, whenever it might be, if you don't have remote monitoring set up, that there's no alarms. So you might see a low alarm show up and that, that should prompt you to go into the system and take a look what is causing my alarm. Is it a high conductivity? You see over here, this is, it's showing zero. So it's possible that this might be because there's zero conductivity showing, right? But it could be a whole bunch of reasons. But if it shows alarm, you definitely want to go in, check it. If, if, it's a, if it's an error, clear it and see if it comes back. If it comes back, then you need to investigate and see if, if that's an issue. Cleaning sensors. So typically, when we or I go for our monthly service, We'll go in and we'll t take these sensors out and see what, look, what they look like, right? So this graphite tip conductivity sensor is pretty robust. You can clean it with a rag, you can clean it with a, I don't know, a rubber brush, whatever you feel like, right? So this is pretty robust, it won't go bad. This on the other hand, this is an ORP sensor, this is a little bit more delicate. You might want to clean it up with a cleaner or if you don't have a solution, just a mild grade acid, you can clean it up and one note of caution here, if you do put the system back up into the system, your readings might be off for a little bit, right? Because it takes time for this sensor to get cleaned up and back to where it was reading. So just be careful when you do clean the system up, make sure you rinse it with enough water to make sure that there's no residual cleaner left on it. And if there is, just know that you might see some readings that are a little bit off than normal. Flow meters. So typically when we have panels like this, um, what recently what we've done is we've changed this, um, I don't know, old school flow meter to a more electronic one, right? So we can tell from our system electronically if there, there's a drop in the reading. And this happened to me more recently where I started to see my level. So it was kind of similar to this where I'm re running right around seven gallons per minute. And in a matter of two, three weeks, I saw it down to like two gallons a minute, right? What could be the likely culprit? a plug strainer. This one doesn't have a strainer, but mine did. So it was choking the flow through the panel. So what do you do when you see something like this? Just leave it in and walk away, hoping someone would fix it? No? There are some people, yes. OK. <laughs> so you clean this back up, you put it back in the system, and you see if your flow comes back up. And that's it. Just simple, just simple logical problems, root cause analysis that can just really make your life easier and make sure you have a well, properly maintained system. And I think that's it for my section. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any questions? The good news is on those controllers like that, where I work at, we actually have a visual, uh, I guess, a strainer. Okay. To see, like, filling up and getting the actually dirty, because then you kind of, like, all right, I think I'm due for cleaning now. I don't think I'm due for cleaning tomorrow, however it may be. Yes, it, it, it ha on mine, uh, I have a different style too. You can actually see the debris caking it up. So every time I go, I'll just be like, you know, I just need to get a habit to shut off the, uh, you know, the line, I drain it out, clean out the strainers, and it's good. You know, it just tells me that I might, the area that I'm in, it's in downtown Chicago, it's 50 stories up and we get a lot of debris. So a side stream filter on the tower might be very helpful to control your biological, keep the system clean, and a whole bunch of other benefits. So it's just looking at these problems and saying, okay, how can I make my system better? So anyways, good point. Thank you guys. All right, guys. The next section we're gonna go through is troubleshooting and corrective actions, and we have some handouts. Um, for those of you who might be watching remotely, um, you obviously won't get the handout, but there are going to be slides that have the same um, picture on it. So what I'll do is I'll hand these all out, and then we'll go through the examples together. So you'll need one. So we should have done this ahead of time if we were smart. And we're going to be starting with the...
cooling ones first. So they should be labeled uh, boiler and cooling exercises. Okay, you're welcome. You know what, why don't we do this? If you just start taking it and pass it around. Take one from each folder, that'll be great. All right, bear with us, everyone who's remote. We're just passing out the papers. And are we doing good as far as everyone's good? Doesn't need a break. You want to keep pushing on and you know look to get done maybe earlier than instead of later. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Pressure's on. You don't want to be the you don't want to be the the kink in the hose here. You know. Okay, so the first one we'll be going through when you get them, guys, is um, tower exercise problems. So it should look like the sheet like this where it says tower number two and number three, uh, and you'll see that the molybdenum is what's circled on that sheet. Okay, and so what I want you guys to do is uh, take some time to yourself or you can talk to your neighbor if you want, and again, maybe why do you think the molybdenum in, in tower number three in this case is reading low, right? versus everything else. And so here's some of the things that you've already done, right? You've checked all these things. Um, and so what do you think is maybe going on? And I'll give you about uh, 30 seconds to think about that and then you know, see if someone has a solution. What do you think would be the corrective action to fix this problem is what we're looking for. So you see your conductivities are for the most part pretty good, right? Tower two, it's in range. Tower three, it's a little high. Your hardnesses are, are good in the system. Your chlorine looks fine. Your bacteria counts are fine. So does anyone have an idea what do they think would be the corrective action for fixing this low molybdenum reading in tower number three? And maybe we'll start with this, because I don't know if it was covered today. All right, when we're running a system, we normally use connectivity as kind of our, our key set point. So if our connectivity is in range in a system that we're controlling via some type of controller, Right? In theory, everything else should be dialed in because as we increase that connectivity, reading should go up with connectivity. As we decrease our connectivity, reading should go down, right? Though, so your molybdenum, your hardness, your chlorine, everything should kind of cycle up and cycle down along with that connectivity. So if you're looking at this and you see, well, my connectivity is actually a little bit on the high side, so shouldn't my molybdenum in theory be maybe a little bit on the high side, right? Maybe one point two, three, 1.5 instead of 0.4. So in this case, you know, again, what do you think would be uh, the potential solution? Do you think it's a matter of your connectivity is too low in that system? And so, well, everything is going to be low. No, because it's actually a little bit on the high side, right? Not that that's super alarming, but it, it shouldn't be low, right? So what do you think? It, fairly simple. Don't overcomplicate it. What would you probably look at doing? Okay, and so ding, 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 your winner, turn up the feed rate on your pump, right? So if your connectivity would have been low, let's say your connectivity was 500, then I would say, well, I expect that to be low because connectivity was low, right? Just like I would expect the total hardness to be low. Um, and so, yeah, something that simple, right? Okay, next uh, tower exercise problem. So it looks like this is what a status report would look like and an alarm report would look like from an e-controller uh, out in the field. So you can see, again, here we're looking at our connectivity reading is high. We know it's high because our set point here says it's 950, um, but yet it's reading 1485. And so what do you think would be maybe a corrective action here? Now this one's gonna take a little bit more, maybe intuitive digging, right? So look, I'll give you hints. Look all around on it. So look down at the bottom, you can see how much makeup the tower has gone through, how much bleed, is the tower even on? Uh, I'll tell you when it says close, that means the tower's on. Um, so kind of look at everything. So what do we think would maybe cause high conductivity? 
in a system. How do we control conductivity in a system? There's only one way. By bleeding it, right? Okay, so if your conductivity goes high, whether it's a boiler or a cooling tower, this is a cooling tower, but whether it's one or the other, right, it would tell you that you're not bleeding enough, right? Because that's the only way we control our conductivity. We put high conductivity water down the drain, we add in lower uh, concentrated or lower conductivity water to dilute that down, right? You can also see in the middle of your section here, you can see all your outputs. So relay four says bleed valve. It says it's been on for 39 minutes now, 40 minutes straight, right? So what do you think maybe is the culprit? The valve failed. Actuator, Actuator failed. Actuator failed, valve failed. That's all very good, right? And so I would maybe say, I would, if it was me reaching out to a customer, I would say that's something that I would look to check. And so the solution actually was their Blemo valve would only open up uh, part way. So the actuator had gone bad and it wasn't opening wide enough and bleeding the system quick enough to keep up with the demand that day, right? So some of those things that you look at, uh, like it said here, run a graph on bleed versus makeup meter. You don't even have to run a graph. If we're normally running three to five cycles in a cooling tower, that's typically where you're at. You're gonna be three to five, somewhere in there, maybe six cycles. Um, and you see 32,000 gallons of makeup and only 500 gallons of bleed, that's, those are really high cycles, right? Um, and so right away, that's a great indicator of something's not right, we're not getting enough water down the drain. So good job, you guys did really good on those. Okay, next one, we have boiler. Um, so it's gonna look like uh, this one has boiler one, two, deaerator, and condensate, and you'll see that the, uh, we, we see a lot of red on this one. All right, so first off, you might be thinking, holy smokes, what's going on with this system? I can speak more intelligently into why we see such a big discrepancy between the two boilers, but we're gonna focus specifically on the deaerator and the condensate, right? So you have your deaerator pH and your condensate pH are both low. It's supposed to be mid eights uh, to, to mid nines in the deaerator and then you know 8.3 to 8.8 .8 in your condensate. All right, so what do you think these are the things, you have low pH. So these are some of the things that you can look at checking, right? Your makeup water quality, did that significantly change? Are you running an RO program and the RO, something went haywire with it and now you're no longer getting RO water? Um, did the condensate return water quality change? So now instead of getting really pure condensate back, are you getting some type of city water contamination um, in that system, some type of process contamination? And then uh, you know, look at checking your chemical feed levels. So does anyone have an idea here and maybe what our corrective action would be as far as altering that pH um, in the system? In a boiler system, you're gonna feed an internal treatment like a polymer for scale control. You're gonna feed an oxygen scavenger for oxygen control to prevent corrosion. And you're gonna feed a steam line treatment that goes out with the steam and then gets returned via what back to the boiler? What system? Condensate, right. So out of those three chemistries, which one do you think is uh, affecting or impacting your condensate? Steam line treatment, which would then in turn affect your deaerator because you're returning that condensate back into it, right? So while we don't feed it directly for deaerator or feed water control, it plays an impact on it because if the condensate's not good coming back, it's gonna impact your uh, deaerator or your feed water going into your boiler. So what do you think would be an adjustment here? Again, connectivities look good how they normally are. You know, your alkalinities look good for the most part. Um, hardness is fine, iron's not high. The deaerator looks like, you know, for the most part, the temp and the pressure are, are correlating kind of where they should be, a little, little skewed. What do you think would be something that we would maybe look at doing here to correct that? Again, go to the most simple answer. Water. Say that again? Return water quality. Yep. So what would we do to impact that? How would we how would we edit or adjust that pH? What are we feeding again? Right? So we're feeding a chemistry. Sure. Yep. Make sure, everything's balanced. sure, maybe it's thirty five sixteen that we're feeding, right? Or thirty five oh eight or thirty five twenty or if you're using one of our chemistries, right? So you probably look at turning up that pump, right? And so uh, again, the pump loss prime. Now we're going to have a video here that, oh, I take that back. That's coming up in a couple slides. I don't know why I did that. So we always want to adjust our, our uh, condensate 
prompt before our, it would be our 37, 31, excuse me, right? Sure. So the question was, should we adjust our condensate pump or our steam line treatment pump versus our caustic pump? So if you're running an RO program, you're feeding caustic as well into your feed water to boost that pH and alkalinity in the system because the RO has stripped all that out. The answer to that would be only if your pH in your condensate is effective. If, you're, if your pH here in the condensate was 8.5, but yet your pH here was still 6.2, then you would be looking at the caustic, right? Because your condensate's good. Um, so again, in this case, the pump had lost prime. So maybe you ran out of chemical. Always check, obviously, if the drum or the tank is empty. Uh, or again, if the pump lost prime, you're just not getting it fed in. Um, and again, we always look to first default to, well, what's my conductivities? If those are in range, everything else should be in range if the system's dialed in, unless we typically lose prime or we run out of chemistry, something like that, right? And so when you see that those are good, it's not like they went sky high uh, in your condensate to know that maybe process contamination is the cause, then you kind of know where to look, right? Okay, it's probably my pump. Okay, so now here's where we have uh, a uh, short video again, just looking at, okay, you, I'll ask you guys to tell me which pump is primed versus not primed after we watch the videos, okay? So it's the video on the left.
pointers are not, set points are not wrong. So, if connectivity is in range, it should be in range, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not in range. So do we think that's because we're overfeeding, underfeeding, feeding the right amount? I think we might have to look at the duration of the pump. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so yes, I would say uh, in this one, right, again, you know, you're, you're high here. Uh, in boiler six, your connectivity is really low, yet your polymer is in range, mm -hmm. right? And so we're feeding the right amount of polymer here based upon this reading, but if this 687 here was actually 2,500, it would also be high, right? Mm -hmm. So it means we're overfeeding chemistry in this instance. Now, this is a tricky account in that they have six boilers, they don't need all six boilers at all times. We always have boilers that are out of range, so we have to overfeed chemistries to try to protect the boiler that's not running. So it's a challenge in and of itself in that way, um, but we are overfeeding our polymer in this case, and you can confirm that with boiler four, or also if you look at boiler six, and, well, gosh, if my connectivity is that low, right, it's, it's less than half of what it should be. I should be less, of, less than half of what I should be on my polymer, right? Same thing with uh, our sulfite. So you can see here, look how big our range is. We normally never run 30 to 100, maybe 30 to 60. But here we have to feed 90 to 100 ppm of sulfide into the lead boiler to make sure we get, try to get on the low end in that lag boiler, that standby boiler, especially in the summertime when they really don't have that much of a heat demand. All right, so that's kind of what we talked about. And then again, this you wouldn't know, but water loss, is that why? So that would be one of the things that I would check, right? Why is that boiler so low? Are we losing water uncontrolled? Now, we're not, right? I'm telling you that because they have boilers that rotate, that boiler is not running at all. And so it's just, it's, it's going to always be low. And then the next week when that one now becomes a lead and this one becomes a lag, you're going to see them flip-flop. So. Okay. Not related. So the key point here is the connectivity uh, in boiler 6 being low is not related at all to the total polymer being high in boiler four, right? So each boiler is its own separate thing. And this one's saying, okay, the low connectivity is due to water loss. It very well could be. In this case, it's this boiler is just not running, so. Okay, and now with that, we'll move over to boiler startup. So let me grab Tom and uh, we'll go from there. So why, why I tracked down Tom real quick, if you guys want to stand up and stretch maybe for a minute or two, um, I'll be right back.
in your head about your boilers. That's the best way to look at this whole thing. All right. Um, because re reassociate yourself what's going on. We told you about where, where your, your control parameters probably came from or where you might not even remember. Or you're a new guy and the guy with 30 years just left and now you're the new guy and you got a year left but the, the guy that was there for 30 years didn't teach you anything or barely anything. So it's a good time to relearn everything, right? So just reacquaint yourself. You probably have that boiler control chart. You saw it before that we were talking about. Reacquaint yourself with what the chemistry does. 3069, what's my 3462 do? What's my 3540 do? What's my 37 do? 3730 do? Just to reassociate re yourself what's going on. What did I miss? Or, or you know what, maybe you thought something differently um, because there's a lot of numbers, right? 3459, and, and water treaters, we all got wonderful ideas about how to name a chemical. So, you know what I mean? It's a great way to, to reestablish and re reconnect with what, what, what was going on with that. So look at your control boiler chart. Control data sheet. I guess it's not only a great time to, to look at it, but maybe make the changes. Maybe you change out a chemical last year. Maybe you change a control range because something happened, right? The same with your boiler log chart, your boiler log sheet. Maybe you got rid of a boiler. Maybe you got, maybe you added a boiler. Maybe you got rid of the RO. Maybe you improved something too, right? So this is the beginning of the season, or, ever, or at least once a year, reevaluate all this stuff just to make sure it, it, it works for you. Um, I had a customer one time, they went from testing um, twice a shift, three shifts a day, seven days a week. Well, now they're down to two operators, they test once a shift, and they do testing every other day on every other boiler system because they have two separate boiler water systems. It was a lot easier to do it when, when they had almost like 12 people during the course of a week to watch your boilers. Now there's only two of them, right? So you're gonna make some adjustments. You know what, things are changing these days, not just because of COVID, but doing more with less with everybody, right? Or maybe you installed new control automation and level sensors or something, right? Maybe more valuable to add chemical levels on here and monitor chemical inventory, right? So just take the time once a year to redo, redo this. Look at your chemical pumps um, your, in your chemical inventory. Because if you're starting up the system, you may have the right inventory, you may not have the right inventory. Quick rule of thumb is the shelf life of the chemical is about a year. Not necessarily. It does technically start dropping off as soon as it's pumped. But normally about a year, you know, you want to make sure you're using it up. So if you got a little inventory up, maybe use up that inventory first before you pump on top of that old chemi chemistry or find out how you're doing it. This is our Freedom Plus, Plus program where we deliver the chemicals, then we haul the, uh, um, the, the barrels off. But you know what, whoops. But you know, again, chemical labeling, we all went through that. Remember when everything was MSDS sheets, now they're SDS sheets? It's a great time to get these things updated too, right? To be in compliance. Labeling, labeling tubing, checking pumps, running pumps. If these are put away right in the off season, um, there might be water in here, well, the pump should probably be primed. Even if the system is always running for a process, just checking it once a year to make sure things are good is a good, is a good way to pre prevent a, a, ma a major problem going down the road. Replacing the tubing in the tubes once a year on the suction side, discharge side, the pressure relief side, should be taken care of, all right? Test station, isn't that beautiful? Whose looks like that? Yeah, isn't that great? So, but you know, you know, at the same time, you know, I, I, it's, I tell my kids all, you know, practice what you preach, take pride in what you do. So, you know, a nice clean station, maybe getting it straight and organized, updated, you know what I mean? Titrations, you know, making sure the reagents are all ready to go. They do expire. Um, and again, not just if it's a seasonal boiler system, but if it's a regular operating process production boiler system, just making sure you're ready to rock and roll you know, once a year and check things out. I mean, obviously if it's on a regular basis, um, it's probably maybe a little bit better maintained. But again, just to restart over and, and start over again, just to reevaluate to make sure things are good, right? Because you see the same thing over and over again, not intended, but sometimes you get complacent about what, what it is that you're always looking at. Uh, shutoffs, boilers, um, um, making sure that everything is, is ready to go. If it was a boiler startup, yeah, you know what, you want to make sure everything is closed. Um, in the beginning, you probably want to start checking some of your shutoffs or your, your low water, high water, um, any of your alarms and other cutoffs that you have. Obviously, because you don't want to launch a boiler or turn one red into a bomb. Even though on a normal boiler it's operating all the time, yeah, you're checking these on a regular basis. But um, the other thing to do with this is also, we were talking about your electronic 
sensors, you know what I mean? Sometimes maybe if you had problems, maybe that read that just that re reviewing it once here makes you realize I don't like the electronic ones. I still want the old school foot ones. Change the technology out. Or you know I mean, not saying it's good or bad, but maybe something that isn't working when you look at something once a year. I didn't like that. Let's switch it out from that standpoint. Um, so here's a little, but this is the one little disclosure is that none of us are, none of us here at WaterTech are, well, I shouldn't say none. We're not regular boiler operators and we're not state licensed and stuff of that sort. I think there's a couple guys are, okay, but most of us aren't, aren't. So really, but getting some things checked on your boiler, you should do regardless with a licensed technician, with a licensed person from the state. Not just your annual boiler inspection, but if there's something else that gets done or needs to be welding or something needs to be worked on it, make sure that you're doing those some by someone that's licensed or is certified to work on a boiler like that, okay? Um, there's, I think we have one pipe fitter in there, and that's Dave, um, who does our installs, but he doesn't work on steam systems or boilers either. So just, you know, visually make sure that you're actually honest. At the end of the day, get someone that's, it, I'm a lie, it's more competent than I am to work on a boiler. I know enough to be dangerous and I can get my way around the boiler room, but I don't know that I would feel comfortable operating a boiler completely day in, day out, 365 days a year, okay? Um, re, re, so we, we talked about the test station and the reagents, but the other one would be checking and reminding yourself of how to do the tests themselves again, all right? Um, Maybe a reagent changed out. Maybe someone changed out a test, a way to do a test. Maybe you change out a chemical and that chemical requires a different type of test. Get familiar again with doing the tests the right way, okay? Um, if you consistently do them the wrong way, at least do it the wrong way during the rest of the season so everything looks right or you think it looks right. But really, if you re-look re re at the instructions, or am I doing a test right? Am I using a 40 mil sample, not a 20 mil sample? Or am I supposed to be using a 20 mil sample, not a 40 mil sample? You know what I mean? Is that multiplier on that one test 10? Is it 25? Is it 50? Is it zero? Is it, is it one at zero? Is it one? So just to make sure you're doing the t your test right, okay? Um, sounds like common sense, but until you actually hear it, I mean, does it really then does it seem to make does it really seem to set in sometimes or even if you're supervising someone that you know ask your guys just to go over it again to make sure all right Oop, wrong way um, <clears throat> operating it so these valves haven't been operated in year in, in a, maybe a few months or if they're operating on a regular basis um, uh, you know there's there's uh, there's seals inside of these things um, there's electrical in here um, just operating this stuff to make sure it all works right. Because on, on a system that's been sitting idle, um, it, it's just been doing it. It hasn't been doing anything. The power's been shut off to these things. Make sure that everything operates and works properly. A boiler is made to run. It's made to be used. It's not, a, not to be abused, but it's made to be used. So um, opening it up, making sure the valves run, the manual valves run, bypasses operate. Because the worst thing you're gonna do is be in a situation where you can't, you can't change this valve out and these these bypasses don't work. Now you gotta shut down the whole boiler system. Where are you gonna find time to shut down the whole boiler system because I, because I didn't maybe check these bypasses, because this stupid valve failed. Okay, it's electromechanical device. Things are gonna fail in time, right? At some point they will fail. Softeners. How important is a pretreatment system in a boiler? Extremely, important. yes, very important. So, the boiler's important too, I give you that much, okay? But I think I beat this to death with you guys right now, is the pretreatment. So if, if you're starting up a system and it hasn't ran in a while, these things should be exercised two or three times each, each, uh, each softener so that they get back in sync and that they get reused and then the resin bed gets reconditioned and prepared to work on a regular basis. There's probably been very little salt in here these things probably haven't had much water or run through it. I think Jeff talked about, you know, channeling proper design of a boy, of a softener system. These things have been, haven't been operating properly. There's been no, little to no flow running through them. All right, um, channeling is occurring. The bed, the resin in there is not seated right at all the time. So you want to make sure you, you fluff it up a couple times, recondition that recondition that resin with the salt. Now, does anybody have a dealkalizer? No, we already got softener. Right? So the, do the same thing if you had a dealkalizer, um, which they look they look identical, just about identical. Um, 
a few things are different, but you want to operate that pretreatment system. But the same thing being checking salt levels, making sure this isn't bridged over, because it will bridge. If it doesn't, you, if it doesn't run, if it hasn't been running water in a while, it's going to bridge over. It might dissolve, it might not, or not, you might be out of salt, so put salt in it. Okay? There's also by exercising the entire system and running this through regenerations, running this through regenerations, um, with this all operating right, then this also lets what's in here in your, in your brine tank, then you know that, that that's all right. There's a lot of tubing between your brine tank and your softener that knowing that if your system's regenerating and, re, and re, um, regenerating like it should, you can rest assured that it, at least at, and from, the, from a, a, a few thousand foot elevation that, that, yeah, you know what, the tubing between the two are, is, must be in pretty good shape and I, I, could be, I should be okay, all right? You know, making sure your meters are reading right. So sometimes what happens is, whoops, I had a customer that they always re recorded this number. They never recorded the multiplier. One time I said, how, how, how'd you only go through a, one gallon of water? And he goes, that's what the meter said. <laughs> I don't understand. So I went over, I looked at the meter and I said, you gotta remember this. It's fine if you, don't, it's fine if you forget about recording this. But just remember that somewhere in your notes, you want to make sure that there is a multiplier of 100 on it, okay? You can multiply your 10, a multiplier of 1,000, or there may not be no multiplier on it. It might be just one. So it's a good time to record, uh, record the, the meters, though, because at least then you can get a, possibly an operating trend from year to year of what your, what your steam production is. Um, knowing what your makeup is, you can back calculate into a steam production number. Or if you have a, make, or if you have a feed water numbers or feed water meters, uh, recording those numbers so then you could actually then calculate a steam production number. Ah, I can't hit the right button. Uh, there is a boiler water startup checklist. Oh, I'm sorry, what's this? Yeah, checklist. The first thing says layup. Jeff didn't hand these out, did he? No. So, um, Bill. All right. Thanks. So we got we got these checklists. We actually get we got we also got layups too. We also got layups and stuff like that also um, for cooling towers and even startup of cooling towers. But you know these are some things that we can to consider during your during the layup um, of it. They're also available on our website. I think it also comes with other stuff that you you can get electronically from us. But um, this kind of highlights the stuff that we were whoops, that we were talking about before. Review the SDS sheets, you know, safety. Never can have enough, right? Um, you know, and a lot of those chemicals, the chemicals too, they're, they're also hazardous when you look at them. Not that, you know, yes, if you read them, they'll look like they'll kill everything, but you know what I mean? The thing is that you want to, if the safety being concerned with your employees or operators doesn't hurt to review those. So a lot of the stuff is that we've been talking about with operator training, reviewing proper methods. Um, this is kind of what we've been kind of outlined. Um, uh, with what, what we've been talking about. Sorry, checking your low water cutoffs, your blowdown valves, before the manufacturer's recommendations on any of that stuff above. Water treatment, ensure the chemical pumps are running, controllers are operating, um, ensuring that um, people are properly trained in the test methods. Um, so um, check your pretreatment system, softeners, the alkylators, ROs, fill the boiler with pretreated water, and then the, the shock and feed of the uh, mini chemistries. That's, uh, that could possibly be done if you want to get ahead of it, because you got to remember, at one point you're going to start feeding with pretty much cold water period so there may be a benefit of, of shocking it with like an oxygen scavenger just because it's going to um there's going to be a lot of oxygen in that system until you can operate the deaerator until you can operate the feed water tank to drive off of some of that oh, i can't get that right any questions on the startups and stuff of that sort no we're good all right uh we look for Kyle. Is that him? No. no. Oh, hey, buddy. So we're back to the towers. 
Um, it's going to be a lot of pictures, not a lot of text, so I'm just going to kind of run through. If anybody has any questions about what things are, feel free to stop me. Um, I don't know, just get rolling. Conductivity handheld um, for, for shutdown. So this is all related to cooling tower layup and shutdown. We want to make sure that your conductivity is dropped. Lower your set point on your bleed to try to get rid of some of the excess uh, suspended solids. So that's what we recommend right away when you're doing cleanings, whether you shock by side, you want to drop that conductivity set, set point about in half. You're not cycling up as much as you normally would, so it's not like you're going to be dumping water down the drain. But what you want to do is get as many solids out to make it as effective a biocidal treatment as you can get. Um, as you can see here, this is a very good looking account. Um, they don't all look like this, obviously. This is definitely not a food plant for those of you who work in food plants. Um, but we want to keep things as clean and as safe as possible. So our drivers are trained, obviously, to make sure that there's no chemical spillage. They clean up after themselves around the tank. That part, no problem. But as you know, with pumps and um, injection quills, that you can just have a mess of chemical, like that just happens super easy. So part of shutdown is making sure that your injection points are cleaned, your pumps are cleaned. A lot of times we have them run for HVAC cooling specifically, so like hospitals um, or commercial office buildings just like this, you want to flush out these chemical pumps. There's also probes. There might be a, a zoomed in version of this later, I'm pretty sure, that we want to make sure that these probes are cleaned. A lot of times the ORP probes are pretty cheap. They only last a year or two. We like to make sure those are kept in water. So it's just making sure that you're, you're, you're uh, the system itself is clean because once you once you're done you're gonna forget about it until startup next year the distribution deck so a lot of times when the towers are running this just gets completely ignored what you want to do is make sure that your flows are good so these nozzles control flow which really improve the heat transfer and the overall health of the system. So pulling out these little pieces of chip scale are super important. Make sure that there's not a ton of blockage in these distribution nozzles. And an even distribution for cooling towers is super important. Again, more chip scale. This is stuff you wanna vacuum out, sweep out at the end of the year. Again, making sure that these, it's a better view here, making sure those are clean. You can put your finger in there um, and feel that there's nothing in there. Getting rid of this stuff will help you because when you push play on that thing in March, you're going to get a big slug of all that stuff. So you're going to want to clean this out, especially if you don't have filtration. Same thing here. So this is the basin of the tower itself. Obviously, you have the fill. Make sure that you vacuum this all out. You will notice once in a while on these baffles or the actual structure, you can get some algae. What we recommend in the winter, usually it'll go away just with sheer temperature, but spraying that with a bleach solution, getting rid of that stuff is um, critical. Some people complain that it looks bad. It doesn't really have any impact on the heat transfer, but um, from a look standpoint, it's just nice to get rid of that. But yeah, you wanna make sure that your basin's pretty clean. On the left is what a fill should look like. Obviously, if you have a soft water system, it'll look like that regardless. Uh, should always be clean. We don't recommend power washing. Um, I know sometimes that's really the only way to do it. It can break and make this fill brittle over time. So just be careful with how you wash them inside. This obviously can mess with heat transfer. So as clean as possible. If we can get the fill as clean as possible, starting off on the right foot in fall when you're shutting down because um, sometimes spring creeps up on us and we're not always prepared. So cleaning this off is super important. Making sure the floats are good. A lot of times algae builds up on this and on that ball. Keeping that clean is good. 
just from an operation standpoint, we've seen towers overflow all the time. A lot of times it has to do mechanically, it has nothing to do with anything water treatment related. So keep this thing clean. Make sure it works. Also belts, fans, greasing belts. And we'll talk about too, I have kind of like what Tom passed out with the boiler startup, the cooling tower shutdown. It's gonna tell you to uh, grease the bearings. Make sure the fan is clean. There should be a, there's gonna, a picture right after this of a clean fan. Um, replace your belts. That's all stuff you should do in the fall before it gets to be like negative five degrees out. Clean fan. So downtown, if sometimes if you look at some of the buildings, you'll see a little bit of algae. It's good to keep that thing clean. Naturally, that'll happen, especially if it sits. So cleaning the, uh, the fan itself is just good practice. Any questions about these mechanical parts? Replacing strainers, like we talked about earlier, filtration, 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 super important. If you can, when there's no flow, pull these things out, spray them down. Again, it gets you off on the right foot in spring. Yeah, so here's what you'll see on the other side of the wall here, and obviously right here. Um, we have our typical panel. These things, this can get all gummed up, and there'll be pictures later on, but these you wanna keep clean, because that's the lifeblood of these panels, are these probes. So making sure that they don't have debris. It can build up over time, so sometimes they'll backfeed, and this entire horizontal row will get full. Keep that clean. So you can blow water through there. A lot of times I take, I unscrew the, the probes here, these come out, the probes come out, and then I can blast water right out of the, out of the top. Just keeping those clean. Any questions about a panel? Again, you've seen one, you've seen a hundred today. So would you suggest when we lay up the, uh, the tower at the end of the year to keep that system right there flooded, like our uh, conductivity probe and our ORP sensor? Yeah, if you can. Um, I wouldn't keep like anything other than this flooded. Sure. And then obviously if we can replace the water, we can. Those, these probes, when they dry up over time, they can, it's just the life expectancy goes way down. So that's what we recommend. Um, a lot of times the ORP probes you can put back into a solution, but we always throw the cap away. So it's just keep, honestly, a little bit of water, a little bit of corrosion inhibitor, which will already be in there from the feed system is just enough to keep them all right. And you want to make sure, like, these shuttles, these suck, by the way. We're trying to move away from them. Uh, they suck. They, they're not very good. Okay. They don't suck anything. They just don't work very good. So, they, yeah, they, little pieces of metal underneath, when this thing goes up and down, it makes a contact at the bottom. So what we're, we're moving away from these, these red shuttles and we're trying to move towards these ultrasonics so that you have, you can measure flow all the time and nothing sticks, there's no moving pieces, the metal doesn't stick to the actual uh, magnet. So we're trying. Right, and these, I've had times where I've had screws stuck in these. I mean, some of the weirdest things you'll find that get stuck in these. So now, even when your tower's not running, it, your controller thinks it's running and now you're pumping chemical into the system and you got a big mess. So we're trying to get smarter, trying to move away from as many mechanical pieces as we can like this and this flow indicator. Obviously on that little panel, it takes up way less space. It's super cheap to put that thing on there. So we're kind of making strides when it comes to just those moving pieces. Um, I think what we're trying to get at here is just, if you see anything weird in the bottom of the tank, sometimes chemical can settle over time this looks like bleach solution that just has a bunch of crud at the bottom. Make sure that your tubing, your foot valve and your tubing is okay. A lot of times with cooling tower specifically, those by sides are pretty aggressive. You can definitely eat away this tubing and the foot valves need to be replaced a little bit off, more often than normal. So just take a look in the tanks. Make sure not to touch the sides of the walls, obviously, because this stuff is hazardous. but. Just being aware of what can be inside the tanks is super critical. Again, here's a picture of the probes. 
keeping them clean is super important. I mean, they're not cheap probes, but they will, they're known to take on sediment or anything like you see, I don't even know what that is, someone's hair. But that keeping these probes clean will make sure that your program runs as smoothly as possible. Again, same thing here. We're showing that we're trying to move away from these flow indicators. They are nice in the fact that when we run corrosion coupons, we want to maintain between 4 and 6 GPM for good corrosion coupon results. But again, I've seen some of the weirdest things stuck here. Um, and it takes forever to, to get that thing out. So we're, we're trying to move away from that. This is a really high quality picture, but what it is is what we call a gator, a loop gator. So it's a, a desiccant, which will help with, a lot of times for cooling towers, the corrosion in the chiller and the uh, closed loop side, if you were to drain the closed loop side, come from a wrong layup, an incorrect layup. You leave it wet for too long, you're not circulating water. What this does is if you open it up, take for example a hospital, you open up the chillers at the end of the year, you leave them dry, you throw the desiccant in there, which will help with any offline corrosion problems. So what this does is just, it sucks up all the excess moisture. They're a really good product. We recommend them for, for those seasonal HVAC cooling towers. Um, any questions about that? Good practice to open your chillers, scrub them, and then um, clean the tubes. And the quicker you can do that, I know there's these weird one-off days in November that can pop up that are 60 degrees that we need to run the chiller, but as quick as you can, open these things up, let them breathe, clean them out. Same thing here. So a cooling layup procedure, I'm not gonna go through all of this because it's everything we talked about. But Jeff, you wanna hand these out for me? Is there any questions about like what I talked about so far? So again, super important, reducing the conductivity. That's gonna help with cleaning. It's gonna clean itself. So you drop that conductivity point by, fi by 50%, it's going to help with the cleaning process. A part that I didn't really cover as much as I want to, the, it, it talks about two times the normal non-oxidizing non biocide. That's just a way to clean it yourself. You can pay someone a couple thousand bucks to clean your tower with bleach solution, go in there with the hazmat suits and get all that done. It's re recommended by OSHA, so I wouldn't say don't do it. Cooling tower cleanings are the best way to, to put yourself in a good spot for um, operate, like good operation. But prior to shutdown, just jacking up the buy side a little bit and letting it circulate is gonna do a lot for you. And then br brushing and pressure washing all the surfaces you can get to, draining the sump down, vacuuming it out. I mean, again, we saw the pictures. Just making sure your surfaces are clean. And if they aren't, getting in there with a washer on the fill and then up top, just pulling the pieces out. As much as you can vacuum out, the better. Um, I mean, other than that, a lot of this stuff on here is what we already talked about. Sorry if I was in your way. Um, but yeah, again, I cannot stress enough that the most important thing I think I would take away from here is if you have chillers, open them up as soon as possible, get them cleaned, and leave them laid up dry. That's going to put you in a really good spot. Any questions on the cooling layup? Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Jeff, you ready? Everyone, the last but not least section, I will uh, try to go through this quick so we get you out of here maybe a couple minutes early. 
Uh, this is by far the best section of the day because these are we're going to talk about new things within the water treatment industry, uh, which largely hasn't had a lot of new things um, for quite a while, quite a long time because what we do works. But some of the things we're going to talk about in here are pretty exciting in my opinion. So with that, uh, all right. So uh, un installs, right? So uh, just again, you can see here in these pictures, right? Is I don't know how much thought went into how are we gonna how are we gonna install a system, make it nice, clean, easy to work with for operators. You know, wires not running everywhere, cables not going everywhere, tubing. You know, look at this monstrosity. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I mean, just crazy, right? Um, and so, think about if it comes to you're getting a new system, you're redoing a system, et cetera. How can we maybe make this? laid out nicer, cleaner, easier um, for all parties involved. Who would want to work with a system like one of these um, compared to you know, a system like this, right? So I know Kyle kind of has a couple slides where, again, this is, maybe this is impossible, okay? This happens to be a very large, new, nice building in downtown Milwaukee uh, right on the lake. Um, and so maybe maybe you say, well, we don't, we're not getting a new building, and we get, you know we got what we got type thing. But there are better ways to look at doing things, right? Or having a panel that's, you know, it comes ready to go like this panel that's actually sitting over there, right? All you do is put the in and the out, and away you go. Um, and it's kind of more plug and play. So um, we really try to emphasize this on installations with customers. Is let's let's think about why we're doing what we're doing, how we're going to lay it out make sure it's user friendly, service friendly, all those things that matter to us in the field doing it, right? Not to the guy who's issuing the check that's never gonna check on the system, so. All right, so this one's really exciting. So Aquafilm, all right? So we're talking about looking at treating a boiler differently, okay? So the, the whole goal behind Aquafilm is we are no longer treating the water, we are treating the metal. And so I'm a water treater, so for me to say that I'm going to be a metal treater is weird, all right? But uh, it works fabulously. So the idea is we can use one product and replace up to four. Uh, if you're running an RO program, right, you're going to have four chemistries. We could, go, we could use one. So we're going to have safer handling, less handling overall, less for transportation, um, less testing that goes into it, um, less chemistry on site. Uh, so again, from, a, from a, I know some plants, they have to report how much chemistry they have on site. Um, you're able to reduce all of that. Um, it's going to reduce the fuel consumption uh, in your steam boiler system, which relates to reducing CO2 emissions. So everyone has you know, goals now to be green, right? So we want to use less water, less energy. Um, this is going to help with that. It's going to do that by having better nucleate boiling, okay? So um, you should, at a later date, go on our website and look uh, and search for Aquafilm, and then you can watch a cool 20-minute webinar that we have on Aquafilm and why it is um, the future, really, of boiler treatment. Um, this is, uh, so these are what we call filming amines or film-forming amines. So again, we're putting an ultra-thin protective barrier on all metal surfaces in the system. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna let oxygen penetrate to the tubes and cause corrosion. We're not gonna let steel have a chance to deposit on the tubes. Um, thereby, again, improving that heat transfer and lowering our energy costs, as well as, again, probably going through less chemistry overall because we're going to go from four down to one. Um, and so you're going you're gonna to save costs. You're going to have uh, as good a performance or better. You're going to have less testing because I'm not going to care about all the parameters for all the other chemistries that we had to look at. Um, and so we, where we have used this, we have seen some pretty incredible things. So you can see here, so changing the rules, right? So again, not to get too deep into the chemistry, but it forms a uniform hydrophobic film. So hydrophobic means it hates water, right? If it was hydrophilic, it would love water. And so what you can't see here is it wants to get out of the water that's inside this tube so bad that it attaches to anything that's not water, all right? So it attaches to steel, copper, aluminum, plastic even. Um, and you can see that it doesn't allow that water to actually soak in, right? So you can see here, this is really cool. The protective film is present. See how those are nice formed water bubbles, right, on the bottom there? 
And then right here, you can see where that film's been scraped off. See how now the water is, is you know, again, that surface tension, right? And it's kind of being uh, absorbed into the pipe. And so that's the theory, is we're going to repel the water. And so we no longer are as worried about if you get some hardness in your water. Not super worried because it's not going to be able to stick. If you have oxygen in your water, we're not really worried because the oxygen can't get through that, that layer. Um, and so you might not be able to see it, You're like, well, it looks no different, uh, the pipe, but we are putting, again, down that, that uh, hydrophobic layer um, that uh, protects the system. So we still treat uh, on an ongoing basis, right? So it's not like, hey, you add it once and it's good for a year type thing. Um, we still feed based upon fresh makeup water to the system. Now, as you get going with it, the more condensate you return, you get a recycling effect of it. Um, and so again, it's, it's not that it goes through the system once and then it's gone, right? Um, we've seen that that film can be present at, uh, as long as up to 30 days in the system. So let's say I'm there today testing and things look great. And then I leave and I wait a month to come back for service and the pump loses prime the moment I leave and no one catches it because apparently they don't do any testing. None of you guys, you would all catch it, right? Um, I wouldn't be as concerned about what's gonna happen and what's my boiler gonna look like when I open it if I have this in the system versus if I have conventional sulfite and polymer and those, you know, those pumps lose prime or whatever, I'm gonna be much more worried about oxygen and corrosion or pitting occurring in a traditional program than I am with, with this system. I've also seen where I have trouble accounts where for whatever reason, the standard, you know, your, your normal chemistries aren't working. Um, boilers are grossly oversized and so we can never get enough chemistry in them, right? Or the feed water temp tank is way too cold and so I, I, I can't feed enough sulfite to um, achieve the job. Uh, or sometimes I don't know what's ailing the boiler, um, but when I've put this into any of those accounts, the results that I've seen have been pretty impressive. Uh, and I no longer, I, they're no longer considered trouble accounts in my mind, right? The ones that keep me up at night of, well, it's, I'm just waiting for the phone call of, we had a boiler tube fail, right? Or, or whatever the case may be. Um, I don't necessarily worry about those accounts anymore. So one of the things you're gonna see is operational improvements. So this is talking about carryover. So most of your, your standard chemistries are inorganic chemistries, all right? So we're not gonna get into deep into the chemistry. They're inorganic. And so um, they add a lot of conductivity, a lot of uh, TDS to the water, all right? This is an, an organic chemistry, and so by nature, it doesn't really add any of that stuff to the water. So we're gonna improve the quality of our feed water. We're gonna lower the conductivity of our feed water because we're not adding in all those inorganic salts uh, that are found in your, your typical chemistries. Uh, and then we're also, also gonna improve the condensate conductivity or quality of the condensate because again, when it leaves and goes with the steam, it's again, it's not an inorganic that's gonna be adding conductivity into that water. So what this graph is trying to show, it's, it's you know, pretty noisy, right? But it's on the left here in the shaded section, it was on conventional treatment. And you can see again, the condensate conductivity was like was crazy, right? All over, up and down. Um, it would vary all the time. And you might see this in your condensate system pretty regularly if you don't have a very consistent running system. And then you can see here your boiler cycles, right? So again, the higher the conductivity is that we get back in the condensate and that is in the feed water into your boiler, the less overall cycles you're gonna get um, because if you're putting 100 into your boiler and you're running 1,000, you're gonna get 10 cycles. If you can put 10 into your boiler and you're running 1,000, right, you're gonna get 100 cycles, all right? So then you can see here when Aquafilm was implemented at this arrow, our condensate conductivity dropped like a rock down to almost nothing, so we know it's super pure. And what that did for cycles is it's able to get us higher cycles in our boiler. Less water, less chemical, less energy overall. And it has better heat transfer. And there's not a video in, in this, I don't believe, but again, if you go look at that Aquafilm presentation, you can actually see the difference in the boiling uh, when we talk about nucleate boiling. The, the, the bubbles are significantly smaller and there's more of them. So you're having better heat transfer okay, uh, occur as a result. So what this is saying here is this boiler is running at 105% of the boiler's total capacity. And so the cool thing about this one is um, the story that goes with this is this plant's boiler was maxed out. They were looking at ordering a second boiler because they couldn't keep up. They implemented Aquafilm 
they were able to squeeze an extra 5% out of the boiler capacity and they actually canceled their second boiler order. Unbelievable, right? I would say I never would have thought that was possible, but that's what this was able to do. All right, so now the next thing we'll talk about is endotherm. So um, endotherm is looking at uh, saving energy in your closed loop systems, right? So it's an award-winning energy savings additive uh, that we can supply here in the Midwest area. So, um, you know, we, we are one of the exclusive distributors. Um, and so this is something really excited to, to look at. Again, most facilities have closed water loops or closed glycol based loops. And we can look at adding this into those to save energy and we'll get into how it works. All right. So the basics, it's organic, it's biodegradable, it's legal to discharge down the drain, right? So, it's not like it's something super hazardous or anything like that that you have to worry about dealing with. It's safe to use in all HVAC systems with all different types of materials of construction, copper, steel, aluminum, PVC, um, you name it, rubber, the seals. It's not going to attack anything. Um, you can install it through your uh, filter feeder or pot feeder system into your closed loop, or you could do it with a, a small pumping system if you wanted. Depends, again, on, on the size of your loop, too. might, in, might dictate what you want to do. Uh, it works with basically any and all uh, corrosion inhibitors we might use. It's not a corrosion inhibitor, um, but it works. It, it's friendly with if you're using nitrite in your loop, if you're using molybdenum or silica, um, it works with those. And then again, it's compatible with all different types of glycol. Uh, it's been proven now for the past nine years and over 20, I should say 10 years as of April, uh, in over 20,000 systems worldwide with over 300 case studies. Um, the longest running install of it right now is 10 years. So 10 years ago, they dosed a loop with endotherm. We've had no water loss as a result, and so they're still seeing that energy savings 10 years later. All right, that's okay. Uh, it's thermally stable with no evidence of breakdown, so that's that. It's been going for 10 years now. Now, if we ever get to a point where, hey, 12 years and it kind of broke down finally, like that, then we'll be able to tell you, but for now, it's been going 10 years strong. Uh, it's colorless, so it's not going to change the color of your water at all. Um, it's super easy to add and use, right? You just have to, you have to know your system volume and you add 1% uh, system volume. So if you have 100 gallons in your loop, you need one gallon of endotherm. Um, again, it's won lots of awards and it's been proven to reduce energy consumption and carbon dioxide. Uh, and the energy savings start the day you add. So it's not like you have to wait uh, to get those savings. So how does it work, Jeff? This sounds too good to be true. This sounds like the snake oil of all snake oil, right? Um, and supposedly that's what I do for a living. So water has a really high surface tension, all right? That's why, you know, you can do those experiments where you can, you know, set a paper clip on a, on a cup of water and it'll float and then you add a drop of soap and now it sinks, right? Same theory here. Water in your piping system has a high surface tension. Your heat exchanger, your chiller, your plate and frame, whatever it may be, your piping, it's not perfectly smooth. It looks perfectly smooth, but there's all these micro cracks, right? That have all these little pockets that you can't see, right? We are changing the surface tension of the water or the glycol and allowing it to get into all of these surfaces. So we are just actually leveraging all of your heat transfer surface area that exists. You're not doing that even in a brand new system, okay? So when they tell you it's running at whatever percent efficiency, it, um, you're losing some just by nature of the water or the call that's in that system and those characteristics. And you say, okay, Jeff, how do you know that's true? Because there's math that supports that. Now, I am not a mathematician. I didn't do well in math in school, all right? So don't ask me to get into the, uh, the physics here behind this, right? But this equation, Q equals UA parentheses delta T, right, is the overall heat transfer coefficient equation. So Q is the heat transfer efficiency. U is the heat transfer coefficient, and A is the area. So what we're doing in this equation, we're not editing Q or U because water has a certain heat transfer efficiency, right? It is what it is. Uh, it is the best heat transfer medium there is. That's why we use water. Um, glycol would be number two. Um, what we're changing is the area, right? So we're, in, we're just leveraging the area that you actually have that you're not actually leveraging right now, all right? which is pretty dang cool. So, like I said, right, under a microscope, smooth surfaces aren't smooth at all. Um, and then again, we're reducing that. So 
Without the endotherm, it's kind of passing over all those. And then again, you say you're not leveraging all that. With it added in, you're able to use all that. All right, so here are some case studies. Now again, from all around the world. Uh, they have lots of accreditation from around the world, so um, you know it, it's been proven out a lot. So here is a case study of Vancouver International Airport. They, this is for a three-month trial. They saved $1,684 in those, in those three months for an average of 17.32% savings and also 10,000 kilograms of CO2, right? Which, if you do the conversion math, works out to be whatever it is. But it's taking a couple cars off the street every year, if you want to think about it that way. Another one here in Canada, three months again, 13.5% savings, 7,300 bucks in three months. So they multiply that you know, times a year. There's some good savings to be had um, in potentially large systems. Right, um, And so you can just see that again, 11 on the low side, 21, 22 on the high side. Every system is going to be different. right? That's why we come on site, we do a survey, we grab some data, we make sure that it seems like it's going to be successful. We're not just going to put it in any system. If your system loses all of its water volume on a pretty regular basis, it's not a good idea to put it in because you don't want to lose it. right? Look at this one though, $43,000. That's pretty good. So, survey says, right? So that, that wraps up Aquafilm and Endotherm. So are there any questions on either of those two products, right, um, to start? And again, water treatment hasn't had a lot of innovations uh, over the years, because what works, works. These are, are relatively new in terms of innovations. I mean, they are really game changers in our industry. So um, if you have a steam system or you have closed loops, we should really be talking about this stuff for you guys. If there's no questions on those, then there is going to be uh, survey sheets. We're going to, you already have them. If you would take time, please fill them out. Let us know how we can do better. Um, for the people who are remotely, um, if you just maybe want to leave a comment, if we did something good or bad, or how could we make it better for the next time that we do something remotely, especially knowing, you know, who knows when uh, COVID's not going to be a thing anymore and we can get back to normal, um, that would really be great. So um, if there's no other questions, then uh, thanks everyone for attending. So.